Chapter 1. Welcome to the New Age. Genevieve. Flickers of red light shifted through the darkness, illuminating what the moon couldn't of the large library. I held my own small flashlight between my teeth, directing the cardinal beam downward onto the book in my hands. The scientific title had it seemed promising, but as I scanned the inside, I found it was only a superficial account of the human body, definitely not the in-depth information about the nervous system that we were looking for. As quietly as I could, I set the book back onto the shelf, the only audible sound the slight rub as it slid back into place. I pulled the flashlight out of my mouth, running it over the spines of the other books until I found another that looked interesting, and then I gripped it between my teeth again to free my hands. As I reached for the book, there was a faint whoosh and a much louder thud as a heavy text hit the floor, echoing off the high library ceiling. Startled, I jumped, instinctively turning toward the noise as my hand shot to the 12-inch knife belted to my thigh. Luckily, I had a good enough hold on my flashlight that I didn't drop it and add to the clatter. Every other red light in a long row of shelves directed toward the noise, barely illuminating the soldier who had dropped the book, and I could almost make out eleven inhales as each of us held our breath. I waited. The only sound I could hear in the dark silence was the frightening pounding of my heart as we all waited for a dreaded response to the noise. My hand was still tensed over the knife, and though it was the weapon of choice among us for its silence, I felt even more comforted by the weight of the rifle strung over my shoulder. I waited another thirty seconds, listening intently for any sound that might indicate our mission was about to get a lot more dangerous. When none came, I gave an audible sigh. As you were, I whispered, just loud enough so that my comrades could hear me. Releasing my hold on my knife, I grabbed my light and shined it on the one who had dropped the book. Jarvis, be more careful. Sorry, LT, he whispered back, and before I removed my light from him, I watched him take firm hold of the heavy book so that it wouldn't slip from his fingers. We'd been searching through Harvard's library for over an hour now, and with almost every shelf scan, we still hadn't found what we were looking for. A book, any book for that matter, that was extremely detailed about the human brain. Not just the different parts and what they were for, but also chemicals, hormones, and the effects of the rest of the body. The kind of book that would give a first-time reader enough knowledge to be a brain surgeon. There were plenty of biology textbooks about human anatomy, but none I'd seen yet that were specific enough. Nor did it help that a good number of books had been thrown about and strewn all over the floor in the former chaos. The lack of vision and the layer of dust that reflected my red light back at me made it hard to scan the drop titles quickly and accurately, and the disorder made searching troublesome. Genevieve. There was a quiet whisper behind me as I continued to scan the shelves, the familiar voice belonging to Blake McMahon. How are you doing over here? Well, I started and turned to face him, my flashlight turning his short blonde hair a dark pink and shining back at me in his hazel eyes. At six foot three, he loomed over me, and I'm sure his broad shoulders and hugely muscular body made him look at least three times my size. I never got to finish high school, so I don't really know what the hell we're looking for. His shoulders shook as he let out short huffs of breath in the quietest laugh he could manage. No shit. I barely know biology books from physiology books. Blake was a year older than me, but he was just a junior in high school when the world fell apart. A lot of us who didn't go from student to dead overnight went from student to soldier. An education had taken a backseat to survival for the last six years. I couldn't say I'd minded, seeing as I'd never liked school much anyway. As he answered, I felt the tug of nature calling, so I waved for him to follow me as I started in the likely direction the bathrooms would be in. Captain Greeley needs to let us bring Doc. Instead of sending us on these pointless searches, bringing back books that don't help. Were I talking to anyone else, I wouldn't be expressing such disapproval with the captain. But McMahon was like a brother to me, 
and as long as I followed the captain's orders, he would too, no matter how much I disliked them. Six years ago, before all of this started, I would have laughed in somebody's face if they had told me I'd be listening to some old veteran like he were my father. If they'd told me that same veteran would trust me so much that he'd put soldiers' lives in my hands. If they'd told me that my new best friend would be an M4. The joke wouldn't have been too funny, though, because now I slept with that M4 laid snug across my chest every night with that 12-inch double-edged hunting knife still strapped to my thigh. Blake and I turned slowly down a short hall at the end of a long building, and with a sweep of my flashlight, I slided the door with the circular blue woman sign on it. It didn't matter to anyone nowadays which restroom I went in, but I didn't mind maintaining certain formalities every once in a while. When we reached the door, I pushed it open just a hair and pulled the knife out of its sheath, careful not to make a sound. With my ear pressed against the opening, I held my breath, listening for the slightest noise coming from the other side. Usually it'd be the deep, steady breath of a sleeping feral that would let us know that we weren't alone. Sometimes there'd even be a slow shift of footsteps of one roused from slumber. Now, however, my ear reported silence. With my knife in one hand and my flashlight in the other, I pushed the door all the way open, scanning the bathroom and the stalls with Blake at my side. Finding the area empty, I set my backpack down and made my way into one of the stalls, leaving it wide open so that I can make a quick comeback in case we fell suddenly under attack. Nick Mann wouldn't mind. He'd stay where he couldn't see anyway. So, I started, just to make conversation while I took care of business. Casey, huh? I couldn't help teasing him about the newcomer, who'd seemed to have already developed a crush on him. A quarter of our settlement soldiers were constantly out looking for other survivors, but these days it was getting rare to find people who needed somewhere to call home. There were three types of people left. The normal folks, like us and most other survivors, who formed groups with close companions, usually family or friends from before. The foragers, who preferred to go it alone because they thought it was less conspicuous and therefore safer. They survived by scavenging and trading the goods they found with groups for things they needed. Then there were the raiders. Though most groups of raiders had their own names for themselves, they were dangerous, all of them. They took what they needed, or simply wanted, and killed anyone who got in the way. I suppose the only good thing about the raiders was that a lot of them went after ferals with guns blazing, making life easier for the rest of us. But even then they were loud, creating a ruckus everywhere they went. And if you were near enough to hear them, then you were near enough to get caught in the bloodshed. We weren't here to start wars with the uninfected, so whenever we could, we avoided them. Fortunately, that worked out for us most of the time because we traveled in a big enough group that they rarely wanted to engage in firefight. Blake chuckled, and there was a pause as I heard a metallic click, followed by a deep inhale. I'd learned over the years that it was true what they always said, about your other senses being more alert in the dark. It was so true that as Blake inhaled, I could hear the soft crackling of the hot embers, and I knew he'd lit a cigarette. She's cute. He said slowly, almost as a question, like he was avoiding the topic. As I came out of the stall, I was still buttoning my jeans. Cross your fingers, I told him, reaching for the handle on the sink faucet. He made a show of crossing his fingers as I gave it a twist. And a huge grin spread over my face as water poured into the basin. I'd turned the handle with the red H on it. And even though the water didn't come out hot, it wasn't freezing courtesy of the warmish summer nights in Boston. What's the matter? She's not your type? I asked him, and then added, Shine your light over here, will you? It had been ages since I'd looked in a mirror, and as he directed the light over, I almost wish I hadn't. With grooming having taken a back seat to, well, almost everything, my black hair went from wavy to downright frazzled like it hadn't been brushed in months. 
at least I kept it cut short, the tips barely reaching my shoulders. And there was so much dirt on my face, my normally fair complexion looked murky. Really, I was a muddled mess, and the dirt speckled the smooth skin of my thin cheeks in such a way it almost looked like I had freckles. No, she is my type. I just don't want a girl. I began splashing water over my face to clean off the grime, but when he paused at that, I passed him a teasingly suspicious look. <sighs> Shut up, he laughed, catching the gay joke behind my glance. His face was illuminated in the reddish glow as he puffed on the cigarette. I don't need to be out on missions worrying about the girl back home, worrying about me. You're enough of a worry for me already. I can take care of myself. The glare I gave him was half serious. I knew that he knew that I could take care of myself, but I didn't want him to start doubting it. I wiped the water off of my now clean face and shook it from my hands. My skin looked better, but now I could tell exactly how much sleep I wasn't getting. My eyes were usually such a soft, light brown that they were almost golden, but in the dim of the flashlight they looked dark and sullen. So did the bags beneath them, which were exaggerated by the heavy shadows in the room. I couldn't wait to be back at the camp where I could finally catch up on some much-needed rest. At least my clothes were in okay condition, which was good considering they were about the only set I had, aside from a light sweater in my backpack and the winter coat back at camp. My dark brown tank top had faded to a leathery beige, and the edges along the neckline and waist were only slightly frayed. My dark blue jeans had held their color nicely, though they too had incurred a small tear over my left knee. The shirt and my jeans hugged every inch of my skin and non-existent curves tight, which I preferred since I didn't have to worry about baggy clothes getting caught on things if I needed to run from something, or someone. Though I wouldn't mind an extra pair of clothes. I wouldn't trade my tan combat boots for anything. The soft leather was worn and palpable, and the durable sole was molded so perfectly to my foot that sometimes it didn't even feel like I was wearing shoes at all. Sure you can, pipsqueak, Blake teased, letting go of the cigarette when I reached for it. I rolled my eyes, and after taking a breath of smoke and handing it back to him, I grabbed my backpack. By now, I was accustomed to people taking jabs at my size. It wasn't so much my lack of height, which at five foot five was pretty average. It was more about my lack of brawn. I was thin and, quite frankly, frail looking. It probably didn't help my clothes were snug and food rations were tight, neither adding much bulk at all to my frame. Even so, people learned quickly not to mistake my weight for weakness. The captain had taught me early on how to handle myself, and when I lacked in strength, I made up for in marksmanship. Put a gun in my hand, and I'd shut anyone up real quick. McMahon followed me out of the main part of the library. Some of the guys were still looking through the shelves, and the rest of them were huddled near one of the few wood tables that hadn't been overturned, whispering sportedly to each other. Instead of making my way over to them, I strode quietly to the librarian's counter to search for anything useful. There wasn't much in the drawers besides pencils, staplers, and paperwork. The same went for the mess that littered the countertop. I did find a box of Mickey Mouse bandages, and with a smile I put them inside my backpack. One of the hardest things about an apocalypse was keeping morale high, and I knew the kids would love those little bandages. Who can't smile when there are happy kids around? I'd almost given up on searching for anything else that might be of use, when at the far end of the counter I spotted a lonely cupboard. My eyebrow raised curiously as I made my way over to it, and when I opened it, I fought to hold back a grin. Blake craned his neck over the counter to see what had caused my reaction, and he laughed and shook his head as I discreetly put the bottle of brandy into my backpack. You know how much trouble you're going to be in when the cat finds out Mr. Putman's been getting all that alcohol from you? He asked, his face a mixture of amusement and disapproval. Alcohol was allowed back at camp, 
but because we were camped in the middle of the forest and didn't want people stumbling off into the wilderness, it was monitored carefully and only given in small increments at mealtimes. Hey, we're allowed to trade goods and services with each other, I chuckled, giving a shrug that let him know I wasn't worried about it. Old Man Putman is the best weapons expert at camp. Why do you think this thing looks so pretty and handles like a dream? I pointed to the rifle over my shoulder and then joked. Besides, he's a quiet drunk. Whatever helps you sleep at night, LT, Blake teased. He only called me LT when he was messing with me, but he was the only one who got away with taking digs at my rank. When the cap first assigned me as lieutenant in charge of 20 other soldiers, those soldiers didn't take it too well. Mostly because I was one of the few who wasn't military before everything fell apart. Also, it was because of my age. I was just 15 when it all started. I was lucky the captain took me under his wing after I'd lost my family. And three years after he did, he decided he trusted my decision-making enough to put me in charge of the first platoon. When he first gave me the title, I didn't know enough about military life to even know what a platoon was. Needless to say, I didn't get much of a response when I tried to give orders. The cap told me to whip him into shape and show him who's boss. Based on his advice at the beginning, I'm pretty sure all the soldiers thought I was just some dumb bitch. Even after three years of leading the group, I was still learning things I wasn't aware I should have known in the first place. But they'd learned that for every decision I made, their safety was the most important thing to me. So for that, they trusted me, even if some of them still thought I was a bitch. Before I could respond to Blake's jest, there was a collection of flickering blue lights in the corner of my eye, coming from the direction of the entrance of the building. That flickering of lights was how we recognized friendlies and all the pitch-black silence. Because if we went around sneaking up on each other, it would only get a good number of us killed. And we would always use red or blue. I was told it was because those colors didn't mess up that our eyes were already adjusted for night vision. I never tested it to see if it were true or not, but there was no need to test it when I never found a problem with it. The people coming in the entrance was Bravo Squad, the other half of my twenty soldiers, returning from the hospital across the river. As the ten lights flickered off and they filtered into the library, Blake looked at me for instruction. I nodded my head toward the new arrivals, prompting him to go get information. I think the technical word for it was debriefing, but I tried to avoid giving those kinds of orders out loud just in case I got the lingo wrong. Oh, hey, I whispered quickly to McMahon before he got too far. He paused, and in the moonlit darkness, I could see him turn back to face me. Find out if the rest of Alpha found anything useful, too. After what faintly looked like a nod, I saw him turn and head off. Now that I was alone, or felt more alone in the darkness, I was beginning to feel as tired as I looked. I fell back into the cushiony chair behind me, folding my arms across the top of the counter and resting my head on top of them. The ferals were active during the day, which meant if we wanted to survive on these missions, we had to do all of our traveling at night. During the day, we hid somewhere, resting until it was safe to move again. I'd never been the kind of person who could fall asleep easily, unless I was somewhere intimate and comfortable. And the fact that we hunkered down when the sun was blazing didn't help either. It was always too bright. Right now I was so tired that I'd almost dozed off into an alert half-sleep, until there was a clunk of someone settling down on the counter next to me. Ma'am? I could hear the grin in the greeting even before I picked my head up. I plastered on a smile and returned the salutation. Kellen? Kellen Wysorek. Everyone just called him Kellen because his last name was so hard to pronounce. I still wasn't even sure I knew how to spell it correctly. He was the definition of tall, dark, and handsome. Six foot, medium length black hair that curled at the edges like those perfect Roman statues. He was built like one of those statues, too, with a smooth jawline and lean muscles that rippled beneath his shirt. 
To top it all off, he had the most gorgeous green eyes I'd ever seen. Believe it or not, he had the biggest crush on me. If it wasn't clear because he tried hitting on me any time we skirted the formalities of rank back at camp, it was obvious in the way that he leered at me. He was a good seven years older than I, but when he flashed that perfect, goofy grin, it was young and playful, almost enough to make me forget about the age difference. So, what was the problem? Why didn't I settle down or at least sleep with the man? because he was far from modest about his conquest around the camp. And with nearly a hundred and twenty females alone, he had a decent pool to fish from. The way I caught him looking at me sometimes told me I'd only be another conquest, only another piece of meat to spoil and toss away. And just thinking about it made me feel dirty. It was a shame, too, because he was quite a looker. Unfortunately for both of us, my self-respect hadn't died with the rest of the world. You look tired, he mused from his seat on top of the counter, ruffling his dirtied hair with a hand so it didn't look quite so grungy. I could think of safer places to be than Boston, I offered as an explanation for why I couldn't sleep. Before the pandemic, big cities met more people and more excitement. Now they just met more ferals and more danger, until we were back at camp, I wouldn't be able to fully relax. Even if I managed to doze off, my senses remained alert for threats, meaning I didn't really get adequate rest. Kellen nodded understandingly, and then leaned back over the counter and extended a hand to my shoulder. You want a massage or something? The second he touched me, I reclined back in my chair as far as I could with the bag and rifle at my back, taking myself out of his arm's reach. I'm good, thanks. He gave a smug grin, only visible because he was close enough that I could make it out in what moonlight shone through the large skylights in the ceiling. Did I think that he really had feelings for me? No. Aside from physical attraction, I think he just enjoyed the challenge. That flirty curve in his lip confirmed repeatedly that it was all a game. Hey. At least I was winning. Before Kellen could come up with some coy comment, Blake returned and he stood silently at the edge of the counter until Kellen lumbered away. The rest of ours found a couple of books they think might work for the doc. He started his report in a quiet whisper, leaning forward so that I could hear him. Bravo scavenged what they could from the hospital, but they only found a few supplies. There was a clan of ferals near the pharmacy. Said one squad could take care of it if he wanted to hit it for meds. I sat there for a moment, taking in what he'd said. So far this assignment hadn't yielded anything of importance, and I hated making any travels longer than two days for nothing. I also knew for a fact that the camp was running low on things like antibiotics and insulin for the one or two diabetics. Getting those things, however, meant a fight. I grabbed my flashlight from the clip on my belt loop, shining it the silver wind-up watch on my wrist to check the time. Ten minutes until three, which meant we had a little over two hours until sunrise. Two hours to get over to the hospital, get the supplies we needed, and find somewhere to hide. I gave a deep sigh, running the options through my mind. Then I whistled two short hoots, the first one high and the second low, the signal that I wanted someone's attention. It was quiet enough not to give us away, but loud enough that they could all hear me. Powers, I whispered loudly. There was a shuffling through the dark as Powers, Bravo's leader, found his way to Blake and I. Ma'am, he asked expectantly when he got to the counter. You guys scout roof access from the hospital? I asked quietly. Rooftops were our hiding place of choice when we were away from camp. Normally I'd have thought that it was crazy. Trapping yourself at the rooftop of a building with only one way down while the ferals roamed the earth beneath you. Hell, in high school I used to yell at the television whenever I'd watch scary movies and the characters would run upstairs to escape the killer. As crazy as it was, it was perfect. 
It wasn't that the ferals couldn't climb or walk upstairs. They very well could. During the day, they went looking for food. They might be stupid sons of bitches, but they had mind enough to know that there was nothing to eat on rooftops. If we could get in quietly enough, they'd never know we were there. Yes, ma'am, he answered quickly. Powers was military before the breakout, and he definitely knew what he was doing. Sometimes, though, I preferred delegating to the non-military. I got squeamish being called ma'am all the time. Like I was somebody's grandmother. Somebody's 21-year-old grandmother. Gross. It was even worse when they called me sir. I didn't mind LT too much, though. It felt like more of a nickname. The hall was clear when we passed through. How many at the pharmacy? Twelve, he told me, and after a short pause added, scattered. Thanks. That's all I needed to know from him, and with a nod at my dismissal, he strode back to where he was before I called him. Twelve ferals ain't bad, Blake whispered, his voice taken on urgency as our time was ticking away. And they'll be sound asleep for another two hours at least. It's not ideal, either, I told him thoughtfully. I didn't like taking risks. and would have been much more comfortable if we weren't going to be in such a confined space. But if we wait until tomorrow, then we'll have to send Bravo back for another recon, and it's a whole night's walk just to get back to the vehicles. He nodded, and I knew we both mentally added to the list how we'd run out of food yesterday. As much as we hated it, Food was heavy and bulky. If starving for a couple of days meant not being weighed down when we had to run, it was worth it. Do we have to raid the pharmacy? His voice sounded so hopeful it made me seriously reconsider. But I shook the doubts away. Doc was complaining that we were running low on supplies last month, and if we come back with nothing, Cap is sending us right back out. He nodded again and then leaned forward with his elbows over the counter. Twenty-one soldiers are a bit much, though, don't you think? We draw too much attention in that enclosed space, and we won't have a cavalry to call in. What are you thinking? Keep one from Bravo and send the rest to scout the rooftop? I squinted through the dark, wishing I could read his face to get a better idea of what was going through his mind. Blake just mm-hmm. Yeah, that way we gotta straight get away to the roof. Okay, I agreed. Glad that I had him to bounce ideas off of. I don't know if I would have survived this long without him. I flinched my light over my watch one more time. Two minutes until three. I gave a long high-pitched whistle to signal a meeting and waited while everyone gathered near the counter. I didn't bother standing up from the chair to talk to them. They couldn't really see me anyway. We're going back to the hospital. I heard a soft groan or two when I paused. Couldn't say I blamed them. Alpha Squad. We got the pharmacy. Hit and run. We get in and we get out. Quick and quiet. Hatfield? I paused again to address the only other girl in the platoon. You're coming with Alpha to dispatch the ferals. Powers. I want you to take the rest of Bravo and make sure that we have a clear path to the roof. I could see the faint outline of heads bobbing up and down in understanding. I don't want to hear a single gunshot in that building, got it? More nodding. Questions. Because we were running out of time, I was glad that no one spoke up with questions. Let's move. As I finally stood, I clicked my light on, turning the lens from red to blue. From what I gathered, we also used blue when we wanted our beams to blend with the moonlight. Red was for when we didn't want to be seen from afar, I guess. That's what one of my soldiers told me anyway. That red light doesn't travel as far as blue or white. He said it was a physics thing. I never quite reached physics in school. I led the way to the entrance of the library, the footsteps behind me soft but comforting. At the door, I poked my head out, closing my eyes and straining my ears for the sound of any nearby disturbances. It was eerily quiet, except for the wind, 
which howled around the corners of the buildings and only made it more frightening. I could never be sure if it was the dark that scared me, or just the thought of what I knew was lurking in every obscure corner. But in my growing discomfort, I shifted my flashlight to my left hand, and I used my right to unsheath my hunting knife. That in hand, I opened my eyes, scanning the moonlight outlines for any movement other than the quivering of plants in the breeze. As I took my first silent step out of the library, I took a deep breath through my nose, utilizing every sense that I could to aid my reduced vision. The stench that met my nostrils only succeeded in reminding me of another reason I hated the city. It reeked of death and decay. After six years, the visual evidence of death was long gone, but the smell remained, like it had soaked into the concrete and into the very foundations of the district, only to seep from the cracks into the sidewalk, to flow from the leaves of the increasingly untamed shrubs and trees which had soaked it into their roots to thrive, to serve as a constant reminder of everything we'd lost, and in case we grew too comfortable, to remind us that we could be next. A shiver traveled up my spine, so with another deep breath, as I tried to calm my nerves, I led the group left and away from the library. It was strange walking on a college campus and knowing that there was probably nobody left and that nobody would ever learn here again. The branches of the trees that lined either side of the narrow road had grown lengthwise above us, creating a thick canopy and shutting out the glow of the moon. Even though the blue lens of my flashlight blended well into the night, I refused to shine the beam back and forth, lest the movement caught a feral's eye. Instead, I kept it on the ground in front of me, illuminating a few feet ahead, so I wouldn't trip on anything. When we reached an intersecting road, we veered right, and hardly 500 feet later, we were crossing the bridge. It was almost peaceful, the lapping sound of the water against the river banks, and the reflection of the sky dancing over the surface. There were a few scattered cars on the short bridge, and I ducked behind each one for cover with Blake at my side, advancing only when I was sure the path ahead was devoid of life. All of the cars had been sitting there so long that the flat tires had cracked and dried, and began to blend with the asphalt. As I approached the last car at the very end of the bridge, I slowed. The door was open, and while I'd never known a feral to hunker down in a vehicle, it didn't hurt to be prepared. My grip tightened on my knife in my hand, and I crouched behind the tail end. When I heard every footstep stop behind me, I pitched myself toward the open door, shining my light inside, prepared to stab at whatever lay inside. It was empty, and satisfied that we could continue, I started forward off of the bridge. From what I gathered on the map, it was only about a mile further to get to the hospital, a 45-minute walk when moving as cautiously as we were. More cars and trucks littered the street, which we used for cover as we followed the road along the side of the river. I could see the outline of a large building coming up in the distance, and in my excitement at almost being done for the night, I felt my pace pick up. As I left my spot behind the bed of the truck to zigzag to the next vehicle, there was a throaty growl, the clunk of something hitting a car, and then a grainy skid. I pushed Blake back behind the truck and dove behind it myself just as a pair of barrels fell into the road, and I resisted the strong urge to bolt in the opposite direction. Six years of fighting these things, and the flight instinct never dwindled. I peeked around the tail end of the truck, just enough to catch a glimpse. Every time I saw one, I didn't want to believe they used to be like us. One of the ferals was completely unclothed. Whatever attire it had been wearing before becoming infected had since been worn out and fell away. It looked like the other had on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, both holy and frayed and thin beyond recognition. In what little moonlight lit the pair, you could tell by looking at the naked one that they were thin and bony. One thing I was more and more sure of with every encounter 
sparrows were no longer human. They were vile, vicious animals. Back before there were hardly any of us left, there was a theory going around about what caused the outbreak. It was a parasite that spread only through saliva. The government had been working on some kind of weapon, and something about the parasite destroyed the complex parts of the human brain, killed everything that made us empathetic or civilized, and turned us into savage, territorial creatures, incapable of logic or rationalization, incapable even of speech. When Ferrells caught a glimpse of an uninfected, it attacked for two reasons. It was protecting its territory, and it was hunting a meal where meals were scarce. Either way, even if you had the man or gun power to defend yourself, it was best not to be seen at all. The gaunt figures ahead of us were making a racket, letting out barely human yells as they clawed and snapped at each other. They were fighting over something, though I couldn't begin to venture what. If they kept it up, one would undoubtedly kill the other. But before that, they'd draw attention. It was likely any pharaoh in the vicinity had already heard the noise, and with us crouched down nearby, that was the last thing that we needed. The noise hadn't brought any other ferals out yet, but I had to do something before we got caught by more than we could handle. Knife still in hand, I checked to make sure none of my soldiers were visible. Then I brought the butt end of it hard against the side of the truck. The metallic thud ran through the air, and as both ferals stopped their scuffle, and both of their heads shot in my direction, I pulled back behind the cover of the truck. It was dead silent for a second, and with the slap of bare feet headed our direction, the fear really started kicking in. Before I had time to chicken out, I put my flashlight back onto my belt, and pushed Blake toward the side of the truck the opposite side the ferals were coming upon. He already knew what I wanted, and with his own knife held secure in his hand, he started to wrap around the front of the truck. The patter of feet got closer, and once it went by us on the opposite side of our cover, we circled all the way to the front end. I took a deep breath, preparing myself for the worst. Then the footsteps stopped, and I could picture the feral standing there, knowing they'd heard something from this exact spot, but not knowing what it was. Before they had time to do much searching, Blake and I rushed out of our spots so swiftly and silently, I could almost hear the whoosh of our knives in the air. Like the captain had trained me to do, I wrapped my left arm around the feral's eyes to keep it away from its mouth, and then brought my knife through its neck as deep as I possibly could. That way it couldn't scream. Blake completed the same motion I did, though he didn't have to jump to reach its head like I needed to. It took a few seconds for both of the lifeless bodies to collapse, and once they did, we stood there for a quiet minute. It sounded like we'd shut the ferals up quick enough that no other ones were wandering around yet. When I was satisfied we were safe, I clicked my light back on and waved it forward and back through the air, motioning to the others to keep moving. I led the rest of the way to the hospital at a brisk pace moving from cover to cover hastily. It was no longer excitement at seeing the building in the distance that made me hurry. It was the pair Blake and I had dispatched. The ferals were already stirring from sleep, probably because of the painful scarcity of food. I knew even I would have a hard time sleeping, the way my stomach was cramping with hunger. I couldn't imagine how little the infected were finding to eat. Luckily, we reached the hospital without another sighting, and I snuck toward the entrance of the large building. I could hear Blake's footsteps close behind me as we crept near the walls. When we got to the main doors at the lobby, I took a step forward, ready to push them apart. When both doors went sliding open, the electronic whir and whoosh was so unexpected, I gasped and jumped back, thankful I'd never been a screamer when frightened. As far as I knew, electricity everywhere had failed not long after the outbreak, and it had almost been six years since I'd seen anything electric without using a generator. Whatever power plant or backup system was powering the hospital had to be the last working one in the country. Even worse than the hammering of my heart from the doors 
The lights inside were automatic, and the second the doors whooshed open, the interior lit up, bright white light flowing into the dark night. Powers hadn't mentioned any of this during debriefing. Blake was still chuckling quietly at my reaction, and now that it wasn't so dark outside, he could see it when I glared at him. Get me Powers, I told him, and he turned to the soldier directly behind him. There was a quiet murmuring down the line, and eventually Powers had made his way up to me. Ma'am. What the hell? I whispered angrily, motioning toward the illuminated building. We went in through the back, Powers said. Didn't make it all the way to the lobby. Then he leaned over and pointed to the darkened window inside, at the very back of the lobby. That's the pharmacy. Lights weren't automatic anywhere else. I followed the direction of his finger to the hallway near the darkened window at the pharmacy. Second we reached the hallway, we saw the ferals outside the pharmacy and turned back. But there's a stairwell right in there. I studied the inside for a minute, considering his words. Alpha Squad didn't have time to go all the way back to the enormous building, just to come back through the inside to where we practically were now. There was close to an hour before sunrise, if the pharaohs were even still sleeping to begin with. I also couldn't leave Bravo out here, or in the light of the lobby like sitting ducks, waiting for us to dispatch the pharaohs by the pharmacy so that we could all go up the stairwell to the roof together. It was too late for that. I sighed and leaned my back against the wall. Take Bravo around back, the way you went the first time, and head to the roof. I instructed Powers. We'll meet you guys up there. Make sure Hatfield stays. In the faint light that filtered out of the building, I could see Powers hesitate. He knew as well as I did that if we separated right now, Bravo Squad wouldn't be near enough to have our backs if something went wrong but I wasn't risking the whole platoon for a couple of meds. After a few seconds of studying me unsuredly, Powers nodded and hurried back down to the line to gather his group. Blake, I started, turning toward McMahon. If the ferals are still sleeping, we surround them and wait for my order to strike. If they're awake... I stopped, because I didn't want to think that they could already be waking. If that were the case... We'd have to go in for unconcealed hand-to-hand. -hand. Blake nodded before I finished, already knowing what I was thinking, and started to whisper the odor down the line. I waited until Bravo Squad had disappeared around the corner, and then took one last look into the lobby, jumping once more when the doors, which had closed, slid open again. The two-story entranceway was completely lifeless, and our footsteps echoed off of the high, empty area. For some reason, the silence was creepier in the light. I was used to the clatter and laughter back at camp during the day, and the fact that this bright place was dead quiet was frightening. I didn't bother clicking off my flashlight as we made our way carefully toward the dark hallway, which would lead to the pharmacy though I was slightly aggravated at the burning the illumination of the building caused in my eyes. Night vision was crucial, and now we'd have to go into the pharmacy partially blind until we readjusted. Reaching the start of the closed-off hallway, I set my hand on the doorknob and pushed on it, and then I pulled the door open, inch by inch, praying the hinges wouldn't squeak. When I had it all the way open, I tiptoed in, closely followed by Blake. The hallway branched off in two directions. To our right was the longest stretch of it, and I could see the doorless area not far down, which must be the pharmacy. Straight ahead was the shorter stretch, and Powers was right. There was a stairwell just a few feet ahead, next to some elevators that I'm sure would work if we tried. I veered right, taking my time in the newly dimmed area, and giving myself occasion to see again. I risked shining my light ahead, looking out for any ferals making their way down the narrow corridor. I had my back against the wall, facing away from the lobby, and the moment we neared the pharmacy, I could smell them. 
It was the wretched stench of crammed together bodies that hadn't been bathed in years, along with the decaying scent of something they must have feasted on. My stomach lurched with disgust at the smell, and I stopped at the edge of the wall, knowing I could peer around it and catch a glimpse of ferals. I held my breath, straining my ears for the sound of any shuffling, listening to see if they were awake or not. When no sound but raspy wheezing came, I poked my head around the corner and lifted my light around the open area in front of the pharmacy. The dark blue beam of my flashlight hit something reflective, a pair of open eyes. Instinctively, I drew back behind the wall, tensing my fingers around my hunting knife to comfort the wildly unnerving beat of my heart. I expected that I'd been seen, and I waited for some kind of holler before being charged. Nothing. Not even the scuffle of footsteps heading our way. It took a minute before I calmed enough to venture another look. The pair of eyes were gone, and I was comforted to find each of the ferals were fast asleep. I thought I could make out the dismembered and decaying skeleton of a cat in the corner, the source of the second unpalpable smell. This was it. I started forward into the den. I knew my comrades were behind me, even though we were all being so guardedly silent that I couldn't hear them. The ferals were a scattered heap of stinking bodies, breathing heavily throughout the small area. Some huddled together, some retired on their own a few feet away from the others. I slunk around the edges of the clan, body tense and ready should one of them suddenly wake up. Thankfully, powers had counted correctly, and there was one of us for each of our opposition. I moved around until I was at the far side of the pharmacy's foyer, standing directly above a feral. I kept a close eye on the mangled female beneath me, with my peripherals watching, until a blue light illuminated each feral, until we were set in position to ambush and destroy. My heart was beating so torturously fast, I was sure everybody in the room could hear it. Never before had we needed to compromise ourselves like this in such a tight space, and the stimulating flow of adrenaline had me itching to finish it. Shortly, it appeared that each of my soldiers was in position, so I took my eyes off of the feral to glance up and make sure. Each of them was tense with a knife in their hand, ready for the assault. I glanced back down to pick the spot I'd thrust my knife, and there they were, another pair of glowing eyes looking straight up at me. The second the feral's eyes met mine, my heart dropped with terror. It's like the creature didn't recognize me until we locked gazes, but once it did, it mobilized. It let out a long, blood-curdling scream so full of fury and animosity I felt my veins ice over. Now! I shouted over the wailing and before any of the other ferals could react. The one beneath me had already begun to scramble up, so I made a jab at its midsection with my knife, trying not to get my arm anywhere it could bite at me with its mouth. I only managed to swipe across its lower stomach, and as it stood it let out another furious yell and its hands extended toward me. I ducked out of the way as it lunged, and the moment I heard it hit the wall, I turned and pinned it from behind. I could barely keep it in place because it was frenziedly pushing back against the wall and struggling to break from my hold. Before it could escape, I plunged my knife deep into its back. It threw its head back and howled in pain, putting me in the perfect position to get my arm around its neck. I grabbed it from behind and pulled it away from the wall, exposing its front where I drove my knife into its chest to put it out of its misery. I tossed the lifeless body aside and took frantic, deep breaths to calm me down. Everything was quiet behind me, and when I turned, I counted my soldiers, hands on my knees while I continued to gasp past the horrified pulsing in my chest. Everyone good? I asked, lifting my light to each of my companions. A few of them whispered, yeah. The rest nodded. McMahon, Garcia, Hunt, and Lee, give your packs to someone and stand guard out here. The rest of you, fit as many meds and supplies in the bags as you can. I grabbed Blake's backpack from him and shuffled into the blackened pharmacy behind the rest of my guys. I hopped over the pharmacist's counter and scanned the shelves, picking out the drug names I recognized as ones that Doc had used many times. 
mostly painkillers and antibiotics. It appeared we weren't the first ones to raid the hospital, because while there were still more supplies than we could carry, it was clear the shelves had been half emptied. Along with the meds, I grabbed as many bandages and wound cleaning materials as I could fit. When everyone was finished loading up, we headed back out into the foyer and then down the hall toward the stairwell. There had to be at least 12 floors in the building, tempting me to see if the elevators really worked or not. Instead, we jogged silently up, step by step. We had to be close to the ninth floor when something caused me to stop. In such an enclosed space, the smell was overpowering, but I couldn't hear or see where it was coming from. I took a cautious step forward to shine my light up the next bend of the flights of stairs, and the moment I got there, something came crashing down at me, jaws wide and ready to take a chunk from my flesh. I used the feral's momentum to turn it and push it away from me and into the wall. It barely touched the concrete surface when it ricocheted and leapt again, knocking me onto my back on the stairs. I threw my hands around its neck, trying with all of my strength to keep its teeth away as it pushed all of its weight down on me, snapping at me. It seemed almost as quick as it had started, it was over. There was a little crack as Blake broke its neck, and I shoved the no longer struggling creature off of me and then clambered to my feet. God damn it, I growled, more from shock than anger, and then I gave McMahon a thankful pat on the shoulder. I picked up my flashlight from the ground and searched around for the knife I'd also dropped. And once I found it, I started upwards again. We reached the roof a few flights later, and I took a watchful glance around, looking for Bravo Squad, before going all the way out. Bravo was huddled near the center, and when I got there, I collapsed onto the surface of the roof with a deep sigh. Blake plopped down next to me, and with a chuckle, he rummaged through the backpack I'd thrown off from my back. He pulled out my sweater and draped it over my eyes to shield them from the light when the sun came up. Thanks. I gave him a grateful smile. Then I folded my hands behind my head and finally took a somewhat relaxed breath. Good night. Chapter 2. Black. Echo. I sat there with my legs dangling over the edge of the fire escape, leaning forward against the metal bolster and staring out over the water. I couldn't really discern anything aside from the bright red cherry at the end of my nose, which flared and deepened every time I inhaled a breath of smoke. Even if watching the glowing embers didn't temporarily blind me, it was a moonless night. There wasn't much to see anyway. The city on the opposite side of the river, just like the one behind me, was completely unidentifiable against the black sky, but I knew it was there. I'd grown up on that side of the river and I could picture it perfectly. My feet were swinging back and forth, and after I took the cigarette out of my mouth, I tapped a board rhythm against the metal railing with my free hand. After a minute of it, the sound gave me deja vu, and I thought it was a song I used to know. I sang some lyrics in my head, trying to match the words to the beat. Justify your soul, sell your soul. Neither was satisfying. Something, something, hope. Ugh, forget it. I mumbled to myself and fell onto my back, raising the cigarette to my lips once more. It had been years since I'd heard any real music. No wonder I couldn't remember. What I missed even more than music was books. There was a library close by, but it was overrun with biters. Every once in a while I'd find a good book in some home or store that I'd scavenged in. On those nights, I'd always hunkered down in a corner, reading with my flashlight and getting so lost in it that only the gray of dawn could pull me away. I never took them back with me. I could only imagine the others making snide comments about it. I wriggled against the graded surface I was lying on, and when I couldn't adjust to a comfortable position, I reached under me and grabbed the 9 millimeter out of the waist of my baggy black cargo pants. Setting it beside me, I smiled. Now I could gaze at the stars in comfort. 
There wasn't much else to do after the sun went down, and the night was still young. I could always go back to the complex and play a heated game of poker with the others. And in a couple of hours, I'd probably be bored enough that I would. But for now, just like every other night, this was how I got my space. I hated the complex and the people in it. I lay there for a good hour before the boredom won out. Pushing myself up, I swung my legs onto the back of the fire escape, grabbed my gun in my backpack, and stood. Despite not being able to see the handlebars or the ground, I climbed easily down the ladder and jumped the last couple of feet to the concrete alley below, landing with a hushed thud. I had a small flashlight in one of my pockets, but I'd grown accustomed to the black. Strangely, in spite of knowing what was out there in the darkness, I felt more at ease at night than I did during the day. Maybe I couldn't see perfectly, but that meant that the biters couldn't either. I'd always been light on my feet, quick and quiet, and I could feel where I was going better than any flashlight could show me. Coming out of the alley and back onto the main street, I turned away from the direction of the complex to explore the deeper parts of the city. The years I'd been here had been more than enough time for me to scavenge the buildings along the main streets. If I wanted to find anything, I'd have to wander for a bit. So I stayed close to the walls, moving silently from shadow to shadow, and swung down a smaller side road. Car after car lined the intersection I was strolling beside, the vehicles of those who didn't make it out of the city, because there was just too many people trying to evacuate. The rate of infection during the initial outbreak was exponential. I wasn't even sure when it really started, or what caused it. Just a lot of more missing persons than normal. Then a quiet couple of days, because that's how long it took for the virus to set in. That was the first wave. The second wave was when those missing persons were found. They went right back home, back to their families, attacking anyone in sight on the way. That's how I know that biters like to stay somewhere familiar. Those first waivers went back home, and something inside of them was telling them to infect their loved ones. Some were put down before they made it back. Others got to their spouses, their parents, even their children. After that, things exploded. The final wave of the outbreak was chaotic. There were enough biters after the second set that it was a full-blown war on the home front. The government was slow to respond, or there weren't enough military to defend every county in the nation, and police and riot squads weren't well-equipped enough to deal with the scale of the infection and panic. So people started to evacuate the cities on their own. Most of them never made it out. But some of us were smart enough to stay put, to hide. I passed one car with the doors open, silently peering in out of curiosity. The sight within almost caused me to stumble back. There was a biter inside, ugly as all the rest. I hadn't been expecting to see one in the vehicle, seeing as they usually stayed in groups too large to all fit in a small car like this one. Fortunately, it didn't see me poke my head around. It was sleeping the evil out of itself, snoring with every raspy, pallid breath. I tiptoed away from the repugnant creature, and before long, I reached a residential neighborhood that didn't seem like it belonged here, didn't fit in here in this metropolis. The houses were big and suburby, not the normal scrunched-together condos I was used to. This place was upscale, and it was like finding an oasis in a dark, barren wasteland. I could only hope that the insides were as promising as the outsides looked. The next street I was passing was a cul-de-sac, so I turned onto the sidewalk and headed in. A lot of the homes still had cars in the driveways, but I didn't think it was because they'd stuck around. I wouldn't be surprised if the people who own these places also owned two or three more vehicles. Most of them were expensive sport coupes, and some were luxury family vans. I knew the kind of house I was looking for, though, and it wasn't one from folks who only lived the pampered lifestyle. I stopped in front of a house near the end and grinned, this was what I was looking for. Basketball hoop attached to the garage. Large raised truck with massive mud tires in the driveway. Hammock on the front porch. The kind of house where the owners were athletic. 
and just maybe enjoyed the outdoors enough to have camping gear or anything else useful. I crept up the stairs of the porch, and when I reached the front door, I gave the handle a gentle twist. Locked. So far, that was a good sign. It meant the place might be clear of biters. Then I made my way back down and around to the fenced-in backyard. The wooden gate was shut, but probably not locked. And as I got to it, I pulled the fold-up knife out of my pocket. I felt like a kid, but it always made me smile when I had that knife in my hand, because the handle was glow-in-the-dark. Gotta enjoy the little things. I held my breath and listened against the quiet night for a moment alert for the sound of the biters behind the fence. Then, with my knife in hand, I stretched my arm over the top of the gate. It took me a second of feeling around to find the latch, but when I did, I pulled it up and leaned my shoulder against the gate. I stood at the entrance of the backyard, squinting into the darkness with my ears attentive. Then I took a deep breath through my nose, trying to smell that rank stench that lets you know biters are around. There was no breeze to carry the scent to me. Eventually, I took a tentative step forward, then another, knife poised and ready. I walked the perimeter of the yard, trudging through the overgrown grass, and finding it empty, I finally made my way to the back door. Just like the front door, it was locked. Kneeling down so I was eye level with the door handle, I gripped the knife between my teeth and grabbed at the braided bracelet on my wrist pulling out the two halves of the bobby pin I'd stored in the inside strands. The bobby pin wasn't stuck in the bracelet, so I could hide it, seeing as I'd never been in a position where I needed to secretly open something. It was more so I wouldn't have to go inconveniently digging around in my pockets for the two small pieces every time I wanted to scavenge somewhere. I'd asked one of the guys back at the complex to teach me how to pick locks years ago, the second I'd realized that even through the panic, people still thought it was necessary to bolt their doors behind them. I stuck one of the pins into the bottom of the keyhole, turning it a little to see which way I needed to push it. Once I figured it out, I pushed the other one into the top and gently fiddled around with the pins on the inside. It took a minute of habitual jimmying, but eventually, I was able to turn the bottom pin completely, freeing the latch. Only when I tried to push the door open, it held fast, and I realized the owner had also secured the deadbolt just above the handle. With a sigh, I moved up, repeating the process on the deadbolt. I winced again when it slid back with a click. It probably wasn't even that loud, but everything around me was so still that the unavoidable metallic sound was deafening. Now that everything was unlocked, I took the knife out of my mouth, separated the door from the frame, and with my first step indoors, I took an instinctual whiff through my nostrils. Still no sign of trouble. I closed and rebolted the door behind me. The back door opened up into a large kitchen. Directly to my left was a long countertop with a sink in the middle. And the stove and the oven were under the shorter counter adjacent to that. Beside the stove was a small door, which looked like it might open up to a pantry. On the wall across from me was a refrigerator. Next to that was a doorless entryway to the rest of the house, and on my right, another entry into the dining room. Without thinking, I strode over to the refrigerator and swung it open, gagging and almost slamming it shut the second after I did. That was a mistake. Whatever food had been in there was long decayed, but the unbearably rancid smell had soaked into the lining of the appliance. I don't know why I even opened it in the first place. A thoughtless instinct from a long dead life, maybe. But definitely something I'd have to make sure never to do again. Thinking I'd have better luck with the pantry, I made my way over and pressed my ear to the door, just in case. No noise coming from the other side, so I opened it up. I couldn't read any of the labels because it was way too dark, but I could definitely see some canned goods on the shelves and that brought a smile to my face. Now I finally pulled out my flashlight, clicking it on and shining the beam around. My smile widened, and at the sight of one thing in particular, made my stomach growl voraciously. Honey. A big, bear-shaped, golden-filled bottle of it. 
I snatched it off the shelf like it would disappear if I didn't grab it that instant, and wrapped my arms around it in a pleased hug. Oh, Pooh Bear, you made my night, I whispered happily, clutching the bottle to my chest. The liquid had started to crystallize a little, but not so much that I couldn't dip my finger in once I twisted the cap off. I scooped so much honey onto my fingertip that it was trickling off and I hastily shoved it on my tongue so that I wouldn't lose any more precious drops. My eyes rolled back euphorically at the sweet tingling that saturated my mouth. I could have finished all of it right then and there. The only thing that stopped me was thinking that if I ate it all now, I wouldn't have anything left for later. I screwed the lid back on and pulled my empty backpack off my shoulders, dropping it to the bottom. There was a total of nine cans in the pantry, beans, vegetables, and spaghetti sauce. And with every one I put into my bag, my stomach grew more and more impatient. The last can I grabbed was chili. Real, beef-filled chili. And spicy, too. It said so right there on the label. I reached into the side pocket of my pack and grabbed my tiny little can opener. Then I hopped onto the kitchen counter, opened the can, bent the lid into a scooper, and shoveled down that delicious food. Every drop of chili-flavored remains was cleared from the sides of the can before I knew it, and I had half a mind to open something else up. But food had been getting more and more scarce. If the doors weren't locked like they were at this house, the biters got in and demolished everything that looked or smelled even remotely edible. It would be irresponsible for me to finish two cans in five minutes. After I satisfied my hunger, I went back to the pantry checking to see if I'd missed anything. There was a half-empty bag of rice at the bottom, but when I picked it up, all the grains spilled out the bottom through a mouse-chewed hole. There were also three bottles of water, so I gulped down one and put the other two in my backpack. Just to make sure, I opened all the cupboards that lined the walls of the kitchen. Aside from the things like spices, however, they were all filled with dishes and baking utensils. I made my way out of the kitchen and to the large hallway, keeping my senses alert for any threat. I kept my flashlight on now, using it so that I could spot anything that I might want to take back with me. The beam illuminated a small area in front of me as I continued forward, showing me the various things scattered about the floor. It appeared the tenants had vacated in a hurry. As I glanced around, I made the mistake of looking at a picture on the wall. A nice family portrait of two young boys and a happy couple. I could just picture the kids staring on, frightened, watching as mom and dad frantically gather the things that they thought were important, and throwing everything else over their shoulders in the search. There was a dog in the picture, too, but I couldn't be sure whether they'd taken it with them or not. When I reached another doorway, I ventured into the living room. The massive flat-screen television was still mounted on the wall, once fresh but now rotted wood in the fireplace at the end. I couldn't imagine the kind of useful things I could find in here, and after a quick glance around with my flashlight, I went back out of the hallway. I passed the garage door, but decided I'd save the best for last, and instead made my way upstairs. I took each step carefully, and when I felt it given beneath me, knowing it would creak, I adjusted my position so as not to make a sound. I reached the top of the stairs, clutching my knife in my hand because every door up here was open and close together. I could get attacked from any direction, at any time. One step forward, and I was another step closer to the first door. Another step. Step. When I reached the first room, I peered around the corner into it. It was a bathroom, and it was as empty as I could have hoped. As I turned to make my way to the next room, Something squeaked and scurried across the floor toward me. My heart skipped, and I reactively pulled my arm back, ready to stab whatever was going to rush me. But the critter stopped, looked up at me, and with another squeak, it darted away. Stupid mouse. I laughed quietly, taking a deep breath to calm my nerves. Once I regained my confidence, I continued through the upstairs. There wasn't much around aside from fresh soap bars and toothpaste under the sinks. After I put those in my bag, I went back downstairs and to the garage. I spotted the box for the camping tent right away, and it made me hopeful of what else I might find. 
There was a tool cabinet in the far corner, so I checked that first. Not much I could take except for a screwdriver, because I was pretty sure Martin broke the one he had. I found some duct tape, too, and you could never have enough of that. In another box near the tent was some camping gear, some lighter fluid, a small hatchet. I was hardly a block away from home, still creeping through the darkness, when I heard some muffled footsteps from the alley up ahead. It always irked me when biters got restless and started wandering the streets hours before dawn. It also freaked me out, and the second I heard the sound, I dove behind a car on the road. I was debating with myself over whether to take my chances and sneak past, or to go back and circle around, when I heard a soft whisper coming from the same spot. It wasn't a biter. There was somebody over there, and it wasn't one of my own. We didn't sneak around in alleys. I took another second to contemplate, and then I pulled the gun out of my waistband and started stealthily forward. Shooting off a gun right now was the last thing on earth I wanted to do, but if whoever was down there had one pointed at me, at least I'd have a better chance than pulling my knife. I pressed my back against the wall, careful not to make the slightest sound, as I shuffled forward. When I got to the entrance of the alley, I paused to get my flashlight. Then I counted to three. On three, I shot out, at the same time clicking on my light and shining it down the narrow passage. There was definitely someone down there, but my beam wasn't bright enough to reach the end. So I took a step forward, my finger tensed over the trigger. Whoever it was could undoubtedly see me, and they didn't say anything, just stayed huddled at the back wall. Hey, I whispered just loud enough for the person to hear me. No trouble, okay? Still, the small figure didn't respond, and I began to wonder if this wasn't the best idea. But I could handle myself, and I continued forward, repeating that I didn't want any trouble. As I passed by the dumpster, I maneuvered and shined my light around it, making sure nobody was hiding there to ambush me. And now I could see. It was a young girl, 17, maybe 18 years old, and she looked terrified of me. I moved my sights off of her so that she wouldn't feel as threatened. But as I opened my mouth to speak to her again, I felt something hard and round pressed against the top of my back. Shit. I hadn't heard whoever was behind me coming. Hadn't even seen another hiding place in the alley. But I must have been too eager. And now I was screwed. The gun. A male voice ordered. He sounded older. At least 20 years older. I cleared my throat so that he wouldn't hear the click as I flipped the safety on, and then I held my arm and the gun over my shoulder, still forward enough that he'd have to reach for it. He did exactly what I wanted him to, and the second he reached for the gun, I dropped it. Pivoting on my heels, I ducked enough to avoid if he got a shot off, and grabbed the barrel of his gun and pulled hard, wrenching it out of his hand. Not a moment after I gained possession, I sent both hands into his chest knocking him off his feet and sending him tumbling to the ground. He seemed wildly unprepared for any kind of counterattack, and even in the dark his face showed panic. I was going to point the gun I now held, his gun, at the girl before she had time to come at me, but as I turned with it in my hand, I could tell it didn't feel right. I spared a swift glance down at what was in my grasp. A flashlight. Seriously? I chuckled, half amused and half disbelief. A flashlight. He made a move to rush forward at the gun I dropped, but he was too far away. I had my foot on the weapon and my knife in my hand before he even got halfway. Don't be stupid, I whispered angrily. I didn't like the position he was putting me in. I wasn't going to hurt them, but he seemed intent on getting at me. Since he couldn't be trusted, I held my knife toward him, keeping the girl in my peripheral vision while I bent over for my gun. When I had it back in my hand, I turned the safety off and motioned him over to the girl. That way I wouldn't have to work so hard to watch both of them. He stood bitterly with a scowl on his face, and as he passed me, he eyed my weapon, and I saw his body tense. I swear to God, if you try anything, I will shoot you, I warned, knowing he was thinking about lunging. He plopped down beside the girl, patting her soothingly on the back. Then he looked at me pleadingly. Please, don't kill us. I didn't mean anything. Shh. I shushed him. He was talking too loud, putting us all at risk. 
You pulled a pretend gun on me, I accused, mildly annoyed. You had a real one on my daughter, he whispered back, angry, but taking my shushing seriously. He had a point, so I lowered my gun, keeping it ready at my side. He studied me for a second, and when he spoke again, he sounded scared. I saw that tattoo on your wrist. Are you a raider? Not the one you need to worry about, I told him in a hushed murmur, glimpsing down at the ink. All of us had it, like a gang sign. I hated it, and never wanted it in the first place. But I already didn't fit in well with the group. I couldn't insult them by being the only one without the mark. It was three daggers set in the shape of an A, with a circle around it in the background. Anarchy. But there are others close by. You can't stay here. We have nowhere else to go, the girl spoke for the first time, her voice an exhausted whine. We've been traveling for so long. Where are you headed? I asked, glancing back out of the alley from the growing sense of unease. These people were in more danger than they'd realized sitting here. Nowhere in particular. Our group got separated a few weeks ago, the man said, and getting more comfortable that they wouldn't try anything. I strode forward and handed him his flashlight. We're looking for somewhere permanent. Well, it isn't here. I took a step back from him, out of striking distance just in case, and squatted down to their level. You're not safe here. You seriously need to leave. The man just shook his head, patting the near-empty backpack across his daughter's thighs. We were hoping to scavenge. We don't have any food, not enough water to make it another day on the road. And those things, there are worse things than biters in the city, I said impatient. He didn't understand what I was telling him. If the others found them, they were dead, for sure, or worse in the girl's case. The girl sniffled, and when she noticed I'd seen a tear glittering down her cheek, she dropped her head. Her father did the same when I glanced at him. Damn these people for doing this. But I couldn't just leave them here stranded. If I give you some food, some water, will you promise to leave? Not tomorrow? Not in a few hours. Now. Go back the way you came and avoid being seen and heard at all cost. The man looked at me, and he was quiet for a few thoughtful seconds. Then he nodded. And even though I wasn't entirely convinced, I pulled my backpack off of my shoulders and set it on the ground in front of me. I rummaged around in it for a second with one hand, still holding onto my gun with the other, and pulled out two cans of food and a bottle of water. Second I set them down, the girl picked up the can, sniffling again as she licked her lips and turned it over in her hands. The man's stomach growled loudly, too. Poor guys were probably starving. My hand hesitated over the hatchet, and I looked at the man thoughtfully for a second. If he pointed a flashlight at me, it must have meant that they didn't have a single weapon. They were vulnerable, and I knew how terrible a feeling that was. I pulled out the hatchet, carefully handing it to the man, watching him in case he'd gotten any ideas to rob me for everything else in my pack. He just took it into his lap, giving a defeated but grateful nod. Hey, I said softly, reaching out and gently nudging the girl's chin. Keep your head up. Your dad's doing the best he can. She nodded, wiping her nose on the cuff of her long sleeve shirt. I didn't like seeing people like this, so desperate for whatever they can get. It tugged at my heartstrings. Do you like honey? I asked her. I hated it, but that's how bad I felt for these guys. If this was a con, they were pulling it off flawlessly. But I'd survived without the stuff. They probably wouldn't. The girl's eyes widened, and she looked up at me like she couldn't believe it. When she nodded, I reached to the bottom of my bag and pulled out the precious bottle of honey and handed it to her. It was almost hard for me to let it go when she took a hold of it, but the smile on her face was worth it. I stood after that and threw my bag back over my shoulders. Thank you. The man stood as well and extended a grateful hand to me. I shook it and then looked at him as sternly as I could right in the eyes. I'm not kidding. Please for her sake.
and I nodded toward his girl. Leave now. I didn't wait to see if he had nodded or not, and I certainly didn't wait to see if they would really leave. I didn't want to think any more about it. I didn't want them on my conscience. Back on the street, I headed for the complex, listening for footsteps in case the pair might try to follow me. They didn't. And everything was silent until I got back. I spotted the familiar airplane, leaned up against the side of a tall office building. It was a chance that the plane had crashed that way. It had split in half, the broken end near the ground, and the nose smashed into the side of the building. The other plane, the one that had collided with it, landed a few blocks away with parts from both scattered all over the place. Martin was the handyman of the group, and he welded off a small portion of the plane near the ground, just enough for someone to squeeze through with equipment. Then he knocked out the windows in the cockpit, dropped a rope ladder down the aisle from the top to the bottom, from the building to the ground. This was our entrance to the complex, since biters weren't smart enough to figure it out. All the other doors and windows on the first floor were boarded off, except one, which was only locked, but the inside was heavily booby-trapped. So if any biters got through alive, we'd hear them coming. This entrance was booby-trapped too, but not like the other, and it was easy to get through once you knew where to go. It had taken us a long time to secure this entire building, but it was ours, along with the rooftops of ten other buildings, connected by custom Martin-built plank bridges. I crawled under the space at the base of the plane, and then climbed at the slant up the ladder. When I reached the top, I strolled down the long hallway, sticking to the walls of the office cubicles, to avoid the five or six tier gas grenades hidden underneath the carpet. At the end of the hallway, even though I couldn't see it, I stepped habitually over a tripwire, which was connected to a five-arrowed mount crossbow aimed straight down the hall. Then I veered left down another row of cubicles, the end of which was a stairwell. I avoided another tripwire, which would have swung three heavy balls with metal spikes sticking out every direction on top of my head. As I reached the stairwell, I eyed the mine just to the side of the door. Blaze, the guy who'd set up all these traps, he called it a claymore. Or when I asked him more specifically, a M18A1. They put it there in case spiders overran us someday. It was supposed to blow out the whole floor kill a whole bunch of them. It wasn't attached to a tripwire or to some pressure plate beneath the floor. The detonator was hanging on the wall a few feet up the stairs. All I cared about was that the thing scared the shit out of me. I pulled the door handle up instead of pushing it down, because that was the final booby trap, and I wasn't looking to set off the grenade taped just under the inside handle. And then I continued up the stairs, when Blaze first decided he wanted to set all these traps, I thought it was downright excessive. Now, even though we hadn't had a single biter intruder in the two years we'd been here, it was nice knowing we were so well protected. This building had a total of 12 stories, but we really only used the top four floors, so I trudged up flight after flight, all the way to the top. When we first got here, going up so many flights was an inconvenience. Now it was easy as ambling down the street. The ninth floor were the barracks, where each of us had our own cot. I never slept there, though. I'd secured a roof of my own, so I wouldn't have to be around the others all the time. The tenth floor was our leader's floor. The eleventh was the lounging area, where we spent most of our waking hours. And the twelfth was the weapons store. I finally reached the eleventh floor, and before I opened the door, I took a deep breath preparing to don the mask I always wore around the others, the facade that blended me in as well as possible, just enough that they'd accept me, to the point that they wouldn't kill me. Then I turned the handle and walked in. Through the dim light of the battery-powered lantern, I spotted Martin playing what looked like an intense game of poker with Decker and Halston at the center of the room. Quinn looked up from an old magazine she was reading on the couch at the far end, and then went back to it like she didn't even see me. Farah, who gave me an acknowledging smile, was sitting at the table near the couch cleaning weapons. Two were missing, Blaze and our leader, Leon, who must have been out somewhere scavenging too. None of the guys seemed to notice me when I walked in, 
but when I stood near the table and dropped my heavy backpack onto the floor with a thud, they all looked up from the game. What do you got there? Martin asked, craning his neck even though he couldn't see inside the still-zipped bag. Decker's eyes went from the guys to me, and he glared, throwing his cards down like he was pissed I'd interrupted the game. The others always seemed wary of me, but Decker despised me. He could tell I didn't belong, that deep down I wasn't like them. That, and I didn't put up with his misogynistic bullshit. Lately, I could tell that his opinion of me was spreading, especially to Blaze, who'd started to avoid even talking to me. I ignored Decker's spite and undid the zipper of the backpack, dumping the contents onto the floor. I could tell everyone's mouth started to water when they saw the canned goods, even Decker's. A normal meal for us was rice or beans and some fruit from one of the few trees we'd managed to grow by the river. And maybe the occasional fish when someone got the urge to sit out there all night. Anything canned was a rare treat. Martin was the first to stand, but he didn't pick up the food. Echo, you shouldn't have. He swooned playfully. He brought me a screwdriver. I laughed and shrugged like it was no big deal. The others made a small commotion about the food and then went back to doing what they were doing before. After I'd put the goods away in the boxes that lined one wall of the room, I made my way to the table to watch the poker game. They were playing for cigarettes and alcohol, the only two things of luxury we had around here, and it took me a moment of standing there with my arms crossed over my chest, studying the game to figure out who was winning. It was Decker. He'd always been the best bluffer. About 15 minutes of me standing there with Decker occasionally glancing up to leer at me, he finally spoke. Where'd you get all this stuff? Every time he said something to me, it was sarcastic and bitter. Most of the time, it made me want to knock his teeth out. Sometimes, it scared me. Residential neighborhood a few blocks away. I told him without making eye contact. I didn't have to see him to know the look he had on his face. He didn't say anything, just played his next hand, grinning like a fiend when he won the pot. A second later, Quinn came over, and she must have heard him acknowledge me. She sat right down on his lap, giving him a possessive kiss so deep it made me sick. Then she looked right at me as if to emphasize her point, and I refrained from rolling my eyes. I couldn't look away from her, though, because her left cheek was swollen and bruised. It had happened before, but it wasn't usually on her face, and it made me glare at Decker. He followed my gaze, but when I gave him a hard look, he just smirked. What's the matter, Echo? He asked teasingly, looking me up and down. Jealous you aren't getting any of this? Then he held out his arms, motioning to himself. I chuckled gaining my usually corrosive tone for whenever I had to deal with him. It was my only defense against their disgusting behavior. Not really. I made a deliberate nod toward Quinn. Black and blue aren't really my colors. Decker didn't just make those comments because he was an asshole. He hated me so much that he knew that if he showed that kind of interest, it would make Quinn hate me too. It was his way of getting some control over me taking away the potential companion, a friend, isolating me even more than I already was. He'd been working at it for years, but I didn't care for Quinn's companionship. She was exactly the kind of girl I would never be. I think it would suit you, he glowered as he made an obvious threat. None of the guys picked physical fights with the girls, except for Quinn's obvious abuse, because they acted fragile. I was practically one of the guys. But the only reason Decker or any of the others didn't pick fights with me is because in most situations, I'd win. I was smaller, more agile, and intuitive. Also, before the outbreak, our leader Leon took up MMA fighting as a hobby, and he taught me how to take care of myself. That was probably another reason Decker didn't like me. He made the mistake of picking a fight years ago and he'd never go through the embarrassment again. When I just shrugged off his comment, he motioned for me to sit at the last empty seat next to him. One in on this game? But I was suspicious of his motives. Not worth my cigarettes. 
I've got a different wager for you, he said, leaning back in his chair with Quinn still in his lap. I win. I get you in the barracks tonight, and you make it worthwhile. At that, Quinn gave an angry scoff and stormed away. Martin snorted with laughter. It was all fun and games to him. He didn't understand what Decker was trying to do. My first thought was absolutely not, especially because I knew Decker would win. But then I glanced across the table at Halston, who nodded at me. Halston was the one person around here I even remotely liked. He was no angel, but he wasn't quite as bad as the rest, and he didn't have anything against me. When Halston nodded, I nodded too. No lead that the bastards got on Bandorum. Don't let the bastards get you down. I wouldn't let Decker grind me down. Fine, but I want every last cigarette you've got, and your portion of breakfast in the morning. Deal. He grinned evilly as I took a seat and began to shuffle the cards. Halston stood so Decker wouldn't deal him in, and he made his way to stand between my seat and Decker's where he'd have a good view of the game. Then he leaned over and placed one hand on the back of my chair, where he could easily signal to me by tapping me on the back. It wasn't the first time Halston and I had cheated together, but Decker was the only dumbass that hadn't caught on to it yet. Just to give the impression that I was completely at ease with the wager, and so Decker couldn't see my eyes, I reached up and pulled the cowboy hat off of Halston's head, setting it back down onto my own. Decker started dealing the cards, leaving Martin out of it, so it was just he and I. And I reached for the box of poker chips under the table, so I'd have something physical to wager with. Decker had dealt for Texas Hold'em, and the first two cards I got weren't looking so good. Then he flipped over the first three community cards, and things were a little better. I had a pair of nines, so I tossed one chip into the pot. Decker silently matched my bet with a cigarette and flipped over the next card. It didn't help me at all, but Decker threw in another sig. That's when Halston tapped me on the back, a signal to fold. I fold, I said, tossing Decker my cards. What? He was already aggravated, knowing he could have won more cigarettes that round, but I was already behind, and I wanted anything but to lose. Decker dealt again, and I was instantly happy with my hand. Pair of kings, and with the first three cards he flipped over, though they didn't help, I added to the pot. Decker saw my bet and then flipped the next card. Another king. Before I wagered again, I hesitated, waiting for Halston to communicate. I was pretty sure I would get this round, but I wanted to make damn certain. There were two light taps on my back, telling me to wager, so I put in two chips. Decker raised it to four, but he was bluffing and there were another two taps on my back, so I matched it. We both threw in one more with the flip of the fifth card, and I'd won the round. I grinned, ready for the next. I won that hand, too, and I could tell Decker was already getting furious. He was swearing up a storm, and when I folded the fourth hand, and then won the fifth, his swearing grew louder. That's when Quinn came back over, and she glared at me with a vengeance. She's cheating, you idiot! She yelled at Decker, pointing at me. What? He looked confused and then mad that Quinn was shouting at him. They're cheating, she repeated. Decker looked from me to Halston before he grew visibly enraged. You son of a bitch! He stood, flipping the table over and on top of Martin, who'd been innocently watching the game from his seat. Then he swung at Halston, catching him in the jaw and sending him straight to the floor. Luckily, he didn't stop to attack me. He jumped on top of Halston, and the two started brawling, rolling across the floor in a ball of swinging fist and fury. I stood close by, waiting patiently for the perfect moment to jump in and come to Halston's aid. It came when Decker had him pinned, and I threw myself onto Decker's back, wrapping my legs around his waist and my arms tied around his neck, choking him. He tried to throw his fist, hoping it would hit me, but I sank down so he missed. He tried to grab at me, but he wasn't in the position to get a good enough hold. Eventually, we fell backward off of Halston, and even though I tried not to let it show, it was hard to breathe under Decker's massive weight of gigantic muscle. I loosened my grip a little on his neck so that he wouldn't pass out, but any time he tried to get out of it, 
I tightened again. I wasn't letting him go until he calmed down, no matter how crushed I felt. Before that could happen, Blaze came bursting through the door, closely followed by Leon. Hey guys, guess what? He shouted excitedly, but he didn't wait for a response. We spotted a little fire. There's some people out there. Let's go get some supplies. I lost my grip on Decker as my heart sank. The father and daughter, they hadn't left. And now they'd see what I was warning them about. I lay there on the ground after Decker rolled away and pushed himself up. Then I continued to lay there as they all cheered, grabbing the finished weapons Farah had been cleaning and filing out of the stairwell. I didn't want to go out there just to see the man and the girl killed. Damn them. I told them to leave. I told them they were in danger. Even though I didn't want to, I stood, lagging far behind the others. Maybe I could find them first and cover for them while they got away. I rushed down, but by the time I got to the alley, where I knew the travelers had been, there was a quiet commotion, with only two of my group remaining, and they were coming back toward me. What happened? I whispered, seeing Farrah lead the wounded Martin toward me. Bastard had a hatchet, Martin said, holding his arm and wincing his blood oozed through his fingers. Managed to get me before him and some girl made a run for it. Which way? I asked, and they pointed before shuttling past me. I took off the direction they said, hoping to catch the travelers hiding out without my group on their tail. I ran the street as fast as I could, telling myself to stay calm and silent, because there were still blighters out here. I knew I was on the right track when I saw Decker coming toward me alone, a familiar backpack in his hands. The sight of that backpack made me want to puke. They hardly had anything. Some honey, though, Decker grinned, showing me that precious bottle. Then he pulled a can out of the bag. A can I'd given them. Hey. This is just like the one you bought, he said it softly, like he was just mumbling to himself. But after a moment, he looked up at me suspiciously. I changed the subject before he had too much time to think about it. Did they get them? He shook his head and nodded the way he'd come. They dropped the bag and ran. Then he continued back toward the complex with the backpack. I hurried on until I saw Leon and Halston. They were walking towards me, Halston holding a machete in his hand while Leon shined a flashlight down the alleys they passed by. When I reached them, my eyes scanned the machete, looking for any sign of fresh blood on the blade. Where are the others? I asked, getting shushed by Leon because in my panic I had spoken too loudly. They went after the girl, Haston said, putting his machete back in his sheath around his waist. We managed to separate them. The guy's around here somewhere. I'll help you look, I told him, continuing past, hoping I could find the man before they did. Take Halston with you, Leon called after me. I ignored him, jogging off alone before Halston reached me. I pulled out my own flashlight and turned a corner, hoping to get lucky. I moved the beam down every alley as I passed, searching for any sign of the travelers. It took five minutes until I was past an alley, where there was a shrill squeak of a shoe against the cement. During my search, panic had faded to frustration, but the sound made me angry. I stormed down the alley, heading straight for the source of the noise. It was the man, and it was obvious he didn't expect me to come at him so quickly. Horror riddled his face as I reached him and he raised the hatchet, preparing to defend himself. Only when he recognized it was me, he hesitated. It was long enough for me to grab the collar of his shirt, and furious, I threw him back against the wall. What if it hadn't been me walking by? It's like he was trying to get killed. The hell is wrong with you? I whispered angrily, grabbing the hatchet out of his hand and tossing it away. I told you to leave. You yeah, hadn't eaten in days, he stammered, trying to peel my grip from his shirt. Please, you have to find my daughter. They already went after her, I told him. Either they'd already found her and she was dead, or she was on the run, and he would have to wait before going to search for her. Damn you, why didn't you just leave? I repeated to myself, loosening my hold on him, as a sad disappointment sunk into my gut. My daughter, he said again. You can't let them hurt her. Please, you have to... Don't 
put this on me, I growled, pushing him against the wall again. I warned you. This time he retaliated, shoving me away from him. I'm gonna find her. I grabbed his sleeve and yanked him back as he made for the street. If you leave this alleyway, they will kill you. Then you'll never find her. Then what do you want me to do? He begged furiously, tugging his arm from my grasp. Wait here for an hour, I said, knowing my group wouldn't be searching for too long. Then I picked up the hatchet I'd thrown and handed it back to him. Don't leave this alley until then. If you see her, he started after nodding. Promise you won't let them hurt her. I promise I'll do what I can, I agreed, and then headed toward the street. I'd left right on time because the second I got out to the alley, I could see Leon and Houston come in my way a couple of streets down. I searched the whole block. I didn't find him, I said when I reached them, and they instantly turned to head back toward the complex with me. The walk to the complex was a blur. I wanted to hurry and get back to see if the others had found the girl or not. Was it my fault? I'd given them the food. The food they'd made the fire to heat. To make the fire that Blaze and Leon had seen. No. I told him to leave. This wasn't my fault. I just hoped the father wasn't the only one that got away. When we reached the lounging area back at the complex, nobody else was there except for Halston, who had walked in with me, while Leon had gone to his room. I was hoping that that was a good sign meaning they were still out and having a hard time finding the girl. I'd hardly ride to the table Decker turned over and sat down when there was a muffled scream, barely audible because it was coming from a couple of feet below. But I'd heard it. The hell was that? I asked Houston. When he shrugged, I shot up. The girl. I bolted out the door and down the stairwell to the barracks. Decker was there, and Martin and Blaze, and Quinn. She always joined in with whatever the guys were doing, always cheered them on. And the girl. They'd found her. Her hands were bound, but they were letting her run around, letting her dodge as they teasingly tried to catch her. They were toying with her, but I knew how it would end. When I burst in, she spotted me and stopped running. Her teary eyes met mine, and she whimpered passing me a pleading look. It was like a knife in the heart, that look. I'd helped her and her father, and now she saw a friend in me. But I was no friend, and that recognition in her eyes was dangerous for the both of us. There was nothing I could do. If I stood up for her and tried to save her, they'd undoubtedly mess with me and then kill me too. I knew it because Decker hated me, and he had the pull to make it happen. But they were gonna kill her anyway, and I made a promise. So I took my gun out of my waistband, and her eyes widened when she saw it. Before she could scream again, or any of the others could catch on and stop me, I set the sights on her, and I pulled the trigger. At least they couldn't torture her first. This was merciful. Damn them. Echo, what the fuck? Decker yelled furiously as the girl collapsed to the floor, completely lifeless. I didn't even look up at him as I put my gun back in my waist and turned to leave. Bitch, I'm talking to you. I heard him shout after me, the end of his exclamation muffled by the closing of the door behind me. I sprinted all the way up the stairs to the roof, then across one bridge, and then another, until I finally reached my own private roof. I darted into my tent, grabbing my pillow off of my bed and shoving it against my face so nobody would hear me. And I screamed. Her dad pleading with me. Her frightened, tear-filled eyes. I kept screaming and yelling until my lungs were sore, and then just kept going until I had no energy left. Ten minutes later, I was falling on my cot, panting heavily, my throat raw. I heard some footsteps crunching over the gravelly surface of the roof, and a few moments later, Leon appeared at the opening of my tent. He stood there for a minute, watching me, or giving me some time to compose myself. I couldn't be sure. 
and he sighed like he was disappointed. I heard what you did. What, did Decker go tattletale? I asked sarcastically, slight rage forming in my chest at the patronizing tone of his voice. Echo, you know how the others feel about you. Can't just do shit like that. He said, crouching down and playing with the zipper of my tent. You gotta let the guys have their fun. My mouth set in a hard line. Leon had no idea how bad I wanted to hit him right now. When I didn't say anything, he continued. They gotta get it somewhere. And if it's not strangers... Excuse me? I practically spat at him, my voice dripping with disdain. I knew exactly what he was getting at, exactly what he was doing. If you're gonna threaten me, at least have the goddamn balls to do it proper. You watch your mouth, he sneered, coming at me from a different position now, trying to maintain authority. I didn't care if he was mad. He didn't have the guts to lay a hand on me. You'd let them do that? To your cousin? I played that card, hoping it meant something to him, even though I knew better. It didn't mean anything anymore. To your own flesh and blood, without any consequences, no punishment? Then I thought about the other girl in the group, who I knew had a subtle relationship with Leon. You'd let them do that to Farah? He just looked at me, his silence more of an answer than if he'd said anything at all. Get the fuck off my roof. I gave him a glare so fierce he turned away without saying a thing. Once he was gone, I grabbed the single bridge that connected my roof to all the others, pulling it away so nobody else could come to talk to me, to threaten me. Then I collapsed back onto my cot. My cousin Leon had been the leader since the beginning. He was the biggest, the strongest, but he was a coward. The only reason he maintained his position was because he could devastate anyone who tried to take it from him by force. I knew how his mind worked, though, and I could see it on his face. He was afraid of upsetting the masses, afraid the group would mutiny and kill him, and I hated him for that. I hated him for being so weak. I wanted to leave so badly. I wanted to leave this complex and never see any of these disgusting people ever again. But I was a coward too. I wasn't afraid of being alone. And I wasn't afraid of the dark. I was afraid of not having a place to call home. Scared of being caught out on the road day after day. Most of all, I was afraid of ending up like those travelers. Ending up in the clutches of some other ruthless killers. I was scared of all the evils I'd seen and done. As I buried myself under the blankets on my cot, the tears started streaming down my face. My sense of grief and despair and hopelessness was overwhelming. All I could see were the girl's eyes. The fear in them when I pulled out my gun. Damn them. I hated this place. These people and the things they did and said and stood for. I hated Leon. I hated the biters. I fucking hated Decker. But more than anything, I hated myself. Chapter 3 God left the ground. Dugan. Your entire life doesn't flash before your eyes when you think you're about to die. Whoever said that had lied. Maybe the first couple of times it did, but not anymore. Now I wasn't picturing the dark blue bicycle with the playing cards and the spokes that I'd gotten for my fifth birthday. I couldn't feel the yellow cap and gown I'd worn the day I graduated college. My wife's face wouldn't be the last thing I'd ever see, nor would my daughter's. I couldn't picture my daughter's joyous tears the Christmas we'd brought her a puppy, or the sad ones when we told her that we were leaving. Not the things we'd left behind in evacuation, not the widespread panic the weeks of the outbreak, or the days they died, the days... Everyone died. All I could see was the opening of a long silver barrel at the end of a cocked and ready revolver. It glittered in the moonlight. 
The pointed edges of the gun shimmered their reflection at the shaking of the unsteady hand around the grip. I wouldn't even get to see a light at the end of my tunnel. Instead, I was staring straight into the tunnel, the dark, endless cave which at any slight whim would put an end to my long and lonely flight. You so much as breathe, I'll put a bullet in your skull, said the man holding the gun. His voice is deep and threatening, but not out of malice. It's caution. I've heard the tone before. Survival. That's what I was thinking about. How could I get out of this alive? I could throw my hands up and surrender. Maybe the other guy's just as scared as I am. He'd either show a little sympathy or decide I was too dangerous and kill me. Should I draw my own weapon, hope against all odds that he's too slow? No. He might be slow, but his finger was already on the trigger. Smack the gun away and go straight for his throat. That seemed like my best bet. Then I heard my father's words in my head. I'm eight years old again. A large black index finger pointed at me instead of a gun, being scolded because I stood up for myself on a playground. Your mother and I worked too hard for you to get kicked out of private school. You want your education to go to waste? It didn't matter how much I protested, how many times I came home with a busted lip. Violence was never the answer. My mother, dark brown eyes full of affectionate tears. You turn the other cheek, kill them with kindness. All a bully ever wants is a friend. Is a human life worth the risk to me? I spared a glance around the barrel to the man holding the gun. He was old, white hair reflecting the pale glow of the moon, peppery whiskers twitching around the hard set of his mouth. Dull, almost colorless eyes watching me attentively, deep set and tired looking in the heavy bags beneath them. He was thin, too, scrawny and frail looking under his long sleeved denim shirt, the jeans held around his hips only by a leather belt, tightened to the last notch. I could defeat him. Funny how at the end of the world, that's when people erupted in violence. I remember the days of the outbreak, all the people struggling to flee the cities, trampling each other in the rush. Then weeks, months, years after, killing each other over an apple, over a box of ammo. Now, when there was hardly anybody left, when we should be uniting to survive, that's when we killed the easiest. It's worth the risk. He's old. But he's alive. He's a companion, and, like me, a survivor. Please, I begged quietly, my tone placating. I just need a place to stay for the day. Not here, he growled. In the dark, I could see his eyes dart to the hunting rifle hanging at my side. His hands were shaking, and I knew he was reluctant to shoot me though I couldn't tell if it was his morals or just the fear of the shot ringing out in the dark, alerting the world to our whereabouts. I gambled that he didn't want to kill me, and holding one hand out, unthreateningly, I used the other to slowly reach for my rifle. I wrapped my finger around the barrel, nowhere near the trigger so he wouldn't think anything of it, and I lifted it above my head, removing the strap from my shoulder. Then I moved to set it down on a switchboard beside me. And what he didn't realize is that I'd be in a better position now to equip it than I was before, just in case. As I set the rifle down, one end of it landed on the lever, and under the weight of the lever it shifted. It slid forward, the rifle moving abruptly like it was going to fall to the floor. Out of instinct, I made a reach to catch it, and at the same time, the man's other hand flew to his weapon, joined to his other, and studying the gun to get a shot off. I stopped mid-reach, throwing my hands palm up to the air and letting the rifle clatter to the floor so as not to get shot. 
The old man stood there for a minute, both hands aiming the revolver at me, waiting for me to make another fast move. When I didn't, he began to relax, and he dropped one hand to his side. Easy. Once more, I made a calm reach for the rifle. Easy. I repeated softly, lifting the weapon to the switchboard and more carefully putting it down. I already knew, though, that if he hadn't shot me yet, the chances were he never would. I told you, you can't stay here, the man said shakily. I glanced toward the large windows of the air traffic control. The very edge of the horizon was already graying, and soon the sky would brighten. I'd spotted the tower from miles away, and wasted precious time traveling here on the hopes that it was empty and secure. I couldn't leave now. That was a death sentence. Please, the sun's coming up, I told him, pointing out the window. I don't have time to go anywhere else. Daytime was when they came out, the infected, savage, delirious, bloodthirsty remnants of what we used to be. They were like starving, rabid animals, human only in appearance, though. Even that was hardly true anymore. The ferals, that's what I called them ever since I'd seen the warning painted on the outside of a building. Dineural, just like humans had always been which forced the rest of us to travel, scavenge, and survive at night. Daytime was hunting time, and out there, I was as good as dead. I have my own supplies, I added when the man just continued to stare at me, tossing a thumb to my backpack on my shoulders. I'm not here to rob you. I don't need anything except for somewhere to hide. That seemed to reach him a little and he craned his neck to get a better look at my bag. Give me the rifle, he instructed, motioning to the panel at my side. I shook my head, tensing and ready to grab it should he try anything. With all due respect, you are not touching my weapon. I'll leave it where it is until I'm ready to leave. He scowled at me, thick white eyebrows furrowing sternly. I stayed silent while he considered it and looked me over, while he measured the amount of trustworthiness in my story, in my face. After a minute, his thumb went to the hammer of his revolver, and he released the tension in it, and lowered the gun. You stay over here, he said, taking a step backward. That's fair, I agreed, and as he took another step, I lowered myself to the ground. Taking a seat on the floor, I pulled the bag off of my shoulders so that I could lean my back against the solid panel my rifle was sitting on. The man kept his eyes on me, walking in reverse until he reached the opposite end of a small tower. There, he took a seat on a worn sleeping bag, arranged neatly on the carpet, setting his revolver down next to him. He kicked one foot out and brought the other up to set his elbow on it which he rested his head against so that he could watch me comfortably. I'd come across other survivors in my travels. Most of them were just trying to get by on what little they had, sometimes asking if I had anything to trade or avoiding me completely. Others were the types you could tell were trouble. Some of them came right out and tried to take your supplies. Hell, I'd even been shot at a few times. Usually, though, they just looked at you a certain way, watching how you move, scanning your body for hidden weapons, glimpsing your wares for anything loot-worthy, waiting for you to let your guard down so that they could strike. I'd even met some people like this old man, ones who'd likely been the victims of those troublemakers, and who were highly reluctant to let it happen again. The evidence was in the man's face in the unsure twitch of the grim line of his mouth. It was in the frightening widening of his eyes and the upward curve of his brow. And it was in the tentative leer of his watchful glare. I sat there for a few minutes under that wary gaze before the tension of the silence started to get to me. The corner of my mouth turned up into a small, fleeting smile as I reached into my backpack. 
At the movement, the man's eyes narrowed, squinting at me through the hazy light of the dawn as his hand reached for his gun. He was suspicious. But I wouldn't act afraid. I wouldn't draw my hand away and give him more reason to be. When I pulled the deck of cards out of my bag, I held it up to show him, and his shoulder sunk with a visible sigh of relief. My deck was tired, the waxy film worn off by years of use, and the edges blackened by the enduring grime on my hands. What else was there to do during the wait but play cards? I'd never been the stationary, introspective type to be comfortable sitting still all day. That had to be one of the worst things about the outbreak. You couldn't just get out and enjoy pastime anymore. Oh, how I missed a decent game of baseball. The tremendous roar of the crowd when there was a home run. The harmonic echo of the thunderous blow every time a bat cracked against the ball. Even the aggravating fan I always got sat in front of, cheering for my favorite team's opponent. I missed his yelling and taunting. I shuffled and dealt for a game of solitaire, but with the man sitting there, it was only minutes before my concentration failed. It had been so long since I'd seen more of a person than a fleeting shadow in the night, than a silhouette acknowledging I wasn't a feral by lowering its weapon and turning away. In the presence of this man, I was itching for conversation, for an engaging voice rather than a threatening one. But each time I spared a glance upward, he was still watching me with a vigilant stare. It had been some time since I'd eaten, and at the very thought of food, my stomach rumbled longingly. So I slid the deck of cards back in the box and traded it for one of my few remaining cans of food. As I set the large tin down in front of me and reached into the side pocket for a can opener, I could see the man lean forward with interest. I watched him curiously while I gripped the edge of the can between the steel teeth of the opener. His long mustache was twitching characteristically again, but it wasn't displeasure anymore. It was marvel. This was the first time I took inventory of what possessions he had lying about. The sleeping bag, the gun, a gallon jug half full of water, and a few empty containers that used to have food were the only things that I picked out easily. There were no visible rations to be found, and now the scrawny look of the man held meaning. He was starving, licking his lips at the very notion of nourishment. The old man had been peering intently at my hands as I removed the screwed-off lid, and just to let him know that I was watching in case he got any ideas he could rob me. I cleared my throat at him. The noise made him flinch, and he instantly leaned back on his bedding, trying his hardest to act like he wasn't interested. As hungry as he was, he wasn't a thief, and I'll be damned if it made me feel bad for him. There's enough here for two, I said calmly, holding back a chuckle when his eyes lit up. I'm feeling a little thirsty. Maybe we could share. I nodded toward his jug of water. My own small bottle had only a couple of sips left. He considered it as he eyed the carton. Then he grabbed it and stood. He started over toward me, but stopped after a step, turning back to grab his gun. With that in hand, he strode over, plopping down beside me and setting the drink between us. Green beans, I told him, and I pulled the mushy vegetable out of the can cringing when I swallowed it whole. Never much cared for them. Our daughter wasn't the only one my wife had to threaten with no dessert. His mouth twitched with an amused smile as he cautiously reached for the serving. When he still didn't say anything, I stuck out my hand. Dugan. The old man looked from my outstretched hand to my face and then took it in his own. Chuck. We shook, and he pushed the water forward, toward me, when he saw me looking at it. Dugan, he repeated my name deliberately. That a first name or a last? I grinned, hugely grateful for the discourse. 
Well, first, I answered, and added shyly, but my last name is Douglas. Chuck let out a whooping laugh, so surprisingly mirthful in the quiet sunrise that it startled me. So, Dugan Douglas, and he snickered again. Where are you from? California. I noticed he looked like a completely different person when he smiled. Because of his mustache, it was hard to tell Chuck even had teeth. Or most of his teeth, anyway. Still, his disjointed grin was endearing, in a homely kind of way. What brings you to Arizona? he asked. And finally, he grew comfortable enough to take his left hand off the revolver. I've been wandering place to place since the outbreak, scavenging until there's nothing left. Six years, by my count. Figured I might as well head east, see how many people are left after all of this time. I shrugged, unable to find words capable of explaining exactly what drove the change in conduct. I'd been surviving on finding a safe place and staying there as long as possible. For all I knew, it was the only way to survive. I just couldn't do it anymore. Couldn't go on much longer doing the same godforsaken lonely thing day after day. Searching. That's what I was doing. Searching for a new reason to live. I needed something to give my life meaning again. It was silent for a few moments, and in the light of the rising sun, I could see that Chuck's pale eyes were bright, experienced green. Those green orbs studied me thoughtfully, and then he nodded, like even though I hadn't fully explained, he understood. What about you? I asked, after a few more seconds. I'm from a town nearby, he answered. I had popped another green bean into my mouth and swallowed it with difficulty. The texture of the squishy vegetable got less palpable with every bite and not to mention that they were completely cold and flavorless. Just you? Chuck's eyes turned down sadly. My wife died about five years ago. I'm sorry to hear it. She was sick before the outbreak. We both knew it would happen. He shook his head. You said you had a wife and daughter? I took a deep breath, forcing back the wave of emotion the questions brought. It wasn't thinking and talking about them that got to me. It was thinking about it in the past tense. I had a wife and daughter, but now they were gone. Lost them both to the infection, I told him. He nodded in acknowledgement and then lowered his head sympathetically. How old was she? I thought he meant my daughter, but not being entirely sure, I answered for both. My wife was 36. My daughter was nine. So young, he said sadly, and we both fell silent. After a minute, he leaned over to look into the can of green beans. We'd cleaned out every last bit of the vegetable in it, but he picked it up anyway. You mind? He asked, motioning to the liquid in the can. My face twisted with disgust at the thought of drinking the fluid but I guess that's just how hungry he'd been. So I laughed and waved it off. Not if you can stand it. He took a few gulps, and when he pulled it from his lips, he wiped his mouth on the back of his sleeve and shuddered. What I wouldn't give for a filet mignon. Or a nice, juicy lobster tail, I added, closing my eyes to fantasize about the delicious foods we used to take for granted. Amen. Oh, he raised the tin can to toast, and then chugged the rest of its contents. Maybe you should go back to California. Get yourself a boat. Hmm, never been much of a seaman, I admitted. Before the outbreak, I was a VP for an insurance company. Had an office way up in the building on the side that faced the ocean. Just looking at it made me sick. His whiskers twitched with laughter. Used to be a pretty boy, huh? I smirked and gave a sort of half-nod. Patsy is what my wife used to call it. She always did love pulling me out of my comfort zone. She was the adventurous one. 
You seem to be doing all right for yourself, Chuck said reassuringly. I smiled gratefully and took a sip from the gallon of water. What about you? What did you do before the outbreak? Teacher, he answered. Fifth grade. Phew, I scoffed. I hated elementary school. Chuck stretched his legs out so that the bottom half of them were exposed to the sunlight filtering through the tower windows. And then he leaned back comfortably on his hands. Why's that? I was the only black kid at a prestigious private school. You're better than them, my mom used to say. Show them that by not fighting. I was a fat chump, too, so I didn't fit in very well. Doog the boob. Chuck let out a huff of breath and poorly contained laughter, so I snickered to let him know that he could laugh without offending me. It always did amaze me how ruthless kids could be. It always did amaze me how ruthless kids could be, he mused nostalgically. He seemed to think about something then, because he fell quiet, staring down at his toes soberly. Sometimes I wonder if the kids didn't have it right. He looked up again, and I was raising an eyebrow at him curiously. They were always so brutal. If they smelled weakness in each other, they just picked at it and picked at it. It was survival of the fittest on the playground, you know? I nodded. But when hell broke loose with the outbreak, the weak were the first to fall. Something about that struck me like a blow to the head. I wanted to accuse him of being an asshole, to tell him he was wrong. It seemed like a verbal affront to the dead. Like they were gone just because they weren't strong enough to survive. But I didn't feel powerful. I didn't feel special or even remotely worthy of being one of the few left alive. Some of the meek lasted longer than the mighty. Chuck could be right, though. The feeble lasted only because of the strong. I couldn't protect my wife and daughter forever, no matter how hard I tried. That could only go for so long before the world ground us down, and when we perished, so did they. I stood so Chuck wouldn't see my mixed reaction to his reflection, and I leaned my elbows on one of the many panels to look out the large windows. This was a small general aviation airport in relatively the middle of nowhere, Arizona. Across the airstrip, which the tower overlooked, there were four big hangars. Adjacent to the tower was a two-story office building, and behind us, the parking lot. I'd spotted the place from a town a few miles down the road yesterday and decided to travel here at nightfall. I had this strangely hopeful notion there'd be a pilot left who could fly me to some secret place where all the survivors were hiding. From the control room of the 15-story tower, I could see Farrell stirring below. They usually stayed in groups, like families, and it looked like there was a clan of them filtering out of the air hangar. It didn't matter how far you were when you looked at them. They were ugly. Food must be getting scarce for them, too, because of the eight I could see from this distance. Six looked emaciated, and the other two were close. Most of them were naked, and the clothes they'd worn when they'd become infected had become so worn they fell away. The ones who had any garments left usually wore a single article. Thinned and frayed and dirty to an almost unrecognizable state. The same went for their skin. They didn't bathe. They hunted in the daylight without a scrap of clothing. And they slept on the hard ground and fought each other like animals. What have you heard? I asked Chuck as I moved to the window on the other side of the tower so I could look out over the parking lot about what caused the infection. Lots of different things, he said, moving back to his bedding and sprawling out on his sleeping bag. I try not to think about it too much. I don't see how it could help. There were a couple of different vehicles in the parking lot, undisturbed in whatever chaos the airport had seen, just like the few planes parked in the runway. I heard it was a parasite, like those ones that get in your head and control your brain. 
Sounds plausible, I guess. Chuck shrugged, and then folded his hands behind his head. Before I could say anything else, a speckle of movement from below caught my eye. It wasn't the usual undulated and flat-footed gait of the ferals. It was a fluid stride, hasty from behind the cover of a vehicle and disappearing behind the next. My eyes focused when the figure darted from behind a car once more and followed as it moved to the wall near the entrance of the office building. There's a girl down there! My voice came out a little too excited, and I tapped the glass as I pointed down below. What? Chuck asked in shock, scrambling up from his bed to come over to where I was standing. The girl had crouched at the side of the building, and she lifted herself a little to peek into one of the windows. She must have come from the town I'd been in the day before, and thought she might find supplies here before continuing on. She looked young, too. Hard to tell exact age from where I was up in the tower, but she was definitely in her teens. Oh, she don't want to go in there, Chuck said, leaning over the panels to get a better view. There's creatures in there. I watched the girl creep a few places closer to the door of the building. Hey! I shouted, slamming my palms against the glass in hopes that she would hear me. Are you crazy? Chuck's hands flew across my mouth, and he angrily wrestled me away from the window. They'll hear you. They can climb stairs, you idiot. I pushed him off of me and returned to the window, but the girl had already disappeared into the building. Without another thought, I grabbed my rifle off of the panel and rummaged through my backpack for the extra clip. I started for the door, but when there was no footsteps behind me, I turned back. Come on, I motioned for Chuck to follow. Chivalry wasn't that far gone, was it? I'm too old for this. He shook his head vigorously. She's probably already dead. If you go down there, you're dead too. Let me borrow your gun then, I said, moving forward to grab his revolver, which was still on the floor near my backpack. From my hampered view, it didn't look like the girl had a weapon on her. Hell no, Chuck stepped in front of me, putting his hands against my shoulders to stop me from advancing. I'll bring it back, I told him impatiently, but I stopped trying to sidestep him. The last thing I needed was for him to try and shoot me. He scowled at me. Not if you're dead. I sighed, trying to think of a solution. It would be a lot easier to help the girl if she wasn't completely defenseless when I got in there. I pointed into my backpack. There are ten cans of food in there. If I don't make it out, they're all yours. Deal? He considered my offer for a minute, and I tried not to fidget impatiently. The more time I wasted, the more danger that girl would be in. Then he reached down for my backpack and opened it to count the cans inside. Fine, he grumbled as he set it down and picked up the revolver to hand it to me. The second I had his gun in my hands, I sprinted out the door. I took the stairs practically a flight at a time and had to stop myself from bursting out the double doors at the outside. Instead, I pushed one open just enough to peek through and when there was nothing immediately visible, I poked my head out. I snuck out and crept to the edge, where there was a gap between the tower and the office building. To make sure there were no ferals around the corner, I peered down it, then shuffled across the building. The door to the building was ajar when I reached it, so I pressed my ear to the opening and listened intently. It was eerily quiet inside. My hunting rifle gripped in both hands, I pushed the door all the way open with the barrel, leading the way in with my weapon. There was a split second of panic when the door behind me closed. The inside of the building was dark, hardly any light coming through the tinted windows, and I was nearly blind for a minute it took my eyes to adjust. After the panic subsided, I waited patiently, crouched near the entrance, until I could see again. The small reception area had chairs lining the walls to my right, with a large counter and a desk directly ahead of me. There was a stairwell to the far right wall, an open door on my left, and another to the right of the counter. I decided to check the bottom floor first, and if the girl weren't down here, then I'd check the upper floors. Lucky for me, the building wasn't excessively large, so I wouldn't have too many places to search through. I glided silently toward the door on my left, 
which led to the medium-sized room with a tall, long counter that blocked off a good portion of the opposite side. It was suctioned off into different stations, with rope creating places for lines in front of each station, like something I used to see at the DMV. I listened carefully for the sound of any ferals in the room. Hello? I called softly, just loud enough that if the girl were here, she'd be able to hear me. There was no answer, so I continued forward, checking behind the counter just in case. I moved to the right side of the room, where there was another entryway to another portion of the building. It appeared from the way the building of these two rooms were set up that I was already wrapping around to the other entrance I'd seen from the lobby. The next closed door on the far side of the second room was probably the last on this floor. The second area was about the same size as the first, with ten office desks in it, lined in two columns of five. I itched forward, careful not to make any loud noises, as I checked under every desk in the first column. Hello? I called again, simply peering down the second column and making my way slowly toward the door. As I neared it, there was a slap of bare feet against the tile surface, coming from the next room and getting closer. The handle of the door jiggled, and right as it opened, I dove under one of the desks and out of sight. The patter continued lazily past me, and I risked peeking out to see if I could continue with the direction I'd been heading. Just before I closed the door, I caught sight of the ferals, at least three, in what looked like a lunchroom or break room. Shit. I couldn't go forward, but now there was a feral in the room with me, potentially blocking my only other way out. I took a deep breath, mustering the courage to stick my head out just enough to see the feral's position. It was walking slowly toward the exit. Back turned to me, and I took advantage of it and darted silently across the desk further from the lunchroom. The feral was nearing the exit, but there wouldn't be anywhere to hide from it in the DMV area. I lifted my hand above my head, feeling blindly around on the desk for something to use. I grabbed the first thing I touched, a thick, fancy pen, and I chucked it toward the lunchroom. It clattered against the wall, and at the sound the feral turned, letting out a crude, wild growl. Then the human creature sprinted past me and toward the source of the noise, and I shot toward the door without making a sound. I didn't stop at the DMV area, but came to an abrupt halt when I got to the entrance of the lobby. There was a feral in the lobby, too, and before it could see me, I ducked back behind the wall of the DMV room. This was a bad idea. Chuck might have been right, and now I could hear the footsteps from the first feral, the one I'd distracted, picking back up and heading in my direction. I had to act fast, and I had to take a risk. A gunshot would let every other feral in the building know I was here, but I didn't have any other choice. I left my hiding spot and lifted my rifle toward the feral in the lobby. It caught sight of my movement, head whipping in my direction. When it saw me, its face twisted with rage, and it exposed every one of its rotten, jagged teeth to let out a furious and blood-curdling scream. I got my shot off right as it started to charge me and as the body collapsed to the floor with a thud, I took off toward the stairwell at full speed before the others could make it to the lobby. I'd meant to exit the building, and I mentally yelled profanity after profanity the whole way up the stairs. But I couldn't leave without either helping the girl or knowing she was dead. My first thought was to hide and wait to see if any of the ferals would come up the stairs so I rushed through the first small door at the top of the stairs, with the sign on it reading janitorial. I was moving so fast I hardly had the door closed behind me when I caught a glimpse of the face in the dark. Her face, and having expected the closet to be empty, I raised my rifle in panic. She ducked, cowering under the corner of the closet and covering her head defensively. Jesus, I breathed, willing myself to calm down when I realized it was only her peering at her hands to see if she had any of her own that I needed to worry about. When no shots rang out, she glanced up to look at me. I had to squint to see in the black space, but I could tell that her face was completely lacking in color. Her light skin drained to a pale white with fear. 
Then a flashlight clicked on, and I was blinded by the beam she shone in my direction. Turn it off, I whispered in the lowest voice I could. They'll see the light. She did as I said, but didn't say anything once everything went dark. I began to wonder if she was terrified of me, or if she was plotting some way to kill me and escape. Then she spoke. Was that you, that gunshot? I saw you come into the building. I answered, doing everything I could to make my voice as friendly as possible. I thought you might need help. She exhaled, almost optimistically, still crouched on the ground, and, I assumed, looking up at me. One of them followed me up here, but I don't know where it went. That was probably the one I'd shot in the lobby. She sounded young, younger than my first guess when I'd seen her from up in the tower. How old are you? Fifteen, she answered softly. So young. She was just a kid. The same age my daughter would be. Are you by yourself? She was quiet for a few moments, and then there was a soft sniffle. My group got attacked a few days ago. I'm the only one left. It pained me to hear she was in such bad shape, but I was glad I hadn't fled the building before finding her. I'm Dugan. Kara. Do you want my help getting out of here, Kara? I asked, and I heard her murmur, yes, through another reserved whimper. Do you know how to use a gun? In the dark, I could see her stand, and her silhouette wiped the tears from her eyes. Sort of. Give me her hand, I instructed gently, and when she held out her hand, I put the grip of the revolver in it. Just aim and pull the trigger. You've only got six bullets in there. Use them sparingly. Okay. You saw the control tower right next to this building? Again, she answered the affirmative. When we get out of here, run to that tower, with or without me. There's another guy waiting at the top. I barely saw her nod, and then I pushed open the closet door. I couldn't see any ferals roaming the upstairs halls. Luckily, none of them followed me up here. Once out of the janitorial closet, I led the way silently down the stairs step by cautious step. When we reached a low enough point that I could see into the lobby, it was about as bad as I could have expected. There was about five ferals in the area, feeding voraciously on the one I'd shot on my way up the stairs. I felt around my pockets, but all my supplies were in my backpack in the tower. Can I have your flashlight? I whispered to Kara, so quietly it was barely audible even to me. She understood, though, and unclipped it from the pocket of her jeans. I took another step forward with the flashlight in hand, taking a deep breath to steady my aim. Then I swung it. Once. Twice. On three, I tossed the flashlight across the lobby and through the open door of the DMV room. It rattled loudly when it hit the floor, and every feral shot up, tearing through the open door before the tool even stopped rolling. Go! I pushed Kara ahead of me rushing her down the final stairs and toward the exit of the building. Three of the ferals had launched themselves at the flashlight and were now clawing and biting at each other for it. The other two had stopped in the doorway, and when I reached the bottom of the stairs, the butt of my gun clipped the metal railing, causing it to make a loud ding. The two ferals turned at the sight of us, and then roared savagely. Run! I shouted at Kara, who immediately started sprinting for the door. I took off after her getting off my first shot before the ferals took a step. The one I hit collapsed to the floor, and the other had thrown itself into the air with such speed that it was going to intercept me at the door. I turned on my heels as I reached the exit, and at the same time I threw my back against the closing door, and I brought the butt of my gun back, sending it hard as I could at the ferals' head. I managed to catch it in the chin, but it still hit me at full force, sending us both tumbling to the ground outside of the building. The loathsome creature landed on top of me, and in its blind rage, I'm not even sure it felt the pain of my blow. It let out another roar, pressing down on me and snapping its jaws, trying to catch any part of me it could with its teeth. I had the length of my gun against its neck, using every bit of strength to keep my body away from him. Then a gunshot sounded, and the creature stopped struggling against me, 
collapsing his dead weight against my chest. I was tired from fighting it and eternally grateful when Kara rushed back, helping to push the lifeless feral off of me. I scrambled up just as another feral came crashing through the glass of the front door, and Kara got off another shot before I even raised my rifle. I didn't wait to see when the remaining two would burst through, and Kara and I both took off toward the tower in a flash. As we reached the entrance of the tower, I heard one of them coming up the building, and knowing it would follow us up, I turned, getting off the final deadly shot before we both disappeared into the tower stairwell. My adrenaline was pumping wildly, and I couldn't help but laugh, even if it was mildly inappropriate. You sort of know how to use a gun, I teased as we sprinted up the stairs. She grinned at me proudly, gripping the railing in both hands and using it to propel herself forward. It was your lucky day, I guess. When we burst through the door at the top of the tower, Chuck turned from the window, a terrified look in his eyes. I heard the shots. Did they follow you up here? I stood near the entrance, hands on my knees and panting for air, now that I finally could take the time for a breath. No, I wheezed. They didn't follow us. He sighed with relief, glancing between Kara and I. My gun? I motioned for the revolver in Kara's hands. That's his. She handed it over without protest, and then leaned back against the panel tiredly, still regaining her own breath. I don't know how to thank you. Don't mention it, I told her, playing it off with a wave of my hand. I still couldn't breathe. Maybe I was getting too old for this, too. What were you doing in there? Chuck asked her, opening the cylinder to count his bullets. I was looking for supplies, Kara said, glancing down sadly. I lost everything when my group got attacked. I strode over to where I'd left my backpack and gulped down some of the water from Chuck's gallon. Where were you headed now? Kara shrugged. A few months ago, we met a traveler. He said he'd heard rumors of a camp full of people, somewhere in New York, in the woods. I was going to see if I could find it, but I can't even protect myself. Camp full of people, in New York. New York was east, the direction I was planning on heading anyway. It sounded like the kind of place I might like to be, if it was real. A place relatively safe and possibly with better tasting food than canned green beans. So what if it was just a rumor? It would give me something to hope for, and I definitely couldn't let Kara, a 15-year-old girl without a single weapon, try and get there on her own. I'll take you there, I said without hesitation. Then worried I might sound a little too eager, I added. I was headed east anyway. When Kara nodded, I couldn't keep from letting on the first real grin I'd had in a long time. For now, she was giving me something to live for. Chapter 4. Can't Go Home Again. Genevieve. The sounds of a waking camp filtered through the canvas walls of my tent, and I stayed under the warm blankets on the cot to enjoy the soothing buzz. The distant pop of a blazing fire and echoing shout or laugh carried easily through the crisp and open air. The sturdy thwack of an axe against the tree trunk as men collected wood for the fires. Eventually, the lure of the tiny civilization pulled me out of bed, and after tugging on my boots, I made my way through the cloth door, stopping for a moment to take a deep breath of the forest morning. I happily went on Cap's assigned missions, because it's what we needed to do to keep this oasis going. But there was nothing I loved more than being back at camp. Back at home. The chill of daybreak caused a slight shiver to go up my spine, but I cherished the feeling rather than going back in the tent for my sweater. It reminded me I was alive, something I was pleased to be constantly aware of. I stood outside the entrance of my tent for another few moments, debating what my first course of action for the morning would be. Breakfast instantly came to mind, and with my stomach not letting me focus on much else at the thought of it, I went back inside to grab my eating utensils. With those in hand, I walked a few paces towards McMahon's tent to see if he was up yet or not. Knock, knock, I said, pushing aside the flapped opening and chuckling at the sight. 
He was sprawled out on his cot, nearly too big for the thing, with three of his four limbs hanging out over the edges. He had his mouth open, too, snoring softly with each inhaled breath. Blake, rise and shine. He brought one hand to his face and rubbed his eyes with his fingers, and then he ran it through his hair as he sat up. He stayed with his elbows on his knees, head down tiredly for a few seconds before looking up at me through half-closed eyes. Why? he whined, falling back onto his blankets. I'll eat without you, I threatened through a laugh, knowing if he didn't get up to go eat with me, he'd complain about it later. Still, he just laid there, unwilling to wake. Get your ass up, I teased, pulling back the flap to let the flow of sunlight in. That's an order. A smile cracked his haggard face, and he sat up once more. Pulling rank on me? Yeah, I said, dropping the door fold. Put on some clothes, I'm starving. He looked over at me and gave a jaunty glare, so I added with a toothy grin, Please? After he made sure I could see him roll his eyes, he got off his cot and pulled his camouflage military pants on over his boxers. Then he threw on his faded black t-shirt, grabbed his dishes, and followed me out. We strode through the camp, smiling and waving at the people as we passed along the way. I knew Blake well enough to let him get some coffee before having too much conversation with him. Genevieve, a little voice sounded behind us, and I turned just in time to catch the seven-year-old girl who jumped into my arms. I picked her up, and after waving to her attentive mother to signal that I'd watch her, we continued toward the food. Good morning, Shirley, I greeted the child, chuckling at her enthusiasm. When I called her Shirley... She tilted her head down to give me a scolding glare. Her name was Madison, but with her big blue eyes and curly blonde hair, I couldn't resist teasing her. Oh, are you Madison? I asked playfully. Yes, she answered, purposely sounding exasperated. Then her eyes lit up, and she pointed to her leg. Look what I got! I leaned over to glance down at her knee and spotted one of the Mickey Mouse bandages I'd brought back from our last run. Very cool, I said happily. What happened? We reached the serving area for breakfast. So while she answered, I set her down and handed my bowl to Amina, the woman who was dishing out the meal. I fell because Tyler was chasing me again, she said, taking my hand and swinging it back and forth. I took my full bow back and moved down the line. Tyler was chasing you? I asked, pretending to be shocked. Then, because she still had my hand, I gave her my cup of coffee to carry for me. I think he likes you. Ew! Boys have cooties! Madison shrieked, causing both Blake and I to snort with laughter. I patted her on the head while we sat at one of the tables around the eating area. Good girl. I watched Blake for a few moments, and the second he took his first sip of coffee, I asked, What are you doing today? He shrugged taking a bite of the flat biscuits that we were served this morning. But before he could answer, two other men sat down beside us. Morning, ma'am, said Garcia, giving a casual salute. Genevieve. Kellen's lips turned up in his usual coy smile as he greeted me, and I tried not to roll my eyes. I gave them both a friendly nod, hello, and then looked back at Blake so that he could answer my question. I was thinking of helping some of the guys do maintenance on one of the vehicles, he informed me. What about you? I don't know, I told him honestly. Tasks weren't necessarily assigned around camp, but it was generally accepted that everyone did some form of work most days. Being accustomed to adrenaline-filled missions, it was tough for me to settle into a comparatively idle task during the day. I got too restless working in the garden. I called it that because it was way too small to be considered a farm. And nobody would catch me dead doing some other house chore like preparing the meals. I'm going on an herb run later, Kellen cut in. I set up some traps yesterday, too, if you'd like to join me. I glanced over at him, knowing the motive behind his invitation, and then I looked at the seven-year-old beside me. What do boys have, Madison? 
Cooties, she answered enthusiastically. I gave Kellen a smug smile. And even though Madison's answer had been enough of a response for me, I added, Have fun picking daisies, though. Blake snorted amusedly, and then nudged Kellen with his elbow as he said mockingly, Make sure you bring me one of those little flowered bracelets. Oh, I want a necklace, Madison exclaimed, propping her head up in her hands and blinking innocently at Kellen, and causing all of us to burst into laughter. After we finished eating, I returned Madison to her mother, and Blake and I parted ways to get things done. Determined to take a bath, I grabbed some things from my tent and hurried to the river at the edge of camp. Bathing was definitely my favorite thing about getting back from a mission, and it wasn't just the prospect of being clean that was attractive to me. A lot of the people around camp carried buckets of water back to their sites so that they could heat up the water before washing themselves. But there was something soothing and therapeutic about floating in the cold water of the river, about the sound of it lapping at the muddy banks, about the way the canopy of trees overhead let it scatter the rays of light. Before the outbreak, I'd never been much of an outdoorsy girl, but this stronghold of a forest had grown on me. At the shore of the creek, I unlaced my boots, then proceeded to carefully set my jeans, sweater, and towel on top of them so that they wouldn't get dirty. Before going in, I rebelted my hunting knife to my bare thigh, because even though the area was pretty safe, I'd seen the occasional bear wander by, and I felt more secure with it readily available. With my soap, washcloth, and toothbrush in hand, I ran full speed into the soft current so the chill fluid wouldn't leave me time for changing my mind, and I dove under when it was deep enough. Once under the cover of the water, I removed my shirt and undergarments, rubbing my bar of soap into each of them to get them fresh. When those were done, I wrung them out and hung them over the low-hanging branch to dry. It was nice being able to wash up, and I scrubbed my body, hair, and teeth until I felt like the filth of being in a feral-infested city was gone downstream. After I was done bathing, I set my stuff on the shore and went back in to float on the surface of the water, watching the dancing leaves and pine needles overhead. I was able to enjoy the tranquility for nearly half an hour before a voice carried to me from the bank. Well, look who it is, Kellen called. I sunk back into the river, and by the time I looked over at him, he was halfway undressed. Well, well, I said apathetically dunking my head under the water to let it run over my face. When I came back up, he was on his way in, carrying his small netted bag of toiletries with him. Are you following me? I asked, passing him a suspicious glare. He chuckled, stopping when he got to his waist and shivering. I didn't know you were here, he told me, his tone sincere. I figured you'd come the second we got back from Boston. I did. I confirmed, making my way to my clothes to see if they had dried yet. Now that Kellen was here, my sense of peace was gone. It was nothing entirely against him, seeing as I was in a communal bathing spot, but I didn't want him getting any ideas. He jumped under the water, breaking the surface again, and arms length away. Then there you have it, he said. It's fate. Right, I said sarcastically and I couldn't help but chuckle. At my amusement, that flirty smile creased his lips, and he moved closer, like the proximity would be too tempting for me, and I'd finally give in to him. Instead, I pulled my knife out of its sheath, and I set the tip flat against his chest, because no matter how good-looking he was, it wasn't enough. Is that a knife in your hand? He started, an entertained grin on his face, even though he took the hint and backed up couple of steps. Are you just happy to see me? It's a knife, I said indifferently, despite the fact that I wanted to laugh at his sheepish expression. Then I grabbed my clothes off of the branch, and when I started toward the riverbank, I put the knife back. I knew Kellen was staring after me as I reached my stuff, so before turning around and allowing him to see my front, I glanced over my shoulder. Do you mind? He turned his back to me without protest, 
and I hurriedly dried myself and put my clothes back on before he could swing around again. I was in the process of wringing out my hair when he did, and he made an exaggerated, pouting face at me, disappointed at my constant denial. I know you find me attractive, he sang teasingly, taking some water into his mouth and spitting it towards me playfully. I flipped my hair over and buffed at it with a towel, singing back, I know you're way overconfident. Hard to get, he said through a laugh. I've played this game before. I rolled my eyes and picked up my belongings and started back toward the camp. It's not going to happen, Kellen, I called, without looking back at him. Oh, hey, Cap was looking for you, he yelled after me, and I waved a hand to let him know I'd heard. After I dropped my stuff off, I strolled through the camp toward the large hoop tent that was designated for meetings. Cap was in there with Dr. April, and I stood at the entrance, waiting patiently for them to spot me. Yes, but I'm a physician, Ben, not a neurophysiologist, April was saying, and she adjusted her glasses in front of her dark blue eyes. I don't know what I'm doing, and I can't find a cure if I don't learn. She was holding one of the books we'd brought back from our last mission, and she dropped it on the table in front of Cap, as if to emphasize her point. I can't let you go with the soldiers, Captain Greeley said, scratching his rugged gray beard and nonchalantly looking up at her from his seat. I think you can, April countered, and crossed her arms over her chest defiantly. You're fifty-eight years old, Cap told her in exasperation. Could you keep up with them? if you were being chased. April let out a whiny breath to let him know that she found that offensive. I survived just fine before coming here. I was holding back laughter at this point. Cap and April were always arguing like an old married couple, even though they both insisted there was no romantic interest between them. Just so I wouldn't feel like I was eavesdropping, I cleared my throat at them. Cap waved me in, and after giving me a greeting smile, April continued the argument as though I weren't even there. You were so set on finding this cure, but I don't possess the skills or the knowledge to do it. If you won't let me go with them, then you need to send out more troops to find someone who does. April fell into the chair behind her, running her hands stressfully through her shoulder-length graying brown hair. Cap took off his dark green baseball cap and threw it onto the table, his brown eyes narrowing in annoyance. Protecting this camp is priority. You know that. And I can't force my men to go on solitary searches for another doctor who may not even be out there. Genevieve, April started, turning toward me as if I could help her. What do you think? I took in a thoughtful breath, pretending for her sake, like I was considering it, even though I already knew where I stood. Captain Greeley wasn't the only one who wanted to find a cure for the infection but our main concern was making sure that we had the supplies and the manpower to keep everyone at this camp safe. There was one soldier who'd volunteered to scour the country for someone who might be able to develop a cure. He'd been gone for over a year and checked in every day at noon via the ham radio he'd been sent with, but so far, he hadn't had luck. I agree with Cap, I told her eventually. During missions, I complained about him not letting us take April along, but that was always just my frustration talking. Deep down, I knew it wasn't the best decision. You're too vulnerable. We need you here. She gave a dejected sigh, stood, and with shoulders slumped started toward the door. I'll try to think of another solution. Women, Cap complained when she was out of earshot. He knew me so well that he could tell by the look on my face I was going to make a comment about them being in love, so he scowled at me before I could. Don't. I chuckled and threw my hands up in defense. I heard you needed me. Yeah, he started, leaning forward in his seat interestedly. Finding any gasoline that isn't rotten is getting damn near impossible. You guys are having to go further and further to just maybe get some. I nodded knowingly. I hated gas errands. Those vehicles were run on pretty much anything. 
but we need something better if we're going to keep using generators. A new power source? I asked, taking a seat across from him and kicking my feet up on the table. Get your feet down, he said before answering, shooing my boots away. We've got a guy that used to be some kind of electrical engineer. Says if we can get him the right stuff, he can set up some workable solar panels that cover power for the generators. You want first platoon to go? I predicted. We'd only been in this forest camp for almost a year and a half. And before, the only thing that we used gasoline for were the trucks. Since we'd found somewhere permanent, we'd set up areas that relied on power, like the medical cabin. He nodded and put his hat back on. I know you guys just got back, but it should be an easy run. It's fine, I told him. We'll leave first thing tomorrow. Where are we going? He looked somewhat hesitant as he pulled out the map and unfolded it across the table. Rochester. I just stared at him, trying to compose the flood of emotion before speaking again. Rochester, New York. The city I was born and raised in. The city I'd met Cap in. And the city I'd lost my family in. That's why he was hesitant because he knew I wouldn't be fond of going back there. I was sure Rochester wasn't the only place that was a decent drive from our camp in the cat skills, and that would have solar panels. But I was also sure that Cap sent a squad back there every six months, and the only reason he'd refrained from sending us until now was because of me. Rochester, I repeated, trying not to let my voice betray my feelings. What's there aside from so panels? I already knew the answer. But if he said it like he was asking me a favor, then I'd be less reluctant to go. For him, I'd do anything. Hopefully my wife. He admitted sadly, and glanced down as though he knew it was foolish to keep hoping after all these years. I thought you could stop by our old house, see if she showed up at all. Maybe left a note or something. I nodded and glanced toward the map, noticing that the spot had already been boxed in blue ink, the house number written off to the side. I wouldn't need the map to find it, though. I'd lived right next door. And where can we get the solar panels from? There used to be a company on the other side of the river. He pointed to the spot on the map, and then circled the location of the building. Soul Corp. A shiny place with all the solar panels leaned up on the roof. Oh yeah, you could spot that thing from clear across town on our side of the river. I chuckled in remembrance. He nodded. Getting the panels back to the vehicles will probably be the biggest challenge. We'll manage, I said coolly, waving it off. I'll strap them on a Blake's back. That goon could probably carry a couple. Cap laughed in amusement falling silent shortly after watching me thoughtfully. Are you sure you're okay with going? He asked when I folded up the map to take it with me. I can send second, or even home squad. When my platoon was back at camp, second usually went on easy supply or recovery runs nearby, but they weren't as accustomed to big city missions as we were, and the solar panels seemed delicate. Home squad... The captain's personal group acted as a sort of police for a little settlement, and even though everyone here was pretty peaceful, their duties were too important to send them away. I'll go, I assured him decidedly. I hadn't been back to Rochester since we left a year after the outbreak. Surely it had been long enough now that I could handle it. Anything else you need? As he answered, he pulled a few pieces of paper out of his pocket and handed them to me. It was a list of the things we needed, along with descriptions and a couple handwritten pictures. There's a cabin detail today. You were probably looking for something to do. He said studiously, knowing how I was about finding work. When we first set up our camp, we'd been so preoccupied with finding sustainable food sources that we were wildly unprepared for winter. Lean-to shelters just didn't cut it for those who didn't have tents. 
We'd only lost three people to the cold, but that was three people too many. And so ever since, we'd been stocking up on wood and building cabins, first for the families with children and the elderly, and then for everyone else. Even with practically 300 inhabitants at the settlement, it was slow going. Most of them were already set in their daily routines and tasks, and pulling too many from those tasks would put us behind in some other important operation like food. Perfect, I smiled grateful at Cap's suggestion. Thanks. My first stop after leaving Cap was the motor pool, a nearby field where we parked all the vehicles to find McMahon. After informing him that we'd be leaving the next day, I sent him to tell Powers so that they could pass the word down to the rest of my soldiers. Then I went to find the cabin detail. I was sitting in the command seat of our striker, carefully watching the screen in front of me. We were rolling down the shoulder of a freeway in a vehicle, on our way to Rochester, and with the next sign we passed, I checked the map. Then I used the striker's computer to adjust the machine gun and camera mounted on the outside, checking to make sure that the three other vehicles were still behind us. We always took three strikers, that way we could sit comfortably and still be able to bring extra fuel. And this time we'd brought one of the Humvees to load the solar panels in. Even though these military vehicles didn't get the best miles per gallon, we dealt with it because there was no way ferals could get inside if we fell under attack. We were sitting in the safety of a heavily armored cabin with a computer-controlled machine gun at our disposal. Once I'd checked our location on the map, I clicked on the microphone to the headset I was wearing so that I could talk to the drivers of the three other vehicles. All units, I said into the headset. Estimated 15 minutes until arrival. Over. Roger. I heard repeated four times. Before this, I'd been engaged in conversation with the rest of the guys in the cabin. But now that we were nearing our destination and the sun had gone down, I switched the camera to thermal imaging, scanning our surroundings for ferals. We always parked on the outskirts of the cities and walked in. While the vehicles could handle an attack with ease, their diesel engines were loud and we couldn't exit the cabin to get our missions done if we got swarmed. Eventually, we reached the edge of the city. All units, I spoke again. Cease travel and hold for instruction. I felt the striker come to a stop, and after making sure that all the others had as well, I did a complete search of the area for heat signatures. I'd only swivel the camera to straight ahead when I caught some red and there were four different bodies, moving around in that barrel specific way, and far enough away that they hadn't heard us pull up. It was for times like these that the second vehicle didn't have an automated machine gun. Bravo Squad's leader was posted up in the gunner's seat, silent sniper rifle complete with a thermal scope at the ready. Alpha to Bravo Command, I said, keeping an eye on the ferals. Powers, come in. Over. Awaiting orders, ma'am. His voice came back through the speaker. Over. I got four ferals at one o'clock, approximately 500 meters. There's four targets at one o'clock, 500 meters. Relay when you have visual. Over. Roger that, Powers responded, and I waited patiently until I heard his voice again. Alpha Command, I have visual, requesting permission to engage. Over. Affirmative. I confirmed, still watching the screen intently. I could even feel a couple of my soldiers looking over my shoulder at it. Commence fire. Commencing fire, he said, and everything went silent for a minute. I could tell even before I heard his voice again that he'd killed the first barrel. Because one of the red figures dropped, and I heard the sound of the gun in my headset. Tango one eliminated. One of the first things I'd learned when I started doing all of the soldier stuff, was that silenced weapons were still pretty loud. And I have to admit, I was a little shocked by it. The only reason we even used them at all was because in the quiet world we lived in, they worked enough that the sound didn't carry to every feral in the city. And it made the location of the sound harder to pinpoint. 
that's Tango too, Power said, as another figure on the screen collapsed. One of the two remaining ferals bent to investigate the lifeless figures. The other jumped onto the top of a car, and even though I couldn't hear it, it reared up like it was letting out a roar, and then slammed its fist onto the roof. Powers didn't tell me when he fired at the next feral, because it wasn't necessary, and he probably knew I was watching, but moments later the one on the ground dropped dead. With the next shot, the creature on top of the car fell off and scrambled up, and I heard Powers mumble shit. The feral knew the general direction of where the gunshots were coming from, because it started sprinting toward the vehicles with such a ferocious howl, I could hear it echoing in Powers' mic. He fired again and must have missed the kill, as I could see the feral stumble, continuing toward us. When it picked itself back up, I was starting to grow nervous that the humanly beast might live long enough, and in such volume that it would attract others. Fortunately, Power's next shot accomplished its goal. All targets annihilated. His voice rang through my headset. Over. Roger that. All units, stand by. I swiveled my camera around for a good five minutes, just to make sure that no other frails had heard the commotion and were coming our way. When I was satisfied, I gave the okay. Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta cleared for exit. I got out of the vehicle with the rest of my guys, and we started our usual silent and cautious walk into the city. It was slow going for a bit, since the sun hadn't gone down long ago. While most of the ferals had already turned in, there was the occasional one that hadn't settled yet, still staggering around. We ducked around vehicles and building corners every time there was a slight noise, avoiding being seen so this mission would be easy as possible. The captain's house was going to be the first stop. Unfortunately, it was on our way to the Soul Court building, on the opposite side of the river, so we didn't have to double back. Our destination was toward the center of the city, but after traveling for a while, it got easier to pick up our pace, and we were entering my old neighborhood before I knew it. Even in the dark, under the pale glow of the moon and the blue tint of our flashlights, and even after so many years, everything about this place was familiar. The old bus stop I used to meet my friends at so that we could ride together to school. The little park at the corner of our street where I played as a kid. And then the houses themselves. Caps was right next door to mine, and I led my soldiers up the walkway and to the front door. Cap had told me where to find a spare key and I lifted the small flower pot just outside of the door, underneath which was the shiny piece of metal. Once I had the key in my hand, I clicked my flashlight off and on three times in a row, signaling to my soldiers to get into formation. They'd go inside in groups of four, each group clearing a room of the house, as quickly and quietly as possible. It was always best when we never found ferals in a home but it was better to form up every time so that we were ready when we went into a place that did. There were only a few soldiers with silent weapons, and they were the ones responsible for firing if we found any inside. I'd go in last. That way I could secure the door behind us. When my soldiers were all ready, I waved the first group up to the door. The one in front raised his pistol, preparing to shoot if any ferals came running at us and I took it as my cue to stick the key into the lock. I turned it, and when the door was freed, I pushed it slowly open. Each and every one of us was holding our breath, waiting for some deafening scream or snarl. When the door swung completely open and none came, I waved the first group through, then the second, and so on, until all my soldiers were in Cap's house. My job was to go inside and close the door behind us so that nobody ferals or otherwise, could surprise us from behind. But just as I was about to follow them in, I glanced sideways at my own house. My soldiers had already been briefed on what they were looking for at Caps, and so far I hadn't heard any gunshots from inside. For some reason, I had the sudden and irresistible desire to go home, 
to see what it was like after all these years, before I could convince myself that it was entirely irrational. I'd closed the door on my soldiers and started across Cap's lawn. I stood at the front steps of my own old home, staring at the wooden porch rails and the red window trim. The front door was hanging half open, seemingly broken from its frame by force, probably raided by scavengers. I knew going in there was one of the worst ideas I'd ever had, but something about it had put me in a trance. The house had a ghostly hold over me, and I was going in there whether I wanted to or not. I was so hypnotized by the familiarity of the place that I hardly had the mind to pull my knife out of its sheath. Gripping it in my hand, I crept up the steps, using my hand with the flashlight in it to push the door all the way open. The blue tint of my light cast an eerie glow onto the hardwood floor and my boots crunched over shattered glass as I made my way in. There was always a large vase inside the door, which had been broken into a million pieces and scattered all along the entranceway. With my eyes, I followed the stairs on my immediate left, up to the second floor, where the balcony overlooked the living room in front of me. That was where the allure was coming from, my old bedroom the place I'd always felt the most comfortable. But I was going to save that for last. I continued forward, turning right when I reached the living room to head into the connected kitchen. Still holding the knife in my hand, I delicately dragged my fingertips along the granite countertop. Traced the outline of the toaster I used to make waffles with every morning. Ran them over the dusty cookbook under the kitchen window, the one my dad never touched because he couldn't cook, but kept it because it used to be my mother's. Pressed my forehead against the giant's flag pinned to the wall for good luck, even though there hadn't been a football game in years. The refrigerator door was wide open, as were a few of the cupboards, and there were a couple empty food boxes and containers tossed onto the floor. The living room was as equally torn apart, the television had been knocked off of the stand and lay broken on the floor. The couch was bumped around and crooked compared to how it had always been. Even the small bookshelf had fallen. The books littered the space in front of the couch. It was obvious that someone had been here, had maybe searched the place for supplies, and I didn't like it. Didn't like that someone had been in my house and left it in such a mess. I knew I didn't have time to clean the place up, and it wouldn't have mattered anyway. But I righted the bookshelf and pushed the couch back to where it should be. Then I started for the stairs. The second room at the top was mine, and after giving a stealthy peek inside to make sure it was clear, I stepped in. My bed was still made, laundry basket in the corner half empty, while the other dirty clothes were strewn about the floor. Above the desk in my room hung a corkboard, where I pinned photographs and other paper keepsakes, like the tickets to a concert I'd gone to with a friend in high school. As I looked over the old pictures, my eyes fell on the one of my family. It had always been my favorite, because it was from before my mother died, so she was in it. I was just a little kid back then. Right next to the photo, I tucked an old note from her. It was short. You are smart and beautiful. Love you, Mom. Slipped into my lunch bag so that I'd see it during the day at elementary school. She was always doing nice things like that for my little brother and I. Pulling the picture and the note off of the corkboard, I put them into my pocket while I walked backwards toward the bed. Sitting down didn't have the effect I thought it would. I thought it would be comforting. Thought maybe I'd get flashbacks from the old days, lying around and giggling with friends or sneaking a boyfriend out of the window. But it seemed that once I sat, glancing around the empty room, at all the things that were part of someone I used to be, the allure started to fade. 
The room grew stifling. I didn't belong here anymore. It were as though I was the intruder. I pushed off of the bed and went back out into the hallway. Before going downstairs, I took a few steps further down to a waist-high ledge above the towel cabinets, where there were more picture frames set on top of it. I gripped my flashlight between my teeth and set my knife down on a small counter so that I could pick up a frame and look at it more closely. There was a layer of dust on the glass, which I wiped off on my hip. I couldn't help but smile at the photo of my dad and brother messing around in the public pool down the road. I'd lost them both to ferals. I put my fingertips to my lips and I pressed them against the picture, and then I set the frame back down. That's when I saw it. Out of the corner of my eye, a silhouette standing in the doorway on my right. I almost thought it was an unaffected, the way it was just poised there, staring at me. But it had that disease-ridden, raspy breathing, and now that I noticed the thing, I could smell it. This whole place reeked of ferals. I'd just been too preoccupied and in too much of an emotional daze to notice it. Every muscle in my body froze. I couldn't even breathe. The only reason I could see that the thing hadn't lunged at me yet was because I was so still. But I knew that it wouldn't wait forever. I started reaching forward for the knife I'd set down, so slowly and subtly that I couldn't even be sure I was moving. My heart was pounding wildly now, and I wouldn't doubt that the pharaoh could hear it. It wasn't until I got so terrified that my hands started shaking that the fiend seemed to really notice me. Then it let out a deafening scream and rushed toward me with its arms extended, ready to grab me so swift it covered the distance between us in two bloodthirsty strides. I grabbed my knife the second it howled, and as it reached me I thrust my hand out, skillfully stabbing it in the chest. It let out a yelp of pain, snapping its jaws at me while it continued forward, so hungry it didn't seem to care that it was further impelling itself on my weapon. I risked setting a hand on its shoulder so that I could pull my knife out and stab at it again, and this time it dropped. I used my boot to kick the creature off of the blade, and as I did, two more figures appeared in the doorway. I didn't have time to think, only to react, and when the first one lunged at me, I threw myself over the balcony, knowing that the couch was just below to break my fall. My back barely landed on the cushions with the edges of my rifle digging into me but I let out a pain cry as my left calf bruised against the hard back of the couch. Before I could even recover, a feral came crashing down, missing the couch and landing with a hard thud on the floor behind it. I didn't wait for it to get up. I ignored the pain and propelled myself over to the back of the couch, leading with my knife and plunging it into the first bit of feral I could. I got it in the ribs, and it reacted with such strength it threw me backwards. It rolled in agony, clutching at the knife stuck in its midsection. And while it was distracted, I used the opportunity to pull my rifle around. I got the shot off, and the second I rolled onto my stomach to push myself up, the second feral from upstairs leapt down and landed on my back. I reared up before the thing had a chance to dig its teeth into me, and I turned onto my back as it scrambled to its feet. I stuck my boots in the air when it charged catching it in the stomach and using all my strength to catapult it away from me. I reached my arm up, keeping an eye on the ferrule, while I blindly felt around for my knife. I gripped the handle and pulled it out of the dead creature, just as the ferrule threw itself at me again. And in a bit of luck, it landed right at the tip of my blade. I grunted as I tried to push the dead weight off of me. But once it had been discarded beside me, I lay there for a moment, instinct telling me it wasn't yet safe to move. I'm glad I didn't, because a moment later I heard more wheezing, followed by the slapping of feet coming in from the backyard. I couldn't tell exactly how many there were, and I wasn't going to risk moving and being seen to look up and count. But it sounded like three different pairs of footsteps on the hardwood floor. Fuck! How could I have been so stupid? I went frigid, trying my best to control my panicked breathing so that the ferals wouldn't notice me, and I played dead. Then one of the creatures knelt down to investigate the bodies. 
Its croaky breaths were coming from above my head, and every couple of seconds I could hear it inhale sharply, sniffing for a more suitable meal than its dead and dirty companion. Through squinting eyes, I could see it crawl over to me, and when its face hovered directly above mine, I could feel its warm breath on my skin, and the rotten smell emanating from every inch of it was so horrid I wanted to gag. It lowered its head, sniffing me so thoroughly its nose brushed against my cheek. I was going to be this feral's meal. I just knew it. And as if to convince me I could no longer play dead, I swear I saw the thing lick its hungry lips as it widened its jaw, preparing to take a chunk out of my flesh. Without wasting another second, I pitched my arm up as hard as I could, driving my knife straight through the creature's skull. Before the beast even collapsed, the other two roared, coming at me with such fury, I knew I was finally finished. Then I heard two loud bangs, and thank God for Blake McMahon, because the ferals dropped onto the ground. Even though it was over, I stayed on the floor to recover from the frenzied adrenaline rush, finally breathing heavily to get the oxygen I so desperately needed. Are you hurt? Blake asked frantically, running toward me, still pointing his pistol around and searching for any more ferals. Genevieve, are you hurt? I shook my head, too terrifyingly weak to even speak just yet. Come on, we can't stay here, he said hurriedly, not waiting for me to get up as he lifted me off of the ground. Knowing he was right, and that if there were any other ferals in the area, they would have heard the gunshots and been on their way, I followed him out of the house. We sprinted across the lawn and back into Cap's home, where he flung the door closed behind us and flicked the deadbolt into place. I could see all of my soldiers looking at us, worried and curious, but Blake led me into the bathroom, where he shut us in. Are you crazy? He whispered, angry but quiet enough that my soldiers wouldn't hear his panicked barrage of remarks. You almost got yourself killed. What the hell were you doing over there? If I didn't go looking for you when I did, he huffed, practically stomping his feet like he was about to throw a tantrum, and taking deep breaths to calm himself. What were you thinking? I felt terrible for scaring him so badly. We'd all lost enough without me going and doing stupid shit like that, and I know he'd be devastated if something ever happened to me. Unable to answer feeling an overwhelming sense of shame and gratitude. I pulled the picture out of my pocket and handed it to him. He stared at it in confusion, and it took him a minute to recognize the young girl in the photo as me. Then he glanced up, all anger on his face melting away. Did you used to live there? He asked sympathetically. Since I was born, I told him and took the picture when he handed it back to me. I sighed, blinking away a few tears, trying to keep myself composed, even though I was massively embarrassed I'd been so moronic. I'm sorry. I didn't know what came over me. I mean, Jesus, Pipsqueak. You scared the shit out of me. Blake chuckled a little, and pulled me into a hug. When he released me a few seconds later, he slapped me roughly on the arm. You took out three on your own. I'm actually impressed. Four, I corrected with a laugh, glad he wasn't going to stay upset with me. There was one upstairs, too. You little badass, he grinned proudly, adding a glare. But seriously, next time you want to do some feral wrestling, don't go by yourself. I promise, I agreed. When I followed him out of the bathroom, I addressed my soldiers. Everyone keep your lights off. We need to sit tight for a while. We waited in Cap's old house for three hours, watching carefully out the windows for any ferals. Some wandered through the neighborhood, attracted by the noise. By the time we left, I was frustrated at myself for having caused such a commotion and wasted half of our night. Fortunately, my guys didn't seem to mind being able to relax and nap in the comfort of a house for a while. Eventually, when it had been almost 45 minutes since any feral strode by, we started for Salcorp. I'd had my fill of action for the night, 
and was thankful that the walk there was entirely feral-free, as was the trek up the building stairs and to the roof. The three hours we'd lost made it impossible to keep this a one-night trip, so once on the roof we camped out, preparing to take the solar panels down the next day. Chapter 5. Tiger, Tiger. Echo. Waking with a yawn, I stretched my arms and legs out of the ends of the unzipped sleeping bag, pulling them back in when the cold caused me to shiver. Usually I didn't wake up until afternoon, since we were all practically nocturnal now. But the horizon was so pale orange, and the crisp air still had the chill of dawn. Then I heard the crunch of gravel coming from somewhere outside of my tent, a soft footstep on my roof. Every once in a while, the group would get too hungry to wait for breakfast, and usually Halston came up to get me before someone else ate my portion. There was another quiet step. Sometimes he thought it was fun to scare me out of sleep. I pushed the covers off of me and stood, stumbling tiredly out of my tent, as I let Halston know I heard him. If you try to scare me again, I swear to God. I stopped in my tracks, and before I could get another syllable out or try to run, a biter lunged at me. It hit me so hard it knocked both of us down, and I skidded across the rocky surface a few feet away with the creature on top of me. I threw my hands against its shoulders, pushing it back while it struggled against me furiously, snapping its teeth, spittle dripping at the mouth-watering side of my flesh. It was so unexpected that in my waking state, I panicked, focusing only on trying to keep my skin away from its jaws. Now I was awake, my heart wildly pumping adrenaline through my veins. My knife and gun were still in the tent, and I didn't even have shoes on yet. All I had to defend myself were my fists. I was lucky this thing was only a female, and was small enough that I could keep it off of me. I took one hand from the biter's shoulder, just long enough to throw my fist into its ribs. I hit the thing as hard as I could, but other than letting out an angry snarl, it didn't seem to even notice, too intent on trying to eat me. I hit it again, but the more I pissed it off, the closer its face seemed to get to mine. It was clawing at me savagely, and with the next swipe of its hand, its nail made a gash against the upper part of my chest, exposed by the lower cut of my tank top. I let out a pained yelp, and this time grabbed the biter by the neck. At the same time, I used all the strength I could get out of one arm. I twisted my body, throwing the menacing thing off of me. I scrambled up, diving into my tent while the biter stood with an aggravated roar. I fumbled around for my gun, and when I grabbed it, I flopped onto my back, getting two shots off right as the biter lunged at me again. It dropped, sliding to a halt across the surface of the roof. I didn't wait to catch my breath. I always pulled my bridge away at night, so worried that the butter had somehow gotten through the roof access door, I darted out, making a run for the door and slam it closed before any more could come up. But the door to the building beneath me was shut tight, just like it always was. That's when I heard laughing coming from the next building over. Decker was buckled over, clenching his stomach because he was laughing so hard. Quinn was patting his back with a grin on her face, and Blaze had his hands over his mouth. They'd grabbed a bridge from another roof and set that thing loose on me. Decker was behind the whole idea. I just knew it. Gun still in hand, I stormed to the bridge. Did you put that thing on my roof? I shouted, raising my weapon, intent on shooting Decker in his goddamn face. He was laughing too hard to answer. Decker! When I got across, I cocked the hammer of my gun. But right as I squeezed the trigger, Blaze grabbed my arm, knocking my aim off and wrestling the pistol from my hands. Decker's eyes went wide at the sound of the loud bang, like he didn't think I'd really try to shoot him. I'll fucking kill you, I yelled irately, letting go of my pistol and shoving Blaze away from me. I threw myself at Decker, catching him in the stomach with my shoulder and taking him to the ground. I punched him twice in the face before he even registered we'd fallen, blood already trickling out of his busted nose. But he was much larger than me, 
and he threw me off easily enough that I rolled a few feet. I was so furious that I wasn't thinking clearly, and when we both shot up, I rushed him again. He was ready for it this time, and he braced himself against the blow. It hurt my shoulder more than it hurt him, and he barely even flinched. Instead, he brought his fist back, sending it hard into my stomach. When I buckled over, he stepped back, jabbing my cheek with his left hand and then throwing another hit with his right that caught me in the mouth. I was in pain, but I was driven by the desire to see him dead. I kicked my leg up, the clutched toes of my bare foot getting him in the groin. Decker hollered sharply, hands shooting between his legs. I punched him once in the side of the head, but when I threw my fist to do it again, he caught my arm, gripping it roughly in his hand. He whipped me to the side and off balance, and then shoved me face first to the ground. I felt his knee dig into my back as the entirety of his weight landed on top of me, and then his fingers tangled in my hair, pushing my face harder into the rough pebbles on the roof. I'm still gonna shoot you, I threatened bitterly, wincing when he pressed me harder to the ground. Then I should just kill you right now. He reached his free hand under me and wrapped it around my neck, preparing to strangle me. I spat out blood from my busted lip, glaring at him out of the corner of my eye. Do it! What the hell is going on here? Leon asked, standing at the edge of the bridge to the main roof. I heard my gun clatter to the floor as Blaze dropped it, and him and Quinn both started toward Leon, as though they had nothing to do with the trouble. They passed him and headed back toward the complex building but Decker was still scowling down at me. Decker, let her up, Leon ordered when Decker made no move to get off of me. Decker leaned down by my ear so Leon couldn't hear him and whispered, I know what you did for those travelers, and I bet they weren't the only ones. Don't let me catch you alone. Then he defiantly shoved my face down one more time before angrily passing Leon and heading to the building. I took my time getting up. Now that the adrenaline and anger were wearing off, the pain was getting more substantial. Then I picked up my gun where Blaze had dropped it and shoved it into the back of my pants and made my way to the tent just to grab my sneakers. I pulled them on, not bothering to tie them, and when I came back out of my tent, Leon had been making his way to me. I wanted to stay on my roof by myself until I was completely done fuming, but I took Decker's threat seriously and I wouldn't put it past him to come back once Leon was gone. Fuck off, I shoved past Leon, not wanting to hear what he had to say, and severely resenting the disappointed look on his face. I made my way to the common area, glaring at everyone inside. Decker was sitting at the table with Blaze and Martin, and when he saw me walk in, he set his gun on the surface, a subtle warning not to try anything. The only person I acknowledged civilly was Farah who was opening cans of food and dumping the contents into a pot, which she'd take up to the fire on the roof to heat. I grabbed a bottle of water, a random towel, and a bar of soap from the boxes around the room, and then stomped over to the couch while passing another glare at Decker. My shoulder was scraped from being tackled by the biter. My lip was busted, and my right cheek already swelling. I didn't even want to think about the scratch near my collarbone. Scratches from biters were only fatal sometimes, if their saliva got into it while the wound was fresh. But who knows if they put their hands in their mouths? Not to mention how dirty they were. I could only imagine the kinds of infections I could get. I dampened the towel and wiped the blood off of my lip, then did the same with the scrape on the back of my shoulder. When it came to the scratches, I re-dampened the towel and rubbed some soap into it, scouring my wound thoroughly enough that it started bleeding again. It stung so badly there were tears in my eyes, and I refused to turn even slightly so that Decker wouldn't see it. I could feel him staring at me, even though I couldn't see him. He was gonna kill me. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but when the perfect opportunity came, he wouldn't hesitate. I just had to make sure to avoid him, never go anywhere by myself. I might have to start sleeping in the barracks, because even if he's there too, at least the others are also. My only other option was to kill him first, but that might just hurt me more than it would help. 
Once my wounds were as clean as I could get them, I continued to sit there, holding the coolness of the damp rag to my swollen cheek. It provided little comfort against the throbbing. What I wouldn't give for some ice. Farrah left with a pot of food, and knowing breakfast would be coming soon, the others got up to follow her. I was about to go too, afraid of being alone even for a while, but luckily Halston came in as they left, rubbing his eyes tiredly. You should have seen that poker game last night, he started, plopping down next to me on the couch and adjusting his cowboy hat on his head. Morton was. He stopped short when he saw my face and his jaw dropped. The hell happened to you? I set my mouth in a thin, angry line, nodding toward the door where the others had left. Decker thought it would be funny to put a biter on my roof this morning. Didn't go my way when I tried to kick his ass for it. Shit, Echo. I'm sorry, he said, tensing his mouth to one side apologetically. If I was awake, I never would have let him do that. I shrugged to let him know it wasn't his fault. He's gonna kill me the second he gets a chance. When I said that, Halston's eyes met mine and he looked worried. I just don't know what I can do about it. I'd kill him if the others wouldn't gang up on me much for it. I mean, I know they don't like me much. I like you, he said reassuringly, and I gave him a grateful smile. Just stay around me. You can't kill both of us without repercussions. I nodded in agreement, thankful for the offer. Halston fit in so well with everyone else that they'd never think about hurting him. Except for his fights with Decker, but all the guys fought with each other occasionally. After a minute of silence, Halston reached up, carefully grabbing the wet towel I was holding against my cheek and pulling it away so that he could see. I gave it to him and dropped my arm, letting him study the puffy bruise. Once he got a good look at it, he put the towel back on it holding it there himself while his eyes scanned the rest of my face. I didn't think much of it, even if it was out of character, until he started leaning forward, lips aiming for mine. I pulled back, trying not to giggle at the absurdity of the idea. What are you doing? Halston had never shown that kind of interest in me all the years we'd been here, and I never looked at any of the guys that way. Part of me wondered if he knew it would be absurd and he was doing it to cheer me up. What, we weren't having a moment? He seemed a little embarrassed, but he chuckled teasingly. I thought we were having a moment. No, I said as seriously as I could, shaking my head. But I couldn't help it, I snorted with laughter. Where did that even come from? Sorry, I guess it's been too long since I got any, he shrugged. Getting kind of desperate. Asshole. I laughed, throwing the bloody towel at him. You're so not my type. But if you were, I might be offended. I stood, ready to go up and see if breakfast was done, and House did follow my lead. You might be offended? He sneered playfully. I'm the one who just got denied. We headed for the stairwell, me talking at him over my shoulder. If you're that desperate, I'm sure Quinn would be happy to provide. He made a deliberate gagging sound. You should feel good about yourself, because I wouldn't touch Decker's leftovers if I hadn't had sex in twenty years. Twenty years, huh? I asked mockingly. Is that it? Shut up, he smirked, giving my unwounded shoulder a good-natured shove. What is your type, anyway? Martin's Latin mystique. Blaze's scrawny sex appeal? He paused for a thoughtful moment and then added jokingly. Quinn or Farrah? I stopped at the door to the roof and turned so that he could see me roll my eyes. Then I pushed it open and strode outside without giving a response. Vera was just serving dishes of food as Houston and I arrived. It was oddly silent as we ate, and every few seconds I could see everyone's eyes dart from me to Decker. My temper had cooled enough that I wasn't decided on shooting him anymore, but it appeared they weren't so sure. Tension was thick. It wasn't just that everyone seemed a little more untrusting than usual. It was a peak hatred between Decker and I, like that hot, suffocating dampness and wait before the summer thunderstorm. I just had to make sure I was ready when the clouds rolled in. 
Hey, 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 Martin started excitedly. He'd been sitting in his lawn chair scanning the city's rooftops with his binoculars ever since he'd finished eating. We got trespassers. I sat still while everyone else strode over, squinting to see what Martin did. Looks like they're catching some shut-eye. How many? Leon asked from behind Martin's chair, shoving a bite of food into his mouth. Looks about... Martin paused, moving his sight to check the adjacent roofs in the distance. Twenty or so. Some kind of soldiers, I think. He stared into his binoculars for a few more moments before looking up at Leon. Seems they're all sleeping, though. We could take the bridges, going all stealth-like. Let me see, Leon said, motioning for the binoculars. He stared quietly for a moment before handing them back, looking like he was thinking. I got an idea, Blaze said, sounding eager as always to go steal something. We could go in from three different sides of the roof if we take all the bridges. That's good, Halston agreed, shading his eyes with his hands and squinting to try to see across the rooftops. And we can make a fast getaway if any of them wake up. Okay, Leon said, turning and ready to head over. I stood, prepared to go over to get some supplies, and followed everybody to grab our backpacks. I didn't mind so much that we were about to steal from soldiers who outnumbered us by more than a double. I actually preferred it this way. It kept petty crime from turning into murder, and petty crime was something I'd mastered. All of us grabbed a bridge, and we started our silent cross toward the faraway roof. It was over two blocks, but eventually we got to the building right next to the group, and from there we split up. I followed Martin and Houston to the left of the soldiers. Decker, Quinn, and Blaze went to the right, and Leon and Farrah crossed from the middle. It wasn't until it was my turn to cross the bridge that my heartbeat started to pick up. Even from halfway across, I could see the weapons the soldiers were carrying. A few of them were even wearing clothing I recognized from long ago as military. To call our targets intimidating would be an understatement. But from the looks of it, they had more than enough supplies which melted all guilt I might have had and made this thrilling. Before stepping off the bridge and onto the soldier's roof, I double-checked to make sure that none of them were awake. Not a one was, and a few were even snoring. Once I touched down, I took delicate steps toward the first sleeping man who wasn't using a supply pack as a pillow. While I reached for his bag, I kept my eyes on the automatic rifle he was hugging to his chest. The last thing that I wanted was to make friends with the bullets in that rifle. So I undid the zipper painfully slow, terrified of making even the slightest sound. Once it was open, I pulled out certain things I thought we needed and carefully put them into my own backpack. I was shocked when I pulled out a nearly empty bag with just two pieces of fresh beef jerky in it. It had been so long since I'd seen any type of fresh meat other than fish that I wanted to scarf it down right then and there. I made it to a couple more soldiers before we'd nearly cleaned them out. I was in the process of emptying the last bag, along with Farrah and Decker and a couple other soldiers, while everyone else had already crossed their bridges and was waiting for us. When I finished, I eased the zipper of my backpack closed and stood to make my way to the bridge. As I took my first step forward, I felt something connect with my lifted foot and pulled back. Thrown off balance, I tumbled to the ground with a loud thud, and everything in my pack seemed to clank together, adding to the noise. I was panicking before I even hit the ground, but I turned my head just in time to see Decker's evil grin, and his foot drawing away from where mine had been, as he started his hasty retreat to his own bridge. The bastard tripped me and the noise I'd made had woken the soldier next to me. He stared for a second as he tried to focus his tired eyes, and then they shot wide, and he turned in a deep breath. Raiders! he shouted. Before he could yell again, I kicked him in the face, and he sputtered in pain as I scrambled up. It was no use, though. All the soldiers had heard him, and if they weren't already standing, they were on their way. I was closer to Leon and Farrah's bridge, so I started for it only to find that they'd already pulled it away so that the soldiers couldn't follow. 
I sprinted toward my own bridge, where Halston was waving at me to hurry. There was pounding of footsteps on the bridge close behind me, and I knew there was at least one soldier following closely behind. We'd left a second plank connected to another roof, and I ran toward it as fast as I could while Martin and Halston were already across. But the sound of boots was getting closer, and before I was even halfway, a soldier had caught up. He shouldered me so hard I went flying sideways, and he continued forward to try and catch up with Martin and Halston. He didn't make it. They'd already pulled it away and left me there. When I finally stopped rolling across the paved rooftop, I darted up, frantically searching for some other escape route. The only thing that caught my attention was the automatic rifle pointed at me. Get down! A second soldier, the one who had the gun pointed at me, yelled. I did what he said without protest and dropped to my knees, throwing my hands up in surrender. Shit. There had to be some way out of this. I glanced past him to see where everyone else was, but they were all gone. As I did, though, I saw a familiar face in one of the soldiers. A face from before the outbreak. In my panic, I was drawing a blank. What was her name? Shooter! The soldier who had knocked me down came up beside the other one. We don't take raiders. You know that. I'd always known it. God damn it, what was her name? Shoot her, he ordered again. Still, the other man hesitated. He looked former military, especially in the camouflage pants he was wearing. He had to be. Why else wouldn't he have shot someone who was surrendering? When he still made no move to kill me, the other soldier reached for and raised his own weapon. Wait! I shouted desperately before he could fire. Wait, I know Genevieve. That was it. That was her name. And the two soldiers knew who I meant, because they looked at each other curiously. The one who hesitated shrugged, and so the other one turned and yelled across the rooftop. Hey! He hollered with his hands cupped around his mouth. Hey, LT! From another roof she looked our way, and the soldier waved her over. Now I just hoped that she'd remember who I was and spare me. The group had secured another bridge, which she used to cross from her roof, and then she strode over another one to us. I felt so nervous I could hurl. This one says she knows you, the man said when she was within earshot. She looked at me, and glancing from her to the enormous knife strapped to her thigh, to the rifle in her hands, I gave a nervous smile. Genevieve recognized me all right, but she didn't give the reaction I was hoping for. Her eyebrows furrowed angrily, and her mouth set in a hard scowl as she continued toward me. Just as I worried she might shoot me herself, she raised her weapon, and the last thing I saw was the butt of her gun coming straight from my head. Ladies, stop throwing paint everywhere, my teacher warned the two nine-year-old girls near me. They stopped giggling instantly and looked up guiltily, dripping their brushes back into the paint cans so that they could continue working on the banner. One of them, the one with the curly red hair, glanced my way, and I gave a shy smile. It was only a week after school started, and I was still the new kid. Her eyes lingered on me for a second before she looked away without smiling back. I was too quiet and awkward to have made any friends yet. The other girl with black hair and brown eyes, her desk was right next to mine, but she was too busy talking to all her other friends to have even noticed me yet. I peeked up toward our desk just in time to see one of the boys in our class with his hands in the girl's pencil box. He pulled it out, gripping something bright and shiny and stuck the item into his pocket as he lumbered away. My eyes shot down guiltily, and I busily finished the word carnival in blue paint. I wanted to tell on him, but you were never supposed to tattletale. My sisters picked on me all the time for it, so I kept my mouth shut. After we finished the banner, we all washed our hands. When I returned to my desk, the girl was digging her pencils and pens and glue sticks out of her box. She was looking for whatever that boy took. Was it tattling if you told someone other than the teacher? I tapped her timidly on the shoulder. What? She asked shortly, turning toward me with angry tears in her eyes. 
I was almost too afraid to speak. I was always too shy for my own good. What are you looking for? She resumed her furious searching in the pencil box. I have bracelet. I took it off because I didn't want to get it dirty. I glanced around to make sure that nobody was listening. That way they wouldn't be able to hold the tattling against me. And I leaned closer to her ear. That boy took it, I whispered. And when she looked up, I pointed at him for a brief second. She wiped a tear from her eye, and without looking at me again, she stormed over to him. Where is it? She asked him. I didn't hear what he said, but then she pushed him and I fell into my desk nervously, unable to watch. I wasn't trying to start a fight. A few moments later, she sat down at her own desk, bracelet in place around her wrist. It was a fancy piece of jewelry, gold with a couple of diamonds on top. I didn't know if they were real or not. Thanks, she said, and when I lifted my head, she was grinning at me. Then she leaned forward to catch a glimpse of my name tag. She always remembered my name after that. And when I went home that night, I told my parents I had made a new friend. I was conscious again, and I couldn't have been out for too long because I was being dragged across the rooftop. There was something over my eyes keeping me from being able to see. Not that I could keep my eyes open long enough anyway. I felt tired. I was grateful when whoever it was stopped dragging me and left me lying down. What are we going to do with her? A male voice asked. I was so tired. I just wanted to go back to sleep. But I was fighting the urge so that I would hear what they'd do to me. I don't know, Genevieve told him. And I let myself drift off. Hey, what's up? A girl in my freshman English class plopped down on the floor next to me, leaning her back against the lockers behind us and pulling a piece of paper out of her binder. I shrugged sheepishly, too nervous to answer because she was popular and rarely ever talked to me. Can I see your homework? My cheeks colored instantly. I wanted to give her the answers. Maybe then I'd fit in better and she'd have a conversation with me so that I could have more friends. But I was too much of a wimp. I felt guilty even using the internet to get my homework done. It wasn't supposed to be a group work, I said quietly, a mouse-like squeak. And she leaned forward halfway through like she couldn't hear me. Oh, come on, she urged, passing a coy smile to her friend who was standing in front of us. It's not like it's a test or anything. I refused to look up at her companion because my cheeks were still flaming with shame. But if our answers are too similar, then he'll know, I protested weakly. She sighed like she was getting impatient, knowing the bell was going to ring in a few minutes. I'll change it enough so he can't tell. And she held out her hand for my homework. I'm pretty sure she said no, Genevieve interrupted before I could give in just like she always did. The girl beside me scowled up at Genevieve and then cast me a bitter side glance. It's just homework. She doesn't have to be such a bitch about it. Genevieve glared, and I felt so out of place now that I wanted to run away until class would start. Why didn't you just finish it yourself? You weren't at practice yesterday either. I had stuff to do, the girl retorted defensively. It's none of your business. Coach is kicking you off of the soccer team, Genevieve told her nonchalantly, and when I glanced up at her, she winked. If you could get off of Sammy's dick long enough to get your grades up, you might be able to stay on. The girl's jaw dropped, and I couldn't help that I snorted with laughter. Then she gave me an angry screech and got up to storm to the other end of the hall with her friend. Genevieve took the now empty seat beside me, chuckling to herself as she pulled a notebook out of her backpack. Thank you, I said bashfully, giving a nervous smile. Never liked her much anyway, Genevieve shrugged. Can I see your homework? My cheeks tinted red again, and when she saw my reaction, she laughed, holding up her own homework for me to see. She had that gold bracelet around her wrist, just like she always did. Don't worry. I did mine. I was just curious what the class genius put down. 
I grinned and handed her the paper in my lap. I'd woken up on a few occasions, but I felt exhausted every time. Now I felt like I was truly done drifting off, and the pain succeeded in completely waking me up. I groaned as I tried to lift my hand to the side of my forehead where the pain was coming from, but my hands were cuffed around something behind my back. That's when I started to panic again. I still had that blindfold over my eyes and thought that the soldiers had left me bound somewhere and that I was biter bait. In my panic, I pulled fiercely at the metal handcuffs around my wrist. A moment later, I remembered the bobby pin halves in my bracelet and was about to pull them out and break free. Before I could, though, there were footsteps coming toward me. Calm down, said a deep, raspy male voice. You're safe for now. He pulled off the duct tape someone had put over my eyes, and I squinted, temporarily blinded by the brightness of the world around me. It wasn't just the bright lights, shining from each corner of the large tent we were in, that hurt. My head was pounding, an agonizing pressure on all sides of my skull and an aching throb in my ears. It was too painful to hold up, so I dropped my head and groaned again. You can get Doc April now he said to somebody somewhere in the room, and they left out of the entrance of the tent. Then he spoke more quietly to someone else. You got her pretty good, Jen. Might have to wait a bit before we start to interrogate her. Cap, they took McMahon, Genevieve whispered sharply. We should have left already. Put her in a chair for when the doc comes, the man instructed to the third person nearby, and then addressed Genevieve. Well, next time you want to take a prisoner don't almost put them in a coma. A young male soldier knelt down beside me, and after undoing one side of the cuffs, he hoisted me off the ground. The second I was on my feet, I shoved him away from me and reached for my waistband. They were going to interrogate me. For all I knew, that meant torture. That's what it meant where I was from. But my gun wasn't there. I shouldn't have expected it to be. Plus, I was woozy and weak, and after standing on my own for a few moments, I fell to my knees. The soldier lifted me off of the ground again, and when I didn't push him away, he sent me carefully into a chair. He redid the cuffs behind my back, and after I dropped my head once more, a couple of people strode through the opening of the tent. I was fighting the urge to go back to sleep once again. Is this what a concussion felt like? I'd never had one before. Jesus, said a bitter, unfamiliar female voice. A moment later, she sounded closer, and I could hear that she was leaning over my face. You should have let me come sooner. Nothing you could have done for her anyway, said Cap. Something touched underneath my nose, and when the wretched smell of ammonia drifted into my nostrils, I flinched back, disgusted. I opened my eyes, irritated that someone put that smell there, and lock glances with Doc April. Try to stay awake for me, okay? She said, more pleasantly than she'd spoken before. After examining my face, she turned her head to glare at Cap. I could have at least stitched her forehead. She pulled out a pen light to shine in my eyes, smiling amicably at me. I apologize for their lack of hospitality. She's a prisoner, April, Genevieve cut in. Not a guest. Yeah, but you don't have to beat her up so bad. April countered, eyeing my busted lip, then adding sarcastically. Whatever happened to code of conduct? April wasn't necessarily a friend, but she was the only one I liked right now. She was older, in her fifties probably, with graying brown hair and glasses that hit her dark blue eyes. Everything about her looked soft. She had good bedside manner. I only got her in the forehead, Genevieve told her. The doctor leaned back to study my cuts and bruises while she pulled out some gauze pads and soaked them in rubbing alcohol. You poor thing, she said sympathetically, and began to wipe off the blood, which had run from my forehead down to my neck. I risked my first glance up at Genevieve. She was staring at me hard, face completely void of emotion except for the hint of rage in her eyes. 
She wasn't standing up for me now. Those days seemed long gone. I just wished I could tell if she was mad that my group had taken one of her soldiers, or if she just genuinely resented me because of my affiliations. What happened here? April asked, pointing to the scratches across my chest. My eyes darted from her to Genevieve to the older man as I hesitated. My group wouldn't shoot unless I was undoubtedly infected, but who knows if these people took those kinds of chances. Butter, I whispered honestly. Farrell? Her hand immediately shot to my forehead, and then she felt both of my cheeks. When did it happen? Cap took a cautious step forward, and frightened that they might really kill me, I answered quickly. This morning, I think. W what day is it? April sighed, and Cap appeared visibly relieved. Genevieve seemed indifferent. No fever, the doc said to herself, and scrubbed painfully at the wound with rubbing alcohol. I'd like to give you some antibiotics, though. Couldn't hurt. She'll get no such thing, Cap said gruffly, crossing his arms over his chest. She'll go back to her people and take care of herself. April didn't argue, and instead cast me an apologetic smile. I didn't care, though. I was somewhat relieved they were planning on sending me back rather than killing me. Probably a trade for their guy. Not that I'd be better off back home. Decker would still kill me if I went back. The doc finished tending the rest of my wounds in silence. And despite Cap's protest, she gave me some painkillers from my head. And she was gone. Left me alone with Cap and Genevieve, and one other soldier, all of whom looked like they wouldn't mind adding a couple of wounds to my already beat-up body. Cap scooted a chair in front of my own and took a seat, leaning forward with his elbows on his knees. What's your name? he asked. At least they hadn't yet resorted to violence. I'd cooperate anyway. Echo. That's not her name, Genevieve started bitterly. It's he My name, I interrupted before she could finish, leaning over to glare at her. Her attitude was starting to piss me off. Is it Echo? She just rolled her eyes. Okay, Echo. Cap agreed indifferently. What did he care, anyway? Here's the situation we're in. Your fellow raiders took one of our men, and we'd like him back. Would he still be alive? I nodded, knowing Leon would question him for information. He'd be alive, but I couldn't guarantee his condition. Good. Then if you'd kindly take Genevieve's platoon, we'd be more than happy to return you safe and sound. That was the first time I realized I was in a position of power. They cared about their man, and they wanted him back. I was no better off home than I was here. If I went home, I was dead, for sure. If I didn't cooperate with these people, then I might be dead. But I had bargaining power. We've got a misunderstanding about what I can do for you. I told him calmly, and he raised his eyebrows for explanation. They don't care about me. The only thing that they'll trade your man for is supplies. What kind of supplies? Cap asked. The more he spoke to me, the less afraid of him I got. He was a tough weather man, but considering the position I was in, he hadn't been entirely unkind to me. I was more afraid of Genevieve than I was of him. I took a minute to think about his question. There wasn't exactly any protocol for this, seeing as how this is the first time that any of us had actually been taken prisoner rather than killed on sight. I could imagine the kinds of things the group would want, though. Food is a must. At least two weeks' rations for eight people. Medical supplies. Ammo. You're not getting ammunition, he answered instantly. And I knew he wouldn't budge on that. I hadn't expected him to give raiders ammo anyway. I just thought I'd throw it in there. Five days' rations. Two weeks, I countered. One week. Cap raised his offer. But I wouldn't walk into the complex with anything less than I'd originally said. 
I didn't think Leon would accept it. Two. A week and a half is my final offer, Cap said, leaning back in his seat to watch me. I shrugged like I couldn't care less. I guess you don't want your guy back. Genevieve scoffed angrily, and Cap studied me thoughtfully for a minute. Fine, he said eventually. Two weeks. Then he began to stand. Even though he tried to bargain, he agreed quite easily. The fact that he'd given up supplies without much hesitation made me think these guys were well off. One more thing, I blurted out before he could completely get out of his seat, and he sat back down. Now I faltered. I had bargaining power, but how much? Let me stay. They'd be happy with just the supplies. Let me stay here. Cap sighed, but he didn't answer right away, and I knew he was thinking about it, even if it was only for the sake of my cooperation. Genevieve knew, too, because she stepped forward indignantly. Cap, no, she protested. I swear I won't cause trouble, I told him pleadingly. Now that I'd said it, I'd do anything not to have to go back to the complex. I'll be one of your soldiers. I'll do whatever you want. Cap, Genevieve said again. I was too nervous to glare at her. The man stood, folded his arms across his chest, and paced behind the chair. I was scared he'd say no. They were planning on killing me anyway, I told him, practically begging for him not to send me back, hoping if I poured my heart out it would help. I don't belong there. Captain Greeley, Genevieve stepped forward, and this time I did shoot her a fierce look. I didn't know what her problem was, but I wouldn't go back just because of her. You want to get McMahon back, Cap asked her, and then pointed at me. She's the only one who knows where the raiders are hiding. And the building's booby-trapped, I added, thinking it would help my chances. You never make it on your own. Cap held his hands out and glanced at Genevieve as if to say, There you have it. Get some rest, Jen, he said. Stackhouse and Barnes are fueling the vehicles and dishing rations so that you could leave tomorrow afternoon. Genevieve growled irritably and started for the entrance of the tent, grabbing the handcuff key from the other soldier without looking back. Cap looked at me and nodded toward her, letting me know that I should follow, and I grinned that my terms had been met. Don't let her out of your sight, he called after Genevieve as I left the tent to follow her. I was a few feet behind her, almost jogging to catch up despite the pounding in my head, and I could hear her grumbling angrily. This is bullshit. And she glanced back at me and scowled. There was just enough light from the different tents and camps around that I didn't trip too much over the uneven ground. But I couldn't tell exactly where I was. Except for those various lights, the world around us was dark. I stopped walking to look around. We were outside. I knew that because there were stars. And I could hear the consistent hum of insects in the night and the air was fresh. God, was it fresh. I'd never realized just how bad the city reeked until I took a conscious whiff of the air around me. It was like breathing for the first time. The forest. We were in the goddamn forest. I almost laughed at the realization. Even though I couldn't see too far because of the trees, it looked like there were a lot of campfires and tents. Could there be more than soldiers? I wished I could tell what kind of place this was, what kind of place I'd be staying at now, but I'd almost lost Genevieve in the dark, so I hurried forward to keep up with her. Bullshit, she was still mumbling when I reached her. Just one easy run, he said. All you need is solar panels. Now I'm stuck with a fucking raider. We prefer renegade, I told her tauntingly. I shouldn't have, but I was starting to take offense at her hostility toward me. I flinched when she turned on her heels, pointing a furious finger at me. I was sure there were people around because I could hear soft conversations, but Genevieve obviously had some authority, and my hands were still cuffed. If she attacked me, I wouldn't be able to defend myself. 
and I wasn't sure she wouldn't. You think you're so funny, she growled. Then she shoved one of my shoulders, turning me around. I don't know why you're so mad, I said, and glanced back over my shoulder when she undid one of my handcuffs. I'll get your boyfriend back. He's not my... She started and stopped, huffing like she couldn't be more irritated. And then she pushed me into a tent I hadn't noticed in the dark. At the push, there were large white dots in my vision, and I stopped at the entrance to let the sudden wooziness subside. I was going to have to take it easy. Move, she ordered when I continued to stand there, blocking the way in. Jesus, fine. I stepped to the side, careful not to walk on anything, because I couldn't see, and I wasn't sure where anything was inside the shelter. What's your problem? Genevieve clicked on a lighter, which she used to light a small lantern in the tent. There was a cot on the left side and a large trunk full of stuff at the head of that. Aside from those and the lantern, there wasn't much else in here. My problem is that your asshole buddies have my best friend, Genevieve said. And when she put her hand on my shoulder to shove me again, I pulled away and glowered at her. She glared, but refrained from using force and pointed to where she wanted me to go. And you conned the captain into letting you stay here. I strode to the corner where she'd pointed. And when I got there, she reached behind me and weaved the cuffs around one of the support poles of the tent for hating me so bad. She didn't mind being touchy. As she reached around me, she got close. Her bright, furious brown eyes hardly three inches from mine. Then she cuffed my free hand back in, so I was locked to the pole. I didn't con anybody, I said defensively, watching as she strode to the cot and sat down at the edge. She didn't say anything at first, just pulled the backpack off of her shoulders and took my knife and gun out of it. She set my weapons in a large trunk on the floor and then went to work untying her boots. You aren't getting any sleep tomorrow night, so rest up, she said after she'd kicked off her boots. I glanced around, searching for some kind of bedding, and then down at the hard floor. You want me to sleep right here? She just looked at me and then stood to make her way to the lantern. Can you at least take the cuffs off so I can get comfortable? So you can murder me in my sleep? She asked bitterly. No, I'm not that kind of raider, I told her, lowering my head in shame because, even though I had no intention of hurting her, it wasn't entirely true. You're not fooling anyone, she said, and then she blew out the light. In the dark, I could hear her slide into her cot, and I stood there for a few moments before I lowered myself to the ground. Oh, could I at least get a blanket or something? No, she answered shortly. And if you keep me awake, I'll kick your ass. At first I thought that she was just being a bitch. And I waited for her to pass me a blanket, or at least a pillow. But none came. And before long, I could hear her breathing deep and slow, already asleep. With a sigh, I stretched my legs out, lying down on the hard ground and resting my head on my restrained arms. It must have been the concussion that let me fall asleep easily. Because I was so uncomfortable, I don't know how I did. The chills woke me up early in the morning. It was still dark outside. Just a little gray from the sky made it possible to see in the tent. My entire body was sore from sleeping on the ground, and my head was pounding with a migraine. I sat up, leaning back until my spine cracked. Genevieve was practically snoring she was so deep in sleep, and she had her back turned to me. I chewed the inside of my cheek thoughtfully, knowing the idea that was materializing in the back of my mind and trying to force it away. If I picked the cuffs and slipped out of the tent, I knew it would piss Genevieve off. But there wasn't a spot on my aching muscles that didn't feel pain. Who knew how long she'd be asleep for? I needed to stretch my legs, maybe find some food and the dock so that I could get more painkillers for my head. Before I could stop myself, I'd pulled a piece of the bobby pin out of my bracelet, and picking the handcuffs, 
was so easy, I might as well have had the key. I was about to leave the tent, but stopped at the entrance. Genevieve had my weapons. I couldn't take the gun. That much was certain. Nobody here trusted me, and if I had a gun, they might shoot me before I could explain. But my knife, that little old pocket knife with a glow-in-the-dark handle, it was sentimental, and I wasn't sure if she'd ever give it back. So I opened up the trunk she'd thrown my weapons into, silently pulled out my knife, and stuck it into the pocket of my cargo pants. When I stepped out of the tent, I took a minute to look around. It was so much bigger than I'd imagined. Through thin breaks between the trees, I could see tents in every direction. There had to be over a hundred. Though the camp was still relatively quiet, there were people stirring, walking around and getting to business. I inhaled a deep breath of fresh, cold morning air. It was as clean and crisp as the night before. But now I smelt food, and my feet immediately started in the direction of the smell. I crossed my arms over my chest to try and warm myself. Even for summer, the mornings were chilly, and my sweater was back at the complex. As I walked toward the pleasant aroma, I passed other people's campsites. The ones who were awake smiled at me, completely unaware of who I was or why I was here. One campsite I strode past was a family sleeping on the ground near a fire in their sleeping bags. And they had a child. A little kid, probably only seven years old. It had been so long since I'd seen a kid. Everyone looked well-rested, at ease, and well-fed. This place was a refuge, and it was such a beautiful sight, it almost brought tears to my eyes. Coming up on my right, I could see a small cabin. It stood out from everything else because there was an enormous red cross painted on the side. I wasn't sure what the rules were concerning medical needs, or if there was anyone inside, but I headed toward it. When I reached the entrance, I pulled open the door and peeked my head in. I scanned the inside, and where there were large metal containers, more cots, and a couple of steel tables, and even a blocked-off area surrounded by clean plastic sheets. I didn't see anyone moving around, so I was about to close the door and continue toward the food. But there was movement coming from right under my nose, just to the side of the door. The doctor from last night had been sleeping on a cot by the door, and she jumped when her eyes focused on me. Oh dear, she chuckled as she sat up. You scared me. Sorry. She didn't seem irritated that I'd woken her, so I went all the way in and closed the door behind me. April reached under her cot, a moment later coming up with her glasses in hand. When she put them on, she looked at me again, and now seeing who I was, she appeared shocked. Oh, it's you. Once the shock wore off, she seemed to panic a little. She glanced around nervously and her movements got skittish, though she tried not to show it. What can I do you for? She knew I was a raider. And without anyone else around, she clearly wasn't as confident as she had been the night before. I was just wondering if you had any more painkillers for my head. I told her, speaking as calmly as I could, since I obviously made her uncomfortable. Sure, she said, and with anxious energy she got out of bed and made her way to the large box-like machine. She flicked on a temperamental switch a couple of times impatiently, until the lights in the cabin flicked on. It was a generator and the fact that they had electricity made me smile with joy. Then April went to one of the large containers, pulling on a sweater while she walked. Even when she reached into the bin, she kept one eye on me, like she was worried I'd attack her. So I kept my distance and leaned my back against the wall near the door. After she grabbed the pills, she picked up a water bottle and carried both to me. How are you feeling this morning? She asked as she handed me the medicine and water. She almost flinched when I reached out for them. My head still hurts, I answered, and she nodded knowingly, taking a timid step back. You, you don't need to be scared of me. I swallowed down the pills and then held the bottle of water out for her to take. I won't hurt you. 
April rapidly glanced away like she didn't know how to respond. Since you're here, I'll look at your wounds. She avoided my comment, waving me to one of the steel tables and patting the surface. I hopped onto it, sitting quietly, while she removed the gauze she had taped on my forehead. Some of us had had experiences of our own, or at least have heard stories, she said eventually, moving to the scratches on my chest. Are they true? I knew what she was talking about. Stories about raiders. I hated that I was something to be feared, that I was the boogeyman in these people's somewhat comfortable lives. I didn't want April or anyone else to be scared of me, but I didn't want her thinking others weren't dangerous. Yes, I nodded. She looked down uneasily, eyes widening when she glimpsed the tattoo on my wrist, as if that made it even more real. But I'm not dangerous. She turned without saying anything and grabbed a small tube of ointment from another container. She squeezed some onto her finger carefully rubbing it into the scratches on my chest. Your captain said I could stay. I started when I didn't think she'd continue the conversation. It had occurred to me that they could always kill me once they had their soldier back. So then I added quickly, I don't know if he was serious or not. Ben's an honest man, April told me, gently taping more gauze over the scratches. Fair, too. I just nodded, watching her stride to the same bin from which she'd grabbed the painkillers. She pulled out a few pills from another bottle, and when she got back she handed one to me. I studied it curiously, not sure if she could be entirely trusted either, but she reassured me instantly. Antibiotics, since he said you could stay. I smiled gratefully and swallowed it down, and then she handed me the others. For later. One a day. You should eat shortly. I hopped off of the table and shoved the pills into my pockets. Where could I get a bite? April pointed in the direction I'd been heading before coming into the cabin. Just keep going that way. There are some makeshift tables near the big campfire. Thank you, I said, genuinely appreciative. And after she nodded, I headed out the door. I continued in the direction April had pointed me and before long, I found the area she was talking about. There were several narrow tables and stumps for seats around a large campfire. There was another table set up nearest the fire, from which it looked like people were handing out the meal. There were men, women, and children sitting at the tables, eating what looked like a stew out of all kinds of different dishes. I strode up to the serving table and leaned over the large pot to see what was inside. Hungry? asked a woman standing behind it. She was a young Middle Eastern woman, late twenties maybe, with light brown eyes and dark brown hair that was pulled back into a ponytail. When I nodded, she held out her hand. Do you have your bowl? Oh, uh, no, I said unsuredly, and she raised a curious eyebrow at me while I tried to think of an excuse. Um, I'm new. And so she wouldn't see it, I put my tattoo arm behind my back. The woman grinned excitedly, this time sticking out her hand for me to shake. I'm Amina. I hesitated before pulling my arm from behind my back and taking her hand in mine. I'm Echo. It looked like she noticed the mark, but she must not have known what it was. That's an interesting name, she mused. And then she picked up a bowl and a spoon and a cup, the table next to her. You can use mine for now. I already ate. I hesitated in reaching for her things, put off by the overwhelming friendliness and trust, which she mistook for not wanting to share her stuff. Don't worry, I cleaned them. I chuckled and took the items from her, holding out the bowl so that she could fill it with stew. Thanks, I said, taking a whiff of the delicious grub in my bowl. There were real, actual vegetables in it. Carrots and potatoes and corn. There was even meat, though I could only see a piece or two. You're welcome, Amina smiled amicably and nodded toward the other side of the table. Rick over there has coffee. Coffee. For a minute, until Rick poured coffee into my cup, 
and I tasted the splendidly bitter fluid. I thought I might really be in a coma and dreaming. I sat down at a table with my heavenly breakfast. There was a group of three young men sitting nearby, and when they noticed me, they all scowled and got up to leave. I guess some people knew who I was. One of them had a massive bruise on his face, and he sort of looked like the one I'd kicked on the roof. I ignored it, though, too blissfully happy about having real food to care. I was about halfway through my bowl when a man sat down beside me. Where's Genevieve? He asked. Shit. Sleeping, I answered as calmly as I could so I wouldn't sound suspicious. The man's voice was familiar. It was the one who'd spoken to Genevieve on the roof, the first time I woke up after she hit me. I glanced up to look at him. He was tall, with medium-length black hair that curled at the tips around his perfectly chiseled face. His bright green eyes stared right back at me, looking hostile and skeptical. I already didn't like him. He reminded me of Decker. Not to mention he was sitting a little too close, like he was trying to intimidate me. Does she know you're out here? Yeah. I shoved another spoonful of soup into my mouth and washed it down with coffee before showing him my wrist. See? No handcuffs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he mumbled, staring hard at me for another few seconds before he stood up and lumbered away. Almost immediately after he left, I had new guests. Four teenagers sat down across from me, three guys and one girl, each leaning forward enthusiastically. Is it true? One of the boys asked me, and at his question, the other leaned forward even more. I furrowed my brows. What? Are you a raider? Another one whispered. Yeah, she is. Look, the third one said. And in a bold show, he reached forward and grabbed my arm, pulling it forward so that he could look at my tattoo. I let them look for a second before I cleared my throat, and they all jumped back, startled, which made me laugh. When I started laughing, they all looked at me unsuredly, before giving their own nervous chuckles. Are you going to murder us all? The second boy asked. I shook my head and took another bite of food. What's the name of your gang? The girl asked. We don't have one. Then the bold one spoke up again. Have you ever killed anyone? I resisted the urge to glare so I wouldn't scare them. They saw me as something mysterious, and perhaps non-threatening. The flaw of this sheltered camp so far, some of these people didn't know about dangers other than ferals. You guys ask a lot of questions. We've never seen a real-life raider before, said the first boy. I have. The third one gave a proud grin. You better hope I'm the only one you ever see. I grumbled. The girl opened her mouth like she was about to say something, but then each of their eyes went to the side, and they followed something toward me. I was about to turn and see what they were watching, but right as I shifted, someone grabbed me by my shoulders. I was pulled out of my seat, only to be thrown to the ground. And before I could even react, Genevieve was sitting over my hips, hands pinning my wrist to the ground above my head so I couldn't hit her. What the hell do you think you're doing? She yelled angrily fingers tightening around my wrist. My head was spinning from being slammed on the ground, but my temper had flared. I was sick of being pushed around, especially because she already injured me to the point of stitches. Since she was about the same size, maybe even a few pounds lighter than me, I bucked my hips and at the same time shoved one arm up. It shifted her weight just enough that I could roll us over, but I didn't even get a chance to pin her once I gained the upper hand. Her fist caught me in the jaw, close enough to where Decker had hit me that the pain was almost unbearable. God damn it! I shouted, leaning back so that I could wind up, and I sent my own fist at her face. In this position, size wasn't an advantage for either of us, and she knocked me off of her as easily as I had. I landed on my back next to her, and as she scrambled over, I threw my arm out, hitting her in the face one more time. The impact caused her to stumble so I used the opportunity to push up and get my arms around her neck from behind. I rolled onto my back once more, pulling her along so that she was on top of me. But with one arm around her neck, I put my other hand on her jaw, a lethal position that named me Victor. 
The second I had her in that lock, I heard the cocking of a gun, and the soldier who'd sat down next to me, and probably went to get Genevieve, had a pistol pointed at me. Go ahead then, Genevieve said over her shoulder at me, challenging me to finish her. I could feel her breathing heavily against my own heaving chest. You'll be dead before you can stand. I loosened my grip, hurt that she thought that I'd really do it. I'd always been fond of her, even now when she was being a complete bitch. I don't want to kill you, I told her, completely releasing her from my hold. She rolled off of me and pushed herself up. Feeling around in my pockets, she grabbed the knife before taking a step back. I took a few seconds to catch my breath and then stood. I was going to make a comment about her not needing to be such an asshole, but I'd stood too quickly and my head couldn't handle it. My vision went white, and then I blacked out. I woke up back at the medical cabin, lying on one of the cots, handcuffs back on. Groaning, I sat up, and it took a minute before I could see again. Genevieve was sitting on a steel table, April tending to the wounds on her face. At least I'd gotten her a couple of times. There was a small laceration over her right eyebrow and her jaw looked swollen. That made me feel a little better. Genevieve noticed me waken, and she passed a hard look at my direction. Carrying you places is starting to be a pain in the ass. Maybe if you didn't keep fucking hitting me in the head, I wouldn't keep passing out, I said fiercely. April finished with Genevieve and made her way to me, starting to clean my rebusted lip. And maybe if you weren't a degenerate piece of shit, I wouldn't keep hitting you in the head. Genevieve countered, jumping off the table. Excuse me? My jaw dropped, and I pushed April's hand away as I stood. You don't know what I've been through. I've survived the best way I knew how. Raping and stealing and murdering? She scoffed. But I'm glad you've been living comfortably. Yeah, you know what? I sold my soul because I was scared, I shouted, my frustration growing because I couldn't figure out why she was treating me like this. We'd never been close, but she knew me better than that. Let's say for one second you even have a clue what the hell you're talking about. I'm sure you've done things you regret. Yes, bringing you here instead of shooting you on the roof, she yelled. And it was like a blow to the stomach. A blow that only fueled my fury. Seriously, Genevieve, what is your problem? I added, and like I always did. I hid my pain with sarcasm. Ritter steal your lunch money? Her face got visibly red, and she practically roared at me. You killed my dad and brother. What? My anger hitched, fading to instant confusion. I didn't. But I was so bewildered, I couldn't even finish a sentence. The elementary school, she said, no longer yelling, but still looking at me with venomous resentment. Two weeks after the outbreak. I wasn't sure at first, and I had to think about it. But then my stomach knotted up, because I'd been there. We had a group posted there. At night, a bunch of us went out for supplies and left a few kids at the school with two women. There was a guard at the gate. Any of this ringing a bell? It sounded so familiar that I had to sit down. That was one of the first runs I'd ever made with Leon's group. There had been 15 of us back then. Do you remember what happened to the guard? Genevieve asked. They shot him. My first real taste of unnecessary violence. We weren't the only ones that heard the gunshots. Farrell's heard it too. My dad rushed in, trying to save anyone that he could, but he didn't make it out either. My throat was dry. So my voice came out hoarse. How do you know I was there? Don't try and tell me you weren't there, she answered scathingly. I was with the captain. I saw you with his night vision binoculars. I blinked quickly so that she wouldn't see the tear sting in my eyes. What could I say? We didn't know there were kids in the building, but that didn't make it okay. At least now I knew why she hated me. Why history didn't mean anything to her. 
Oh, God. It was all I can manage in a croaked whisper as I put my hands to my head. It didn't help, and I had to lie back on the cot so I wouldn't throw up. Anytime I killed someone, that was the end of it. There was no loved ones to confront me, no one to apologize to, no consequences other than my own guilt if I thought about it too hard. Most of the time, it almost didn't feel real. But this was too real. My actions had had an effect on someone else. Someone I used to care about. I would finally answer for everything I'd done. That's what I thought, Genevieve said, almost emotionlessly. And after, she headed for the door and slammed it shut behind her. I stayed there on that cot until later that day. I couldn't drift off to nap. I couldn't think about eating again. And I couldn't even hear when people came in or if April said anything to me. I wasn't even sure Genevieve would ever want to see me again until she came in to get me. She stood over the cot, staring down at me. But I was so out of it, I didn't even see her. Get up, she ordered harshly, refraining from touching my head and instead slapping the bottom of my shoe to get my attention. We're going to get McMahon now. I eased myself off of the cot and followed her out. We walked to the edge of the camp, where there were a good amount of military vehicles parked in the clearing. Can I have my weapons? I asked her. No. Half of them wouldn't mind seeing me dead, I told her, as she leaned against the side of the vehicle. There was no other people around, as we must be waiting for them. I can't get your friend without a way to defend myself. I'll give you your knife when we get there, she said. And after studying me for a few seconds, she huffed in a sarcastic laugh. You must be some kind of awful if half of your group wants to kill you. I just dropped my head in shame. She was wrong, but I couldn't defend myself. She wouldn't understand or believe that I didn't fit in because I wasn't despicable. To her, I was. I killed her family. The soldiers started to arrive after that, and I rode next to Genevieve in the back of a large vehicle, still cuffed. Halfway through, I started to feel nauseous, and I did my best to zone out for the rest of the ride. They parked the vehicles outside the city where the barrels wouldn't hear it, and I trekked in with just Genevieve. It seemed she was the leader of the whole group, because even though it looked like her soldiers didn't like it, she instructed them to wait, saying a large group wasn't as easy to keep hidden in one place than just she would be. What kind of a name is Echo? She whispered after a few blocks. She'd taken my handcuffs off and given me the knife back. Her voice was still scornful and bitter, mocking and hating me with every chance she got. When I first got with the group, I was so scared of them, I repeated everything they said. I told her in a complacent whisper. She didn't respond. Maybe she hadn't been looking for an answer in the first place. And a block later, I spoke again. This is far enough away that they won't see you if any of them come out here. She nodded, glancing around to remember where she was. The plan was that she was to wait outside of the building for me to bring McMahon down. Then I was supposed to wait an hour or so, so it wouldn't be suspicious, and meet her here at this block. Part of me didn't think that she'd really wait for me, and I'd be stuck here in the city. Or she would kill me before we left the city, and tell the other something happened. But that was a chance I'd have to take. Soon we were at the plane entrance to the building. Wait here, I told her, pointing to the closest alley and taking the duffel bag of supplies from her that I was supposed to trade. Don't come in. It's booby-trapped. I'll bring him down. She didn't look like she was entirely fond of letting me get away with the supplies. But she knew she had to trust me. I wouldn't have led her here if the plan was to kill my group. As much as I hated them, they'd kept me alive for the past six years. And if I brought her in alone, they'd probably kill her. I climbed up the plane, bypassed the grenades and the tripwires, 
and made my way up the stairs. I avoided the barracks in the common area and went straight for Leon's room, hoping he was there. I pushed open the door, sighing with relief that he was on his bed. How in the hell did you get away? He asked in shock, grinning when I walked in. They patched you up, too? I held out the large pack and showed it to him, not wanting to waste any time. They want to trade. Is he still alive? Leon nodded, taking the bag from me with a pleased grin. We've been trying to get him to tell us where they're camped. We wouldn't want to go there, I told him. There's too many of them. You know where they're at? He asked me. No, I said, even though it was only half true. Then I lied again. There's a big group of them waiting outside to take their guy and leave. All right, he said, and waved for me to follow. He led me to the supply floor, where the captive had been hogtied and left on the hard ground. Big man had been beaten quite a bit, but other than that he looked okay, maybe in need of a little food and water. I pulled the knife out of my pocket, and at the sight of it his eyes went wide. He didn't know I was here to help. Genevieve's outside waiting for you, I whispered so Leon wouldn't hear from where he was standing at the door. I'm going to take you to her, okay? McMahon seemed a little surprised at first, but because I had used Genevieve's name, it looked like he believed me. When he nodded, I cut the ropes around his hands and feet, and he stood, stretching out his sore limbs and rubbing out the skin where the ropes had been chafing. I was glad nobody else was around to talk to me as I led McMahon to the stairs. They must have all been up on the roof or in the common area. Unfortunately, Leon didn't feel the need to follow. Since he had the pack full of supplies, he was satisfied. They didn't hurt you too bad, did they? I asked McMahon as we started down the stairs. He didn't seem to hate me yet. And if Genevieve didn't leave me here, maybe he could be a friend. It clearly confused him that I was being nice, because I obviously affiliated with the enemy, but he decided to answer. Nothing I couldn't handle. I just nodded in acknowledgement, and carefully directed him around the traps on the way to the building's exit. When we got outside, he spotted Genevieve immediately, and she pulled him into a tight hug. Hey, pipsqueak, he greeted her, returning the embrace. Then he turned back to me. Thanks. I smiled at him and looked at Genevieve. You remember where to go? She nodded, leading McMahon away without saying anything to me. She was going to leave me. I was almost positive. Part of me wondered if it was even worth it to try and find her at the meeting spot. I went back into the building and was greeted happily by Houston, Farah, and Martin. The others were less enthusiastic while Decker seemed downright furious. I tried not to call attention to myself and sat quietly for as long as I could while I watched the guys play a poker game. I took one last look at Houston, the only one I would even remotely miss. And when he realized I was watching him, he smiled at me. I smiled back and then got up to make my way to the roof. At my tent, I hastily shoved my belongings into my backpack. There wasn't much, and I couldn't take my sleeping bag because it would be too bulky and obvious. Really, all I grabbed was my clothes and my flashlight, along with everything that was already in my backpack, like my can opener and my cigarettes and some spare batteries. I all but ran out of the building, and it took everything in me to take my time getting to the meeting place without making too much noise. Eventually, I got there, and I stood on the corner glancing every direction, looking for Genevieve and McMahon. That bitch. I mumbled to myself when they were nowhere to be found. But it wasn't frustration, it was disappointment. I was alone. My heart fluttered excitedly when I heard footsteps behind me, thinking maybe she didn't leave. But when I turned, it fell. Who's a bitch? Decker asked smiling like a fiend. No one, I answered, and when he took a step forward, I took a step back. I was talking to myself. Uh-huh, he mumbled, 
taking another step toward me. I ease back. You know what your problem is, Echo? Again, he inched forward, and me back. This time I reached carefully into my pocket, pulling out my knife and opening it behind my back. You're disloyal. Like with those travelers, for example. This time when he came forward, I took two steps back, because his strides were longer than mine and he was getting closer. Leon takes you in out of the kindness of his heart. Your own cousin. And what do you do? You give people our food. Maybe even point them in the direction so we'd never see them. Now he strode discontinuously toward me. Step, pause, step, pause. Makes me wonder how many slipped under our noses because of you. How many nights we went hungry because you're a weak traitor. I'll leave, Decker, I told him, my voice nearly quivering because he was only a few feet from me now, and I could see by the look in his eyes he was going to kill me. You'll never have to see me again. You're right. I'll never have to see you again, he agreed, taking another step closer so he was within arm's reach. He was so much bigger than me, and I was still unstable because of my concussion. I was dead already, and I knew it. I didn't wait for him to attack me. I whipped my hand with the knife around and thrust the blade toward him. He twisted swiftly so that he'd only managed to nick him in the side. And before I recovered from my move, he shoved me backward. I would have been fine, but I was too close to the curb, and when my foot slipped off the edge of it, I dropped my weapon and fell backward into the street. The impact made me severely dizzy, but I didn't want to die. I shot up. Only the second I took a step, my balance was so off, I stumbled back. Decker had already reached me by the time I turned onto my back, and I began to kick my legs, trying desperately to keep him away from me. His hands clamped down around my ankles, and he moved my legs out of the way so that he could sit over me. At least he was just going to kill me, and his hands wrapped around my throat. I still tried to fight. I threw my fist and bucked my hips but he weighed at least twice what I did, and his arms were too long for me to be able to reach him with a hit. No matter how much I struggled, it was no use, and as black spots started to blur my vision, I gave up. A moment after I resigned, Decker's eyes shot wide. Well, fuck, he mumbled, loosening his grip on my neck and trying to reach behind him. I didn't understand it. Did he change his mind? I coughed, trying to rid the burning in my lungs the second Decker let go, but I couldn't scramble away from him, because he was still sitting on me. A moment later, Genevieve appeared over his shoulder, and she plunged that massive knife into his chest before pushing him sideways off of me. My panicked eyes darted from her over to where McMahon was standing a few feet away. I heard what you called me, Genevieve said watching me struggle to get up as she wiped the blade of her weapon off on Decker's shirt. I thought you were going to leave me, I admitted, massaging the pain out of my neck. I needed to stop getting the shit beat out of me. I was tired. Or kill me, I added a second later. She didn't try to put my mind at ease about that. Instead, she glanced down at Decker. Well, lucky for you, he seemed like a bigger asshole. She watched me for a moment, with somewhat curious look in her eye, like she was in deep thought. And then she turned in the direction of the vehicles. McMahon followed after her, giving a timid smile as he passed, looking unsure of how to regard me. No doubt, in the hour and a half it took me to get to this block, Genevieve had told him all the reasons why she hated my guts. Even though she hated me, She'd just saved my life a second time, the first being not killing me on the roof, whether she wanted to or not. But I didn't just owe her for saving my life. Genevieve rescued me from living in the biter-infested city, from being stuck in a complex with raiders. She rescued me for myself. No matter how much she despised me, and whether or not she was going to make it easier or hard on me, I was going to find a way to make it up to her.
Chapter 6 Zombies Ate My Neighbors Dugan I cracked one eye to the bright morning light pouring through my bedroom window and then tossed one arm over my face in an attempt to block it out. It was too bright for me to open my eyes again and check the time on the alarm clock, but it felt too early for a weekend morning. Sleep was coming on again, easily, until I felt a hand land on my bare chest. A delicate finger traced a crooked line to my ribs, and then poked one time playfully. With a throaty chuckle, I bent my torso away from the finger and grabbed my wife's hand, bringing it to my lips so that I could plant a soft kiss on it. Good morning, beautiful, I said groggily, turning onto my side to face her and keeping her hand close to my chest, partly out of affection, partly from keeping her from tickling me again. Through my sleep-blurred vision, I could see her full lips turn into a cheerful smile, and her big brown eyes disappeared behind a slow, flirtatious blink. Morning, she repeated. Sleeping in, cuddling under the blankets on the weekend, was something I always loved to prolong. And when her smile gained a playful tilt, I could tell she was going to tease me by getting out of bed. The moment she turned onto her back to roll over, I snatched her up, pulling her on top of me and wrapping my arms around her waist so that she couldn't escape. She let out a light-hearted shriek, but instead of trying to squirm away, she wedged her arms beneath me. Where do you think you're going? I asked, teasingly, lifting a hand to gently twist one of her frazzled curls around my finger. Especially today, I wanted to lie in bed as long as possible. Work didn't always end on Friday for me, and when, like today, I had to go in on the weekend, I tried to put it off as long as possible. To get ready for the day, she answered setting her chin on my chest and looking up at me through her long eyelashes. Christy's got an early game this morning. Oh, I said slowly, trying not to look as guilty as I felt. Our eight-year-old daughter had just started her new softball league, and not only had I promised to go, but I'd also promised to be assistant coach. Dugan, Patricia started scoldingly, reading my expression and pushing herself up to let me see the discontent on her face. Don't tell me you forgot. Uh, I breathed, unwilling to lie. We've got a major corporation coming in for a presentation at ten. You specifically promised, she said, pushing herself up even further. Right now she was disappointed. Next, she'd get up completely, and that was how I'd know if she were officially mad. I definitely didn't want that. I know. Do you know how hurt Christina will be if you back out? She asked matter-of-factly, shifting away even more, and then asked desperately, Isn't there someone else who can go for you? I know, baby. I tenderly put my finger to her lips in a polite attempt to shush her. I'm thinking. She was still frowning at me so I racked my brain trying to think of a solution. She was right, though. It was one thing to have her unsatisfied. It was another to disappoint my daughter. I'll call Jim, and I'll have him cover for me. Trisha's lips instantly turned up into another smile. Thank you. Of course. I shrugged like it was no big deal, and then in an attempt to forget about the small morsel of stress it did put me on, asked teasingly, Who's the man? You're the man, Patricia laughed, rolling her eyes and relaxing into me again. I squeezed her happily and raised a suggestive eyebrow. How about some sugar for the man? It was obvious she was struggling to hold back another laugh as she pecked me on the lips and propelled off a of bed. How about some breakfast? That works too, I agreed kicking off the blankets and watching as my wife strolled out of our bedroom. The second she left, I grabbed my cell phone off of the nightstand to call Jim. Thankfully, he didn't mind covering me, and I didn't have to stress about it any longer. After another minute, I managed to pull myself out of bed and put on some sweatpants and a t-shirt before following after Trish. When I reached the hall, 
I could see my daughter's bedroom door cracked, a small eye peeking out from the other side. She must have heard Trish walk by, and the second she saw me, she threw open the door. Daddy, she yelled happily, running toward me and jumping up when she reached me. There's my girl, I chuckled, immediately catching her and throwing her over my shoulder to carry her to the kitchen. Then I pulled her back into my arms and then laid her across them so that I could use her small body to do bicep curls. You're getting too big. When I jerked my arms and pretended to drop her, she squealed, laughing halfway through and sounding exactly like her mother did. By the time we reached the kitchen, Trish had pulled out the things she needed to start making breakfast, so I set Christina down in a chair at the kitchen table and strode over to the automatic coffee maker, which had already just made enough for Trish and I. I poured Patricia a cup and mixed in an amount of cream and sugar she liked. After I carried it over and set it down next to her, I wrapped my arms around her waist to watch her finish cutting an apple and orange. I only got to hold her for a few seconds before Christina called for me again. Daddy, she hollered, pointing a blue crown at me. Yes, I asked, pecking my wife on the cheek and turning to my daughter. I heard Trish mumble, wait, before I walked away, and she handed me a plate of apple and oranges slices to carry with me. You're coming to my softball game, right? Chrissy asked as I sat down with the fruit immediately using her coloring book to ignore the healthy food. I wouldn't miss it for the world, I told her, picking up an apple slice and putting it in front of her mouth. She pursed her lips against the fruit, but I just wiggled it around until she giggled and gave in, taking a deliberately big bite. Trying to set a good example, I munched on my own piece of orange, and when Chrissy saw me, she reached for another slice. As I picked up a crown to start coloring with her, Trish reached over my shoulder and set my cup of coffee down, because I'd forgotten it on the counter. I love you, I said gratefully. Before Trish could say anything in return, Chrissy shouted, What about me? I laughed, reaching across the table and pinching her wonderful, youthful cheeks. Of course I love you, too. I glanced up from double-checking the supplies in my backpack to take a look at Kara. Especially in the dim light of the single lantern at the center room, it was obvious the lack of daytime activity had left her pale skin a fragile-looking white, a direct contrast to her long chestnut hair and dark hazel eyes. She was tiny, too. Crucially, formative years spent with the malnutrition that resulted from the outbreak left her so. Petite was an understatement. At hardly five foot, she couldn't have weighed more than 90 pounds. Her blue jeans fit snug, and so did her high-top sneakers. But she was practically swimming in the black pullover sweater she was wearing, adding to the illusion of her daintiness. You ready? I asked her, and when she nodded, my eyes wandered to Chuck. We'd stayed here the last couple of days with him, to make sure that we were well-rested for the long journey ahead. He'd been sitting on his sleeping bag on the floor, silently watching me for the past five minutes. If I didn't know any better, I'd say he almost looked sad that we were leaving. Couldn't say I blamed him. I'd spent years by myself. After having a little companionship, solitude was a depressingly lonesome prospect. It's not too late to come with us, I told him. Slowly his gaze left mine. He didn't say anything but the downward turn of his mouth told me all I needed to know. It almost made me hesitant to leave. At first glance, the tower seemed like a perfect spot to stay. The view went on for miles. There was only one way for intruders to get in, and the ferals hadn't realized yet that there was a meal up here. But the problem was meals for us. I could see why Chuck was nearly starving. The closest town was miles away, and scavenging was an odyssey in and of itself. I couldn't imagine he expected to live too much longer up here. He looked done. I glanced over at Kara again. The last few days, she hadn't said much of anything. The only time she really spoke was when we asked her a direct question. At first, I thought she might be mourning the people she'd lost, but she never frowned, never shed a tear, 
like when I found her in the closet. She just stared, sometimes out of the tower, sometimes out the window, her mouth set in a constant straight line. Most of me thought that the emotional apathy stemmed from her nerves being shot. She lost everything she knew and almost died herself. The kid probably just needed to rest. That was another reason I'd wanted to stay with Chuck for a couple of days, to give her some time to recover. But deep down there was a darker fear. I could only imagine the kind of things a world like this would do to the mind of a child. I'd caught it in her eyes. I had no idea what kind of place she'd come from. Ready to leave, I threw the backpack over my shoulder and took a grip of my hunting rifle in my left hand. Chuck, I started, striding over and extending my hand to him. Thank you for everything. You've been an outstanding host. He shook with me, forcing a parting smile. You guys be careful out there. I gave a genuine grateful grin and then turned for the exit toward the tower, nodding for Kara to follow. I didn't look back, letting her close the door behind us as I tiptoed down the stairs. From the windows of the tower and what I could make out of the night, there weren't any ferals roaming around, but we could never really be sure. When we got to the bottom, I waited another minute for my eyes to completely adjust to the dark and then pushed open the door outside, cautiously poking my head out. There were no ferals in sight, so I strode out, now holding my rifle at the ready. Kara was so practiced with silence, I didn't even hear her close this door, and glanced back over my shoulder just to make sure she had. We made a straight line for the openness of the highway, sacrificing cover for the ability to see in every direction. The teen walked at my side, but everything about her was silent. She walked with a ghostly lightness, her breathing was soft, and she still hadn't said a thing. It was almost lonelier than if I were by myself, and I could only stand it for the first twenty minutes of our travel along the highway. We have to get water, I finally said in a murmur, still keeping my eyes and ears peeled for trouble on either side of us. And we need to find you a weapon. Kara turned to check behind us, answering as she swiveled back around. My group had weapons. I don't know if there were still banshees around, but it's not too far into town. I knew what she was offering, but when in my thoughtfulness, I didn't say anything, she added. I can take you there. Assessing the situation, I saw two immediate risks to her offer. First, there could very well be ferals around, but I could handle those. What I wasn't sure of yet was how much I could trust Kara. As far as I knew, her group could still be alive, and this could be some elaborate ploy to lure suckers like me into a trap. If there was one thing I'd learned over the years, it was that everyone was suspect, even meek-looking 15-year-old girls. However, weapons were crucial. Another gun would be nice, and I'd been searching for a suitable knife for a while now since the handle of my last one broke. To me, it was worth the risk. Okay, I agreed, after considering it. For another twenty minutes, I tried to think of something else to say. But I couldn't think much over the new fear hovering in my mind. Now that I considered it more closely, the likelihood that I was following Kara into a trap was growing. Why didn't she have a single weapon? She clearly knew how to use one seeing as how she'd saved my skin and shot the feral when I'd brought her out of the building. If she were my kid, I'd give her a weapon without hesitating. And she'd agreed to come with me so easily, even if she did have nobody left. I was in a middle-aged man who'd offered, rather enthusiastically, to escort her east. Shouldn't that have been suspect to her? Or at least intimidating? We were only a mile or two from town now, but when Kara veered toward the side of the road, I stopped. She strode to a broken street sign where the top of the metal pole had been snapped off to the point, and about two feet below it 
was bent in half. She glanced around to make sure the area was safe, and then knelt under the bent pole, wrapping her hands around it and giving it a hard tug. Then she used all of her leg strength to try and force it upward, pulling it down again a moment later. I probably should have gone over and helped her, but I was too puzzled by what she was trying to do. Eventually, she bent it back and forth so many times that the two-foot piece split apart from the rest. Carrying it with her, she made her way back to me, thrusting the pole into the empty space in front of her to demonstrate. In the meantime, she said, running her finger over the pointed tip of it, until we find a better weapon for me. I couldn't help but give her an approving smile at her resourcefulness. That's really smart. I just hoped that resourcefulness wasn't going to bite me in the ass. She looked a little shy at my praise and shrugged bashfully before continuing toward town with her weapon in hands. The city was pretty small, and the highway seemed to cut straight through the middle of it. Entering from the highway, we started off in what was probably considered downtown. Though the stores that lined both sides of the street were only mom-and-pop shops in caliber, and there wasn't a big-name brand in sight. I read each of the signs above every store, and we thread lightly through the shadows against the walls. Eventually, I spotted one called Gibbard's Groceries, and I cupped my hands over my face and the dusty window to get a look inside. I'd barely focused through a layer of grime in the glass before Kara practically tackled me to the ground. Not in there, she whispered in a frantically quiet voice. Panshees. As if to confirm it, there was a clatter from somewhere inside, followed by a series of angry growls. It had slipped my mind that she probably knew this town inside out, and even though it was tough for me to trust her when I was already having doubts, I nodded that I wouldn't attempt to go in there. Where can we get food? I asked. She carefully straightened up, just enough to peek in the window of the building, and then waved for me to follow her. She waited until we were a good hundred feet from the grocery store to supply an answer. If we go get the weapons first, I know where we can find some, but there's banshees in there. How'd you guys get food before? I tried to keep the growing suspicion out of my hushed voice as I trailed her along the sidewalk. We just ran out, she said, ducking behind the first car on her way across the dark intersection. We were planning on leaving but the banshees got us before we could. The way Kara talked about it, it was as if she had no emotional attachment to her group. I wasn't sure exactly what any of her group members' relations were to her, whether or not they were her family, but even after knowing Chuck only a few days, I would have been a little choked up if something happened to him. And I was a grown man. I couldn't help but wonder if she seemed so callous because they weren't really dead. I didn't have enough food to be deserving of all this trouble, but my rifle was well worth the ambush. In my disturbing fear, I continued to interrogate her. How'd you get out when you guys got attacked? She glanced back at me, and in the dark I could see her unhappy eyes look me up and down. We'd planned an escape route through the attic of the house. I hid under the tarp on the roof until nighttime, and then climbed a ladder down. The next street we turned down was a row of one-story houses. Kara pointed to a row on our right side. It's the third one. We can go back up to the roof and through the attic, but there still might be banshees inside. We'll take care of them, I whispered in assurance. At this point, I didn't know if I preferred an ambush or ferals when we reached inside but I guess it wasn't really up to me. Kara and I snuck up to the back of the third house. I tried to peek in the windows on the way, trying to prepare myself to see if there were ferals or humans inside, but everything was boarded up. At the back, we made sure our surroundings were clear before turning toward the ladder that was leaning up against the side. Kara went up before I did, and I followed her to the roof where a tarp covered a small skyline that opened up to the attic. After Kara dropped down into the attic, I pulled up my flashlight. Then I leaned my head into the opening 
and shined my beam around, checking for an immediate ambush before I followed in and was trapped. There was nobody in sight except for Kara, so I climbed in and closed the skylight behind me. I'd have preferred it if Kara and I switched weapons. In case there really were ferals in the house below us, it would be better if we had the silent weapon and dispatched as many as I could without her having to put herself in danger. Since I was half preparing for an ambush, however, there was no way I was giving her my rifle and rendering myself defenseless if they had guns. I had to crouch so that I wouldn't hit my head on the roof, but I stayed back while Kara inched toward the shut-up stairs and would lead us to the rest of the house. Go ahead, I said quietly as she looked back at me when I didn't follow her over. You can open it. She stared at me for a few seconds, looking unsure. She probably thought I was a coward, making the 15-year-old girl open it before I even approached. But her maybe thinking I was a coward was better than me maybe ending up dead because she was bait. Kara carefully pushed down the folded-up stairs, releasing each one from her grip in succession so it wouldn't open too quickly and make noise. The second she finished opening it, through the beam of my light, I could see her cringe. As a less still air soon filtered into the attic from the rest of the house, I realized why she had. Though the new air wasn't as stale, there was a stench in it that made my eyes water and my breath catch. It smelled like filthy ferals. It smelled like decay. It smelled like blood. I didn't doubt Kara's story anymore. And I felt so horrible now for not trusting her that I almost didn't want her to leave the attic. I didn't want her to go down into the house and see what had been done to her companions. She looked over at me again once the stairs were lowered and assumed that I still wanted her to go ahead of me. She began to stretch her foot for the first step. Wait, I said hurriedly before she reached it, and I waddled awkwardly in my crotch position to where she was. Trade with me. I handed her my rifle and took her makeshift spear, and then I scooted to the opposite side of the opening as her. Don't shoot unless you have to. I waited for her to nod in understanding before leaning over and sticking my head out of the ceiling. Using my flashlight and trying to ignore the smell, I searched the immediate area for ferals. The attic opened up into the end of a narrow hallway. On either side of me were doors. The open one on the right was a bedroom, and I assumed the same of the closed one on my left. There was what looked like a bathroom further down the hall on the left side, and right after that, a living room. Before I could move my beam to try to catch a glimpse of what was around the corner and across from that, I caught sight of some ferals in the living room. There were six that I could make out, but they were all huddled in a single sleeping pile, and for all I knew, there could be more around the corner. Way too many for us to simply go down and fight them all. Pulling my head back up, I sat down beside the opening and rested my arms on my pulled-up knees while I tried to think of a strategy. There's at least six, I whispered to Kara who in the soft glow from my flashlight I could tell was watching me curiously. I moved my beam around the attic, searching for something here that might be of use to us. But the attic was empty. I took a deep breath to prepare myself for action, and then leaned through the hole again. I gave a soft whistle, trying not to wake all of the ferals at once. But it was so quiet none of them heard. I did it again, a little louder this time. One of the creatures closest to the hall shifted, and I tensed, waiting for it to get up and come at me. After it rolled over without rising, I could tell my attempt was unsuccessful. I was about to whistle louder again, but before I got a chance, there was a swift movement on my right. I didn't even have time to rush backward before a feral sprinted out of one of the bedrooms and vaulted itself up the stairs of the attic, its hand flying ahead of its reach for me. Its hand caught me in the face, and I closed my eye just in time for its long, gangly fingers to bruise it instead of remove it. 
The frightening suddenness of the attack startled me, and I fell backward as the feral shot up the stairs. I brought the pole up, ready to launch my weapon through its chest the moment it reached the attic. But once its head emerged, Kara struck it with the butt end of the rifle. I winced as it tumbled back down the attic stairs with a few loud thuds, and then again when it hit the ground and roared furiously. I knew it would wake the others. There went my wish of illuminating them one by one. I scrambled forward just in time to see the same feral shooting back up the stairs, and this time I managed to send the pointy end of my weapon straight through its breastbone. I yanked back on the pole as the feral dropped back to the floor of the house, but another one was already on its way up. I immediately sent my spear forward again, catching this feral in the face. I'd hardly killed the thing when the emaciated arm reached up from behind it and took a strong clutch of the sleeve of my shirt. The feral I'd just stabbed in the face became a dead weight on top of the one that had just grabbed me, and as they both began to fall back, I felt myself being pulled through the opening of the attic. That moment I panicked, releasing my hold on the only silent weapon in order to grab the edge of the opening with my free hand and keep from falling through. Just as the feral with the spear that was stuck in it started getting out of reach, Kara tossed the rifle behind her and lunged forward, catching the very end of it in both of her hands. I didn't get to see this. She managed to keep her hold on it, though, because the creature on me was pulling harder, trying to climb up my arm to get at me more ferociously. I wriggled my limb frantically, trying to break its grip, but its nails were practically embedded in my skin. Another feral was attempting to bypass the one on my arm now, struggling to get past it, and up the steep and narrow set of stairs. The metal spear plunged by my head, and into the one clambering up the stairs, and as it dropped, the one on my arm widened its jaws. Kara! I yelled hysterically, knowing it was about to take a chunk out of my flesh, but not being able to let go with my other arm and defend myself because I'd fall through. She sent the weapon into the side of its head, right as its teeth came into contact with my skin, and I frenziedly shook the limb thing off of me the moment I felt its grip on my arm loosen. I didn't have time to feel relief that I had been saved from a bite, because two more ferals were already on their way up the stairs. I pushed myself up as swiftly as I could, adjusting my stance so that I wouldn't be caught in another compromising position. Spear! I prompted in a rush as I kicked my foot down on the first feral that got its head into the attic. By the time the next one reached the opening, Kara had tossed me the weapon, and I plunged it into the creature. Initially, I'd underestimated the spot we were in, but the attic was a perfect place to launch an attack. I dispatched the remaining two ferals, the same way we'd gotten rid of the other five, and despite the surprise and almost getting bit, it seemed too easy. When the last one fell into the pile of bodies beneath the attic, I cast the spear aside and dropped to the floor, lying on my back and panting heavily to catch my breath. I'd hardly laid down when Kara picked up the flashlight and knelt by my side. In her concern, she grabbed my arm roughly and pulled it toward her. And then she shined the bright beam up and down the length of it, looking for a bite wound. I'm okay, I assured her taking another deep breath as my heartbeat struggled to return to normal. She didn't seem entirely convinced, as she continued to scan my arm, lifting it straight up to examine the underside. She lowered it again and pushed up my short sleeve, pointing to where the feral's nails had dug into my arm. The small wounds weren't deep, and the only one or two had broken skin, but I could understand her worry. I pushed myself up and off of the floor, making sure to pick up the rifle before she got any wild ideas about me being infected. We'll keep an eye on it, I told her, trying to ease her mind without sounding concerned about it myself. I sat back down at the edge of the opening, dangling my feet to the fourth step while I reached out, silently requesting the flashlight. Wait here. I'm going to make sure the rest of the house is clear. We'd made enough of a racket that I was sure that any other ferals in the house would have alerted us to their presence by now. Mostly, I wanted to assess the scene before Kara might be exposed to a gruesome look at her dead companions. 
As she picked up the spear, I assumed she was preparing to wait until I came back. But when I reached the bottom of the stairs, I could hear her coming down behind me. I turned around to see her already on the last step. You should wait, I whispered. There could be more. She shook her head, adjusting the metal pole in her hands with a resolved look on her face. I left them. I'm not leaving you. I knew I wouldn't be able to change her mind. What I didn't know was whether or not I could tell her what to do, even if I did think it was for her own good. She was young, but she wasn't a child, and she could take care of herself well enough that she'd already saved my life a couple of times. So I didn't protest, and simply nodded before turning into the open bedroom on the right. There were old things left over in the bedroom from the family that lived here before the outbreak. Now that my mind was starting to neglect the scent of death, I could smell the musty odor of the old clothes hanging in the closet and the musk blankets on the bed. Every step we took over the worn brown carpet sent a flurry of dust sparkling in the beam of light. I cleared the open closet and then bent down to check under the bed just in case. When I straightened back up, Kara was pulling a couple of pieces of clothing out of the closet and shoving them into her backpack. I wasn't going to say anything about it, for all I knew is she was being resourceful again. But when she saw me looking, she answered my unspoken curiosity. I used to sleep in here, she said quietly, zipping up her backpack and throwing it over her shoulders. Some of the clothes are mine. I nodded, understandingly but continued to watch her for a few moments, wondering if I shouldn't put my foot down about her going through the rest of the house. At my lingering gaze, her eyes darted left and then right before settling on me, and she pursed her lips unsuredly. There was a childlike playfulness in the shiftiness of her glance, like that shy awkwardness my teenage niece used to always get when she didn't know what to say. All Kara was missing was a slow, embarrassed nod. If it had been appropriate, I might have chuckled. It was comforting to spot something familiar in the teen that I'd been suspicious of for the past few days. Are you sure you want to see everything? I asked eventually, finally expressing my genuine worry. You can wait in the attic if you want. I'll be fine. Her eyes wandered toward the door, and it held her gaze as she nodded. Since she seemed set in her decision, I led the way back to the hall, holding my rifle at the ready, as I pushed open the closed bedroom door. When nothing immediately came springing out, we strode in, keeping our senses alert for any threats. Who'd you live here with? I asked Kara, as she explored every corner of the room. It took her a few seconds to answer, and I almost wasn't sure if she was going to. My dad... My uncle and his girlfriend, and another guy named Bill. We made our way out to the next door in the hall, and I did a brief check into the small bedroom. I was about to answer as we reached the living room, but the sight stopped me in my tracks. I'd been about to extend my condolences for Kara's loss, but that wouldn't suffice now. Not with what we could see. The ferals who'd attacked must have been starving because there was hardly anything left of her four guardians. There was bloodstains all over the room. Some of them were mere splats against the wall, and the others were seeping puddles in the dark carpet. It had only been a few days, but aside from the blood, practically all that was left of the group were skeletons and shredded clothing. The ferals had eaten everything. If my nose wasn't already adjusted to the smell, the addition of this sight would probably have made me vomit. There were more bone-shaped bodies than just four. I counted eight in total, which meant at the time of the attack the group was wildly outnumbered, and Kara was lucky she even got away. I glanced over at the girl to judge what kind of reaction she had. If she was going to burst into tears, I could comfort her. If she was going to go on an angry, feral killing spree, I could stop her. But she was just standing there, staring blankly as though she'd never even known them at all. 
After a few moments, she looked at me and held out her hand. Can I have the flashlight? I handed it to her, and with it she strode forward to examine the bodies. She walked around the edge of the room to avoid the black puddles in the carpet, and finally stopped at a bloody skeleton next to the couch and knelt down. The only source of illumination in the boarded-up house was the flashlight, and as I watched as Kara clutched it between her chin and her shoulder, and her hands were spotlighted as she reached down. One by one she pried the bony fingers from the grip of a shotgun, and every time there was a gritty crack I cringed. When she successfully pulled the weapon from the dead man's hand, she wiped the dirty grip with a quilt that was draped over the back of the couch. Then she moved on to check the next one. Kara, I said softly, treading over carefully, and gently taking the flashlight from her. Are you okay? People kill. People die. She answered with a light shrug, reaching down for the bright red fire axe on the floor. It happened before the outbreak, and it's going to keep happening forever. I don't need to get choked up about it. She was too young to truly know about violence like that before the outbreak and the way she recited the words didn't sound like her own. It sounded like she experienced death plenty of times before, and like her father had been preparing her for this since the beginning. I didn't know what to say to the kid who'd lost everyone she knew, or how to respond to a kid who didn't seem to care. So I didn't say anything, and instead carried on to pick up the next weapon. I bent down to grab a large knife, and as I straightened up, I felt the tiniest breeze against my cheek. With a flashlight in hand, I directed the beam toward the kitchen across from the living room. Through the empty doorways that led to the kitchen, I could see that the back door of the house was cracked open. That must have been how the ferals got in, as it was the only entrance of the house I'd seen that wasn't boarded up. Pacing over, I closed the door quickly. It felt like it had already been open too long and was putting us in danger. We were lucky no other ferals in the surrounding area had come to investigate if they'd heard the noise. But after I released the handle, the door slowly swung back open. It was broken, and the only way I could think to keep it closed was to put something in front of it. I passed a searching glance around the kitchen, looking for the heaviest thing I could spot. The refrigerator. I could tell Kara was watching as I pulled the appliance away from the wall with a grunt. After I unplugged it, I scooted it all the way toward the door, wincing each time the bottom of it screeched against the laminate tile. When it was safely blocking the exit, I turned and leaned my back against it, taking a deep breath to try and relax. What do you want to do? Kara asked from where she was sitting atop of the kitchen counter. There are things we need. I answered, going over my mental list of supplies. Water's most critical. Without saying anything, Kara used the toe of her shoe to open up a nearby cupboard. When I moved the light beam to see what was inside, I couldn't help but grin. Every shelf was filled with gallons of water. We had plenty of water, just no food. You sure there's food at this place you told me about? I couldn't resist striding to the cupboard and happily gulping down almost a quarter gallon of water. Kara nodded as I passed the jug to her. How come you guys were leaving instead of going there to get it? Because of the banshees, she said, and set the bottle on the counter next to her. There's too many of them. I raised my eyebrow at her. Because if she was talking numbers, then we were at more of a disadvantage than her group had been. And you think we have a shot? You're not afraid, Kara replied, looking down shamefully, as though she thought she was doing something wrong by implying the others were scared. You're brave. She was wrong. I was afraid. But surviving in a world like this meant learning when to ignore the fear. I only had two cans of food left. Now was one of those times when ignoring fear was necessary. You're sure this is the only place that has food? Except for the grocery store, but there's even more in there. She nodded. 
holding the head of her axe in her hands and absentmindedly kicking the handle back and forth between her feet. We already went to every house we could. There's nothing left. I clicked off the flashlight so I wouldn't waste any more of the battery, and then I leaned back against the counter at Kara's side. How many ferals are at the spot we're talking about? She didn't answer right away, and a few seconds later mumbled. Eleven? After a short pause, she added. Usually. Sometimes more. All I could do was sigh. That many ferals, just to get food, sounded like a nightmare. But it was our best option. We could start on our way to the next town with the two cans that we had. We had no idea what it was like in the next town over. Food could be scarcer than it was here. Or worse, it could be claimed by a group of bandits. There was a sure source here. The only problem was it would probably take a fight to get it. I think we've had enough excitement for tonight, I mused, and Kara vigorously nodded her agreement. We'll scout it out tomorrow night and try to come up with a plan. I fiddled with the flashlight in my hand for another minute of thoughtful silence. East was our destination, but we were in no rush to get there. Plus, I didn't know how much food there was at the place Kara wanted to go. There might be more than we could carry, and leaving behind perfectly good, valuable rations was one of the worst things that you could do during times like these. If it comes to it, I started, and all I could hear of Kara in the dark was her still kicking the handle back and forth. Would you be okay with staying at this house for a while, in the attic? Yes, she answered quicker than I thought she would. And then I heard her hop off of the counter. Should we move the bodies outside? Even though I couldn't see her in the dark, I looked her way as if to study her. I couldn't quite figure her out. She seemed so indifferent. But she cared, or else she wouldn't have saved my life like she did. Sure, I said, moving toward the refrigerator to reopen the only unsealed door. There was any child left in her. I'd find it, eventually. <laughs>